Jack Benny program presented by Lucky Strike. American. Lucky Strike and Lucky Strike alone offers you important evidence gathered in the tobacco country by the world famous Crosley Pole. This evidence reveals the smoking preference of auctioneers, buyers, and warehousemen, the men who really know tobacco. Here's what the Crosley Pole found. For their own personal smoking enjoyment, independent tobacco experts again name Lucky Strike first choice. Lucky Strike first choice over any other brand. These experts know their business. Their overwhelming preference for Lucky Strike, we believe, has a direct relationship to the quality tobacco we purchase for Lucky's and to the real, deep-down smoking enjoyment you may expect from fine tobacco. And when these veteran tobacco experts name Lucky Strike first choice for their own personal smoking enjoyment, then you know... L-S-M-F-T! L-S-M-F-T! Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. And in a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. So smoke the smoke tobacco experts smoke Lucky Strike. Remember... Independent tobacco experts again name Lucky Strike first choice. Lucky Strike, first choice over any other brand. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Denny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, as most of you know, last week Jack Benny visited the Ronald Coleman's and he persuaded Ronnie to lend him his Academy Award Oscar. As Jack left the Coleman house, the following incident happened. Gee, it was awfully nice of Ronnie to let me take his Oscar home so I could show it to Rochester. Hmm, sure is dark tonight. No moon. Oh, well. Yeah, da dee da dum da dee da dum da dum dum dee da da dum Hey, bud. Bud. Huh? You got a match? Yes. Yes, I have one right here. Don't make a move. This is a stick-up. Mister, put down that gun. Shut up. I said this is a stick-up. Now, come on. Your money or your life. (laughs) Look, bud. I said your money or your life. I'm thinking it over. Now, look, mister. Come on, give me your wallet or I'll let you have it. All right, mister. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. Here's my wallet. Good. And I'll take that package you're carrying, too. This, pa- this package, but it isn't mine. It belongs to Ronald Coleman. He won it. Lie down and give it to me or I'll drill you. All right, all right. Don't drill me. Here it is. Now, I'll lay down on the sidewalk and count to 100. Yes, yes, sir. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, that's what happened Sunday night. As we look in on Jack now, it's the following morning. Mary, I've thought of a million different things. I don't know what to do. Oh, Jack, stop pacing the floor and sit down. You're making a nervous wreck of yourself. He was like that all night, Miss Livingston. Never slept away. But what am I going to do? How can I ever explain this to Ronnie? Jack, you've got to control yourself or you'll have a breakdown. Now, why don't you have some breakfast? No, Mary, I couldn't eat a thing. I don't care if I never eat again. Mm-hmm. He hasn't been this upset since Tita Barron got married. <laughs> I'm at my wit's end. I can't tell Ronnie his Oscar was stolen and never speak to me again. I can't tell the police about the holdup because then it'll get in the papers. I don't know. What in the world can I do? Why don't you kill yourself? Say, that's not a... Oh, stop. (laughs) I'm not in the mood for jokes. There must be some way I can get that Oscar back. Well, why don't you put an ad in the Beverly Hills paper and offer a reward? No, Mary, a reward would just be a waste of time. Who'd return it for what I'd offer? <laughs> Mr. Bailey, if it'll get you out of this mess, why don't you make the reward substantial? Give a thousand dollars. Well, we're back to killing yourself. Yeah, there must be some other way out. It seems impossible that I should be held up right in front of my own house. You know, you still haven't told me what happened. I don't know any of the details yet. You... you don't? Well, Mary, this is exactly what happened. As I was leaving Ronnie's house, he loaned me his Oscar so I could show it to Rochester. I was walking home carrying the Oscar under my arm when a sinister-looking man stepped out of the head. Hey, Bud. Bud. Huh? You got a match? Yes, I have one right here. Don't make a move. This is a stick-up. A stick-up? 
Put down that gun or I'll thrash you to within an inch of your life. <laughs> Put it down, I say. No, no. No, no, just a second, mister. Don't you come any closer. So you think you can scare me with a gun? Well, I'll break your arm. Look, mister, I didn't want to do this, but I had to. I had to get money for my wife and children. Well, you didn't have to pull a gun on me. If you wanted money, all you had to do was ask. I'm going to take that gun away from you, and you'll see that... Look, I'm warning you. Don't you come any closer. All right, you ask for it. Take that. Oh, yeah? Well, you take that. And that. Uh, Jack, what were you doing to the crook when you said, take that and that? He was handing his wallet in the Oscar. <laughs> I was not. Mary, while I was beating him up, I dropped the Oscar. He picked it up and ran off down the street. Honestly, I was never so... Oh, who can that be? I don't want to see anyone today. Oh, calm down, Jack. I'll go to the door. Gee, I feel so sorry for poor Jack. He's trying so hard to be brave. But I know he's been crying. His mascara is running. <laughs> I hope he can get out of this mess. Oh, hello, Don. Hello, Mary. Where's Jack? I've got something very important to tell him. Well, Don, this isn't a good time to talk to him. He's very upset. Suppose you tell me what it is. Well, it's about the quartet. They won't be able to appear on the program Sunday. Why not? Well, now, Mary, you may not believe this, but all the members of the quartet became fathers this morning. Don, Don, you mean that each one of the four singers had a baby? All except the baritone, he had twins. No. Yes, but, Tweeter, they had five of the cutest babies you ever saw. And, Mary, you'll never guess what they've named them. What? L.S., M.F., and Barbara. Barbara? It was a girl. Well, that's logical. Look, Don, I'll go in and tell Jack all about it. Okay, Mary, thanks a lot. Goodbye. Bye. Imagine all the singers in the quartet having babies the same day. That's what you call close harmony. <laughs> oh, brother, bag my eyes and call me Fred Allen. <laughs> what took you so long, Mary? Who was it? Oh, it was Don. He said the quartet won't be on the broadcast Sunday. Oh, fine. Everything happens to me. Well, they couldn't help it, Jack. Their wives all had babies the same day. And you'll never guess what the baritone's wife had. Unless it's an Oscar, I'm not interested. <laughs> she had twins. But, Jack, what are you going to do about a quartet for the broadcast? I don't know. It's a fine time for them to have children. Why couldn't they have transcribed them for release at a more convenient time? <laughs> anyway, I've got enough to worry about without the quartet. Say, boss, I've got a great idea. What? Some friends of mine are making a personal appearance here in town and... Maybe they'd come over and help you out. Who are they, Rochester? The Ink Spots. The Ink Spots? Oh, they would be wonderful. Do you think they do it, Rochester? Sure, I'll call them and have them here in a few minutes. But good, use the phone in the hall. Will yes, you? sir. I better call them right away so they can... Mm, better answer the door first. Hello, Chester. Is the master of the metropolis at home? Yeah. <laughs> come on in, Mr. Harris. You'll find him in the library. But he's feeling mighty low. Well, that's a good thing I came over. I'll cheer him up. I'll go in there and throw some of that Harris sunshine on him and bring back the bloom to those withered old cheeks. <laughs> See you later, Ross. Oh, hiya, Livy. You dream doll. Hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. Hello, hello. Hey, Jackson. Did you hear the one about the two sparrows who were arguing on the pump and one of them kept flying off the handle? Ha, 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 ha. Hmm. Looks like the smog is moving in on that hair of sunshine. <laughs> Look, Phil, I'm in no mood for jokes. Well, that's right, Phil. The Jack's feeling pretty bad. On the way home last night, he was held up. Well, that's not to be ashamed of. I've been held up many times on my way home. <laughs> Well, I was robbed. Now, what did you come over here for? Yeah, look, Jackson, I'm figuring on buying a small ranch, and I got most of the dough, but I need a little more to swing the deal, and I was kind of wondering if you'd lend me uh, $10,000. Mary, tell him I'm not at home, will you? <laughs> Oh, wait a minute, Jackson. I don't like asking you, but I went to the bank, and they turned me down. Now, if you turn me down, too, well, well I'll... Well, I'll just have to go to Alice. <laughs> well, Phil, I, I'd like to help now, you. Now, wait a minute, Jackson. I ain't asking you to give me nothing. We'll make it a regular business deal like when you loaned me money before. I'll sign papers for the loan, pay you interest and everything. 
Well, are you... Are you willing to put up security? Yeah, but not like last time. We missed the kids. <laughs> Phil. I'll have my business manager draw up the papers. Excuse me for interrupting, boss, but Mr. Ronald Coleman called. Oh, no. Oh, yes. <laughs> he said he's having guests for dinner and wants you to return his Oscar immediately. Phil, you better go get the money from Alice. <laughs> now, Ronnie wants his Oscar back. This is the last straw. Mary, you know what I'm going to do? Oh, not now, Jack. A gun is so noisy and I've got a splitting headache. <laughs> I don't mean that. I'm going to check a list of all the people who ever won Oscars. And maybe borrow one of them so I can give it to Ronnie till I get his back. Hey, that sounds like a pretty good idea. Let's see now. Last year, the Oscars were won by Frederick March and Livy de Havilland. Well, that won't help. Freddie's out of town, and Olivia hasn't talked to me since I put too much starch in her doilies. <laughs> who else is there? Well, Ray Milan won an Oscar. Ah, what a picture. <laughs> Yeah. And so did Joan Crawford and Loretta Young and Bing Crosby and, uh... Hey, that's it, Mary. He's the one, Bing Crosby. I did him a big favor. I was on a show a couple of weeks ago, and it isn't easy to be on his show. The needle scratches. <laughs> over to see Bing right away and ask him to lend me his Oscar. Okay, Jack, I'll drive you there. I have my car right outside. Good, good. Now, who can that be? I'll get it, boss. Well, hello, gentlemen. Come right in. Hey, boss, boss. Yeah? It's the ink spots. The ink spots. Well, hello, fellas. Hello, hello Mr. Benny. Mighty glad to meet you. <laughs> no, thank you. Now, gentlemen, as I told you over the phone, Mr. Benny's quartet can't be on the program next week, and he'd like to have you do a number for him on Sunday's show. We'd be very happy to. Yes, very happy. Good, good. Well, fellas, I was just leaving, so could I hear the number right now? Do you happen to know if I didn't care... Do you know Love in Blue? Oh, 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 yeah, I see what you mean. Uh, well, go ahead, boys. Uh, let's have it. Absolutely wonderful. I can't wait till you do it on the show. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Benny. Benny. Yes, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, Rochester, uh, Rochester, come here a minute. Yes, sir. Uh, how, uh, how much are they going to charge me to be on my show? Huh? Why, boss, they said as a favor to me they'd go on your show for nothing. For nothing? Why, well, I wouldn't think of it. I mean, that's ridiculous. Go in the kitchen and fix them some sandwiches. <laughs> about you, boss. When it comes to guest stars, bread is no object. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come on, Mary, drive me over to Crosby's. <laughs> Mary, there's Bing Crosby's house over there on the left. Just pull into the driveway here. I can't, Jack. There's a sign that says, keep driveway clear, trucks loading. Hmm. Must be sending his money to the bank. <laughs> well, toot the horn. We'll see if he's home. Oh, there's Bing in the upstairs window. Hey, who's that honking in C-sharp? Mary, well, this is a pleasant surprise. Come up to the front door. I'll let you in. Come on, Jack. 
Now, remember, you just can't come right out and ask him to lend you his Oscar. Be a little subtle about it. I know, I know. Watch these steps, Mary. Hello, Mary. Come right in. Oh, Jack's with you. <laughs> and I ran all the way. What? Come in. Come on. Come on in. <laughs> Hope you folks will forgive the way I'm dressed. I wasn't expecting anybody, or I'd have sort of dressed up. <laughs> that shirt you've got on looks like Finian's rainbow. Especially with that pot on the end of it. Well, well, well. It's rumored you're pretty funny on the air, too. <clears throat> However, let's not discuss one's alleged talent in the entrance hall. First time you've been to this house, isn't it? Do you have any trouble finding it? No, no, no. I just followed my nose. Hope tried that once, wound up on Mount Wilson. <laughs> shoot him down. <laughs> well, well, it's rumored you're pretty funny on the air, too. Yeah, you're pretty fast to the old lad lived there, kid. All you have to do is hear it once, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, Bing, we were just driving by and thought we'd drop in for a social visit. Uh, Jack, get to the point, but be subtle. Leave it to me. Uh, Bing, uh, hmm? how about showing us the house? You know, take us into the den. Or do you keep your Oscar in another room? There? Oscar? Oh, I got that in the trophy room. Oh, good, good. However, if you insist on seeing the den, I'd love to show it to you. No, 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 Bing. Right, we got... right through this door. Oh. Gee, what a beautiful den. Well, we've been here long enough. Now, let's go into the, um, let's go to the trophy room. Oh, Jack, look at that picture on the mantelpiece. Bing, are those your children? Yeah, those are the four boys. The two in the end are twins. Twins? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a coincidence. <laughs> you know, this morning, my baritone's wife had an Oscar. Jack! I mean... <laughs> must be wonderful having four children. By the way, where's Dixie? Oh, she had to go to the hospital. What? To visit her cousin. <laughs> Bing, uh, hmm? are you sure it isn't the stork? Positive. I got him in my trophy room. <laughs> well, let's go see him. You know, I've never seen a stuffed Oscar. I mean, stork. <laughs> okay, just follow me here. Oh, would you excuse me a minute? Hmm. Well, hello. Well, hello. Fancy hearing from you. Sure, I want you on my show. I've been expecting you for a long time. How long will it take you to get here? Two days. Well, good. I'll meet you at the train. Bye. Who was that? Rudolph Schmohopper. <laughs> it's going to take him a couple of days to get here. Now, where does he live? The do or did he? <laughs> More people come from there. I mean... Now, Bing, uh, how about going to the trophy room? Oh, yes, the trophy room. Right down this hall. Here, Mary, I'll lift you over. No, I'll just uh, walk around them. Hmm. Fine place for a horse to sleep. <laughs> I can't understand why. <laughs> Bing, I was stepping over him and he got up. <laughs> Oh, don't worry, Jackson. He can't stand up long. <laughs> what? Yeah, I guess you're right. Poor old thing. Yeah, the veterinarian said he was going to die yesterday, but none of my horses finish on time. <laughs> well, here we are, kids. Here's the trophy room. Jack, look at all the heads mounted on the wall. Gosh, Bing, you sure must have done a lot of hunting. Yeah. What's that big head over there? Yours. You're looking in the mirror. <laughs> no, no, I mean the one with the brown eyes. You know, that, that big head over there. That's a moose. Oh, what's a small one? A mouse. <laughs> no. Yes, sir. Shot the mouse in Wyoming and caught the moose under the icebox. <laughs> you ought to try, to try hunting, Jack. <laughs> want to get anything. Besides the whole joint, doesn't it? <laughs> big, big game hunt. Very exciting, Jackson. You ought to try it. Especially the big game. Bing, hmm. the only big game that Jack's interested in is a buffalo, and it has to be on a nickel. Mary. He traps him with one finger in a telephone slot. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, it ain't easy, sister. Well, Bing, this is really a beautiful room. I never saw some... Wait a minute. Say, Bing, why have you got that picture of Frank Sinatra on the wall? The kids throw darts at it. <laughs> Chicken pox there. <laughs> now, Bing, let's see the trophies. Will there you? they are, right over there in the cabinet. Oh, boy, look at all those cups. Uh, what'd you get them for, Bing? Well, I grabbed this uh, cup here for winning a golf tournament at Lakeside. I got this one for winning the Santa Anita Handicap. Santa Anita Handicap? Uh, mm-hmm. What horse? No horse, ran myself, paid six times. <laughs> Polo finish, just got up the last jump. Oh. Say, <laughs> <laughs> right. hey, Bing. What? Right. That little tiny cup on the end. That's not a cup, that's a thimble. With four kids, got to do a lot of sewing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You see this one here, Jack? I got this when I got married. When you got married? Yeah, it's a Dixie cup. <laughs> Why do I take jokes from Phil Harris? And <laughs> oh, brother. Well, look, Bing, the trophy that I'm most interested in is the Oscar you won for going my way. Yes, we'd love to see that one, Bing. Oh, the Oscar. Why didn't you say so? I'll get it for you. Lenny, you in there? Yeah, Pop, what do you want? You'd have to give me my Oscar. I can't, no, I'm taking a bath. Oh, for heaven's sake, why don't you use something else for a stopper? <laughs> Bing, you let your son use the Oscar for a stopper in the bathtub? Yeah, That's it's terrible. always wet, too, when I want to crack nuts with it. It's murder. <laughs> Well, I'm really anxious to see the Oscar, Bing, but we can wait till your boy gets through with his bath. He'll be through in a minute. Say, Bing, Hmm? while we're waiting, how about sing a song for us? Oh, Mary, Bing doesn't want to sing. I do, too. (laughs) What'd you like to hear, Mary? Anything, Bing. Anything. Well, I'll try out a new tune on you called Haunted Heart. It's a clever number. I hope you'll like it. was beautiful. Thanks, Mary. It's pretty good for a chorus. Dennis Day gets a chorus and a half. I get a chorus. <laughs> but if you want, I'll sing a couple of more. Hey, Pop, why don't you give up? <laughs> the other three put you up to that, huh? Say, Bing, what? look. Your son brought out the Oscar and put it on the table. Yeah. Gee, doesn't that Oscar look wonderful? Now, Bing, I might as well get right to the point. I'm in an awful spot. I've just got to borrow your Oscar for a little while. Well, look, Bob, if you need an Oscar, instead of going around trying to borrow one, go make a picture. Win one. <laughs> hey, I never thought of that. <laughs> but, Bing, it's too late for that. I need it now. You can't make a picture in one day. They took longer on the horn blows at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was sick a couple of days. It took almost a week to make it. <laughs> But, Bing, look, I just want it for a few days. I'll give it right back to you. Well, what's the deal, Jack? Why do you need an Oscar all of a sudden? Well... Jack, why don't you tell him the truth? Tell him what happened. All right, I will. 
You see, Bing, I was over at Ronald Coleman's house, and he let me borrow his Oscar to take to my house to show Rochester. I was walking home carrying the Oscar, when suddenly a sinister-looking man stepped out of the head. Hey, Bud. Bud. Huh? You got a match? Yeah, I got one right here. Don't make a move. This is a stick-up. What? You heard him. This is a stick-up. Oh, two of you, huh? <laughs> well, do you think you're scaring me with those guns? I'll make you eat them and spit out the bullets. Hey, Pete, this guy's pretty tough. We better call the rest of that gang. Yeah. <whistles> All right, Pete, come on. We need help. <laughs> oh, there are ten of you, eh? Well, it looks like I'll have to take off my coat. Now, oh, look, mister, we don't want no trouble with you. We've got guns. And hand grenades. So what? You can't scare me. I'll take on your whole outfit. <laughs> And Bing, when the whole thing was over, I knocked out all their men but one. Independent tobacco experts again named Lucky Strike first choice. Lucky Strike first choice. Over any other brand. <laughs> The famous Crosley poll has just completed an impartial survey in 11 southern tobacco states. This poll, taken among tobacco experts, reveals the smoking preference of the men who really know tobacco. Yes, for their own personal smoking enjoyment, the independent tobacco experts again name Lucky Strike first choice. Lucky Strike first choice over any other brand. These are the experts, auctioneers, buyers, and warehousemen. And we believe their overwhelming preference for Lucky Strike has a direct relationship to the quality tobacco we purchase for Lucky. You've heard the poll results. Now listen to what Mr. Floyd Clay, veteran warehouse owner from Kentucky, recently said. Up through the years, I've seen American buy tobacco that's ripe and mild. Tobacco with real flavor and mellowness. I've smoked Lucky 17 years. So for your own real deep down smoking enjoyment, remember... L-S-M-F-T. L-S-M-F-T. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the draw. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The Jack Benny Program, presented by Lucky Strike. American. Lucky Strike, first again with Tobacco Man. First again with Tobacco Man. More independent tobacco experts smoke Lucky Strike regularly than the next two leading brands combined. There you have the findings of a recent impartial survey which reveals the personal smoking preference of tobacco men, auctioneers, buyers, and warehousemen. Yes, the survey shows Lucky Strike. First again with tobacco men. First again with tobacco men. First again with the men who can see the makers of Lucky Strike consistently select and buy that fine, that light, that naturally mild tobacco. So light up a Lucky. Puff by puff, you'll see. L-S-M-F-T. L-S-M-F-T. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. And in a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. So for your own real, deep-down smoking enjoyment, smoke the smoke tobacco experts smoke. Lucky Strike. First again with Tobacco Man. <laughs> The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, once again we'd like to take you out to Jack Benny's home in Beverly Hills. It's evening and Jack has just finished dinner and is relaxing in his usual way. You know, Rochester, I always like to play my violin after dinner. Uh -huh. So it soothes and relaxes me. Uh -huh. 
I, I hope it doesn't bother you. Oh, no, I haven't had my dinner yet. <laughs> good, good. Rochester, I often think what a fool I was not to have made the violin my career. You know, I might have become a great virtuoso, but no, no. Instead, I had to become a comedian, a clown, a buffoon. What a rich buffoon. <laughs> That's the wrong attitude. The world would be better off if people had a different viewpoint. You know, money isn't everything. Remember what Shakespeare said. He who steals my purse steals trash. I wish you'd throw some of that garbage on me. <laughs> Rod, just clear off the table. Let me practice my violin. I want to prepare for my stage appearances in Detroit and Cleveland. Let me see. I want to learn that new song first. Here it is. First again with tobacco men. (laughs) See, that song is catching on fast. I heard it last night on the hit parade. Well, I've practiced enough, but I don't feel like going to bed. I think I'll go in the den and listen to the radio. Now, hello, Polly. Daddy's going to listen to the radio. Fred Allen stinks. Fred Allen stinks. (laughs) Maybe, maybe I shouldn't have taught her that. But then, she'd have found out herself. Yeah, I wonder what's on the air right now. Friends, do you have a tendency to be a little too fat around the waist? You do? Well, what you need is exercise. First, stand in front of your fireplace. That's right. Now lift your right leg. Higher, higher, higher. Now rest your foot on the mantelpiece. (laughs) Have you got one foot on the floor and one foot on the mantelpiece? Good. We now leave the air until the same time tomorrow. (laughs) That's ridiculous. I wonder what else is on. Gee, it's hard to reach the dial with one foot on the mantelpiece. (laughs) There, I made it. Your daily beauty consultant. Ladies, is your skin rough and dry? Are your pores large and coarse? Is your complexion dull and blotchy? Is your hair stringy and full of snarls? It is? Well, stay in the house, kid. You're a mess. <laughs> I don't know, there, there must be something on the air tonight besides commercials. Oh, there's a phone. Hello? Hello, Jack. Oh, hello, Mary. Jack, are we going to have rehearsal at your house or NBC? What? Are we going to have rehearsal at your house or NBC? Mary, I can hardly hear you. Get closer to the phone. I can't. I've got one foot on the floor and one foot on the mat. <laughs> Gee, that program must have a terrific hooper. <laughs> I think so, Ram? <laughs> oh, Mary, what did you ask me before? I said, where are we having rehearsal? Oh, rehearsal will be tomorrow at NBC. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, Jack. Yes? I've got the most wonderful news. My sister Babe is coming out to California to go on television. Your sister Babe on television? Well, what is she going to do? She's going to double for gorgeous George. <laughs> say, that's great. Listen, give her my congratulations. Oh, hello, Jack. Rochester told me you were in here. Oh, hello, Don. Mary, Don's here. i got to hang up. Goodbye. Bye. Hiya, Don. Come on in. Sit down. Okay. Come on in, fellas. Oh, you brought the sportsman with you. Hello, boys. <laughs> Don, I meant to call you, but we're not having rehearsal until tomorrow. As long as you're here, sit down. Well, thanks, Jack. Aren't you going to sit down, too? No, I'll just put my foot back on the mantelpiece. <laughs> Well, Jack, even though we're not rehearsing till tomorrow, the boys have prepared a beautiful number for the show, and they'd like to have you hear it right now. They're going out of town for a few days. Business? Oh, no, no, no. You see, the boys took their wives fishing at Big Bear Lake last week, and they're going back there again. Gee, I wish I could go. What are they going to fish for, perch or trout? The baritone's wife. She fell out of the boat Wednesday. (laughs) 
Oh, well, then by all means, let's hear him sing now. He must be awfully tired treading water. Go ahead, boys. Well, now, wait, wait a minute, Jack. This is a big production number, and there's a part in it for you on the violin. For me? Well, good, good. Now, where's my violin? Under your chin. Oh, yes, yes. That was the stickiest spaghetti I had for dinner. Now, let's, um, let's go down. What number are we going to do? The Saber Dance by Cachetorium. The Saber Dance? Well, that should be wonderful. Come on, fellas, hit it. Congratulations. <laughs> Ricky, that was a wonderful number. Well, thanks, Zach. I knew you'd like it. I certainly did. We'll see you Sunday, fellas. Goodbye. <laughs> so long, Jack. So long. Right, so... Now, those boys are such nice fellas. 65 cents in the Coca-Cola machine. <laughs> well, I think I'll take my chain belt off and go in the library. I'll read for an hour or so before I go to bed. Just look at this room. What a mess. Oh, Rochester! Rochester! Every time I want him, he takes so long to Did get Did you call me, Mr. Billy? Yeah, where were you? I was in the kitchen ironing your nightgown. Uh, well, I hope you didn't put too much starch in it again. Last night, I felt like I was sleeping in a Quonset hut. <laughs> I, I like a nightgown to cling a little. <laughs> Now, Rochester, this room is such a mess, I wish... Rochester, do you smell something burning? Uh-oh, the iron! My nightgown! Well, is it burned? Boy, well, something tells me this quartzet hunter is going to have a window in it. <laughs> Let me see that nightgown. Hmm. It'll be okay, boss. I'll put a flap on it. <laughs> See that you do. I'm going back in the library and read. I'll call you, Rochester, when I want to go to bed. Now, let me see. I'd like to read a good mystery for a change. What are these books? Kiss the blood off my hand. 
The crushed skull. The mutilated torso. Lilacs in the spring. Nah, that's too gruesome. Let's see. Oh, my goodness, these two books shouldn't be together. The Proper Bostonians and the Kinsey Report. <laughs> Here's a mystery I haven't read. I was framed by the author of I Stand Condemned. <laughs> Gee, his new book ought to be good. I'll just curl up in this easy chair and read it. Chapter One. I was framed. My name is Bruce Fink. Oh, it's an ordinary name. It hasn't even been mentioned as a Republican candidate. <laughs> I was an average man with normal habits. My only fault was, perhaps, that I spent my money a little too freely. Gee. <laughs> it all started one evening last April. We had just finished dinner, and I was in the kitchen washing the dishes. My wife, Flossie, was in the parlor dancing with our boarder, Silk Shirt Harry. <laughs> I also had a son named Gus. Some people thought he was stupid, because he was 16 years old, and he had just learned to tie his shoelaces. <laughs> Someday, he may even learn to tie them when they're in his shoes. That evening, Gus was helping me with the dishes. What's this, Papa? That's, that's a cup, son. Oh, and is this a saucer? No, 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 that's a knife. Saucer knife. Saucer knife. Saucer knife. Have you got that, son? Son? Yes, you're my son and I'm your father. <laughs> this is a cup and this is a knife. The one with the point is the knife. The one with the handle is the cup. And the one with the hole is your head. <laughs> Now, do you understand? Yes, son. No, no, no. Yo, no. No, look, look. You're the son. You see, I'm your father. But don't try to learn too much at one time. All right, I'll go to bed now. Good night, my boy. Good night, Papa. Oh, Papa. Yes, son. Papa, when are you going to tell me about the birds and the bees? Don't worry about the birds and the bees. First learn about the cups and the saucers. <laughs> They enjoy life, too. <laughs> Good night, Gus. Good night, Papa. Gus called me Papa. And I was glad that I made the right decision. Two days before, I almost traded him for a Cocker Spaniel. <laughs> I put away the dishes and started toward the parlor to join my wife, Flossie, and our boarder, Silk Shirt Harry. <laughs> Ah, swing it, Flossie, you little dove, you. <laughs> I'm way ahead of you, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, honey, let's try that dip again. Oh, you sure got a mean rug. That's nothing, baby. You ought to catch me on linoleum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Harry, hold me closer. I love to smell that bay rum. <laughs> <laughs> I know, baby. That's why I drink it straight. <laughs> Mind if I cut in, sweetheart? Are you finished with the dishes already? Oh, yes. They're all washed and put away. Look, Fink. Flossie and I are busy. Here's a dime. Why don't you run down to the store? What do you want me to get? Lost. I walked out of the house smiling at Flossie's little joke. Then I was horrified to see our son Gus lying on the front lawn with a broken leg. I know what had happened. When he went up to his room, he stepped out on the back. If I told him once, I told him a thousand times. We haven't got a balcony. <laughs> As I bent over him, Gus opened his eyes and said... What happened, son? No, 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 you're the son. I'm your father. Oh. Tell me, are you hurt? Yes, I think I broke my saucer. <laughs> Oh, 
That's your leg. As I walked down the street toward the corner store, I couldn't help thinking how lucky I was. I had a wonderful wife, a son with a broken saucer, <laughs> and a boarder who had his own show and went off the air for the summer. <laughs> What man could ask for more? Although I had never cared for riches, I did wish that I could afford to buy my wife, Flossie, the little extra things she never had before, like toothpaste, a toothbrush, or even tea. I continued walking down the street when suddenly a voice called to me from the darkened doorway of the First National Bank. Hey, you. You. Who, me? Yeah, you. Come here. You want to make 50 bucks? Without even thinking, I said no. Which proves I wasn't thinking. <laughs> so I thought it over and said... Did you say 50 bucks? Yeah. All you got to do is stand out here in front of the bank, and if you see a cop, just whistle. Whistle? Yeah. Whistle something like Melancholy Baby or Ballerina. Any popular number. If you don't mind, I'd like to whistle Stardust. I'm a friend of Hugo Carmichael. <laughs> Whistle ballerina. And when you see a cop coming, whistle loud so me and my friend can hear you. They weren't fooling me. I knew they were song pluggers. <laughs> I stood in front of the bank thinking of the $50 I was going to make. To me, that was a fortune. The nearest I ever came to being rich was when I almost guessed the name of the walking man. <laughs> I was so sure it was Frank Remley. <laughs> He fell off his stool for the summer. I stood there lost in thought. When suddenly from inside of the bank, I heard... The bank now had an open-toed vault. <laughs> the next thing I knew, I was in a speeding car, seated between two men and three sacks of money. Then suddenly it dawned upon me. This was a hold-up. <laughs> The rest of that ride was like a nightmare. Then the two men began to talk. Hey, Clyde. How much... How much did you promise this fink? They knew my name. <laughs> I looked at the men. Then I looked at their guns. I noticed the guns were identical. So I asked them why they both carried thirty-two caliber automatics. And they said... They're first again with hold-up men. <laughs> I knew what they meant, but I missed the music. I leered back at them and said, You fellas can't get away with this. I'm going to the police. You can't go to the police, buddy. You're in this as deep as we are. I knew that the two men were right. I was trapped. Through no fault of my own, I, Bruce Criminal, was now a fink. I mean, Bruce Fink was now a criminal. <laughs> I rode along with the three sacks of money. The car stopped at a corner. The men picked up two more sacks. One was Sacks Fifth Avenue. The car was now so crowded I had to sit in the back with the escalator. Finally, they threw me out of the car. By the time I got home, it was morning. A dreary morning. I looked up at the sky. Suddenly, the sun broke through the O in Honest John. <laughs> Through the window, I could see Silk Shirt Harry holding my wife, Flossie, in his arms. Their lips were pressed together. I dreaded going into the house. I'd been gone all night, and I couldn't tell them where I'd been. I didn't want Flossie to think that I was in love with another woman. I racked my brain, but I couldn't think of an excuse. So I decided to go in and brazen it out. As I opened the door, they were still kissing. As they saw me... Their lips parted. <laughs> Hello, Harry. Hello, Flossie. Are you back already? I know how you must have worried about me, darling, but I couldn't help it. I bumped into an old friend and we got to talking. And you know how time always... Kiss me again, Harry. Okay, baby. <laughs> it was as simple as that. <laughs> no questions, no jealous reproaches. Flossie trusted me implicitly. 
I think Harry did, too. I was heartsick as I went upstairs and threw myself on Gus's bed and knocked my pivot tooth out. If I told him once, I told him a thousand times. He hasn't got a bed. The next couple of weeks were like a horrible dream. I didn't know what the future had in store for me. I continued with my household duties. One day, as I was pushing bugs out of the screen with a toothpick, my son Gus was sitting nearby doing his homework. He looked up at me and said, Oh, fathead. That's father. At least you're getting closer. What is it, son? This pencil won't write. That's a knife. Look, son, that's a knife. This is a cup, and this is a saucer. Do you understand? Yes, son. No, 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 no. I'm your father. Now, how, how are you getting along with your spelling? Fine. I can count up to ten now. Good work. Now, listen, my boy. I'm going to take you into my confidence. Some men were robbing a bank, and they promised me $50 to whistle if I saw a cop. A what? A cop. That's a saucer. <laughs> I left Gus sitting in a pool of blood. <laughs> I couldn't stand him anymore. As I walked into the kitchen, the phone rang. The shiver went down my back. Then it went up my back. Then it went back down my back. The escalator was under my coat. <laughs> the phone rang again. Hello? Hello, Fink. We're pulling another job tonight, and we want you to whistle for us. And you better be there if you know what's good for you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I'll be there. I thought of running away. I thought of leaving town. I thought of Jane Russell. I don't know why I thought of her, but it was fun. <laughs> but when the burglars called, I knew I'd be there. This meant I'd have to leave the house again. But I didn't know how to break the news to my wife. I hoped she wouldn't take it too hard. I opened the door and walked into the parlor where I found Flossie and Harry... Looking at our picture album. <laughs> Look at this one, Harry. This is a picture of me and my husband, Bruce, the night we first met. <laughs> yeah. Hey, who's the other guy in the picture? That's Ralph Edwards. He introduced me to Bruce as part of my consequence. <laughs> Flossie, dear, I have to go out again tonight. And I may not be home until late. <laughs> and look, Carrie, here's a picture we took on our honeymoon. This is Bruce in his bathing suit. Holy mackerel, what a physique. He looks like something that was pushed through a screen with a toothpick. <laughs> 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 oh, I don't blame you for being furious, Flossie. But you'll have to trust me. And remember, no matter what happens, I want you to know that I love you. Well, I gotta go now. Goodbye, Harry. Goodbye, Flossie. How about a kiss? Not wanting to interrupt them. <laughs> I tiptoed out of the room. Once again, I walked out into the night to keep a rendezvous with destiny. <laughs> that night while I whistled, they robbed the second national bank. The next night, they robbed the third national bank. The night after that, the fourth national. And the following night, the sixth national. Everyone was expecting it to be the fifth Oh, they were shrewd, all right. <laughs> and then... It happened. The crooks decided I outlived my usefulness. They took me to a lonely road to bump me off. And I stood there helpless. They came at me with their guns drawn. I tried to get away, but it was no use. I was cornered, trapped. I screamed for help. Ah! Suddenly, from out of nowhere, police cars appeared. Suddenly, the cops jumped out. I thought I was saved, but no, they thought I was one of the crooks, and they started firing. I was hit in the arm, in the leg. I sank to my knees when suddenly... When suddenly... When suddenly... Hmm. The last page of this book is missing. Wait, quite a few pages are gone. Oh, Rochester! Rochester! Did you call me, boss? Yeah. What happened to this book? There were about a dozen pages torn out of it. You did that last week when you had your dinner party. What? If I told you once, I told you a thousand times. Buy paper napkins. <laughs> well, if you got the flap on my nightgown, I think I'll go to bed. Good night, Roger. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you agree that there is nothing more pathetic than a helpless child suffering from starvation, exposure, and sickness. 
Thousands of kids in the devastated countries are exactly in this predicament. So it's up to us to give them a chance to survive. We must help them grow up to be healthy, clear-thinking citizens. So let's help those unfortunate children by sending our contributions to Crusade for Children, New York City. Save a child, save the future. Thank you. Jack, we'll be back in just a minute, but first... American. Lucky Strike. First again with Tobacco Men. First again with Tobacco Men. As a recent impartial survey reveals, more independent tobacco experts smoke Lucky Strike regularly than the next two leading brands combined. More than the next two leading brands combined. Lucky Strike. First again with Tobacco Men. That's what the survey shows. Now, listen to what Mr. William Lee Curran, 24 years a tobacco auctioneer, recently said. For years and years, I've seen the makers of Lucky Strike buy fine, mild tobacco. Tobacco that's full of smoke and enjoyment. I've smoked Lucky's 23 years. So, light up a Lucky. And puff by puff, you'll see. L-S-M-F-T. L-S-M-F-T. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So round, so firm, so fully packed. So free and easy on the draw. So smoke the smoke, tobacco expert smoke. Lucky strike. First again with tobacco men. Dear, it feels good to get in bed. I'm really tired today. No, oh, down it, there's the buzzer. No, oh, now, who can that be at this hour, I wonder? Yes? Mr. Benny, if I told you once, I told you a thousand times. What is it? This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. You're listening to Hojo Radio. More classic old-time radio coming your way next. The Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. <laughs> Makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn, with songs by the King's Men and music by Billy Mills. The show opens with I Love Louisa. I was talking with a man who had just had the floors in his house completely refinished. In fact, he had just paid the bill. This time, we're going to take care of our floors, he told me. We're taking your advice about protecting them regularly with Johnson's Wax. Well, that's advice I give very freely on this program, and you're all welcome to accept it and save yourself expensive refinishing charges. It's really remarkable how much punishment floors will stand when they're given an occasional coat of genuine Johnson's Wax. Besides the money-saving protection, Johnson's Wax offers two other major advantages. First, the glowing beauty it gives to all floors, furniture, and woodwork. And second, the way it saves you work all during the year. Be sure, however, that you get the original and genuine Johnson's Wax, available in paste, liquid, or cream wax form. When house cleaning time comes, a husband does one of two things. One, he goes away someplace. Two, he hangs around and gets in the way. The guy living at 79 Wistful Vista is type number two, as you'll see when we join Fibber McGee and Molly. Now, McGee, if you're not going to be any more help than this, I wish you'd take the afternoon off. Go to a movie or something. I might call Billy Mills and go bowling. Well, why don't you? I can't. Billy hates bowling. <laughs> well, why don't you go down to the cigar store? You and the other hangers-on down there haven't settled the world situation for a long time. Ah, uh, those mugs don't know what it's all about. 
They're too fat to fight and too wise to know anything and too dumb to catch on when I try to explain things to them. <laughs> you being the authority, I suppose. Why not? I read the papers and study military tactics. All them drips do is stand around moaning about their tires. <laughs> Say, this tire shortage is certainly going to put the country back on its feet again. <laughs> I don't care. I like to walk. Remember last summer, Molly, when I was always planning to pack a lunch and get up early on some Sunday morning and take a long hike out into the country? Well, I remember you planning it, but you never went. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hate to go away and miss reading the Sunday paper. Well, you could have taken the Sunday paper with you. Oh, yeah? I know a guy that carried a Sunday paper two miles once. He's been bow-legged ever since. <laughs> well, now, if you're not going to help me with this house cleaning, I wish you'd go out someplace. Okay. Uh... But now, listen. Comb your hair first. I just did. Well, what'd you part it with? A coarse screw? <laughs> uh... I'm just different than most good-looking guys, Molly. Instead of curly hair and a straight part, I got straight hair and a curly part. <laughs> No kidding, Molly. I don't... Oh. What's the matter? Hurt your hand? Oh. Molly, what's the matter? McGee, my ring. My engagement ring. Huh? It's gone. Gone? Oh, my gosh. Hey, maybe you took it off to wash your hands. I don't. never take it off. Oh, dear. My beautiful engagement ring. Yeah. It'll break my heart if I lose that now. Well, where did you see it last? Right here on my left hand. Oh, dear, if I only... No, I mean, where were you? I you... had it this morning, and I haven't been out of the house. Now, let me see. First, I built a fire here in the fireplace. Well, maybe you dropped it in the fireplace. Oh, heavenly day. Scrape the ashes all out and sift them, McGee. Huh? I look upstairs, and then you get the vacuum cleaner, and we... Oh, dear. Come in. Oh, hello, Mrs. Uppington. Oh, how do you do, my dear? Hello, Mr. McGee. Hi, Uppy. Now, watch where you plant those big... I mean, uh, watch where you step, Uppy. We, we, we lost a diamond ring around here someplace. My engagement ring, Abigail. It's missing. Yeah. Oh, how terrible, my dear. And it was such a dainty little diamond, too. <laughs> well, I tell you, it isn't the ring so much as it is the sentiment, Abigail. I remember the night McGee gave it to me. Just like it was yesterday. There he was, kneeling in front of the... Oh, never mind that. <laughs> Uppy ain't interested in how... Oh, but I am, Mr. McGee. Oh, it's simply too, too romantic. <laughs> Tell me, my dear, after he put the ring on your finger, did he kiss your hand? Oh, sure. <laughs> I think he was going to, Abigail, but before he had a chance... My father came in with a glass of elderberry wine for each of us and said, congratulations, children. <laughs> ah, grand old man, too, your father. Must have waited outside that door for two hours and never spilled a drop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, hope, I hope you were married right away, my dears. I never did believe in long engagements. Neither did McGee. Particularly after we went into vaudeville. <laughs> you know, we never played a theater more than three days. <laughs> oh, good heavens. Were you in the theater? Oh, why, sure. Oh, how utterly fascinating. Uh, I was an actress once, Nathan. Oh, Whoopi. I remember you. Didn't you used to have an iron jaw act uh, swinging on a rope uh, by your teeth and waving a little American flag? Huh? <laughs> Now, please, Mr. McGee, I was never in vaudeville. No. I played only Shakespearean roles. <laughs> Juliet, you know. Oh, we played Joliet, too. <laughs> sure, Joliet, and then we went to Kankakee and Decatur. No, 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 no. <laughs> Not Joliet. Juliet, my dear. Oh, oh, yeah. oh what fun. My leading man fell in love with me. <laughs> oh, poor dear P. Jarvis. <laughs> P. Jarvis? Yes. yes, his name was John P. Jarvis, but I always called him P. Jarvis. <laughs> <laughs> that was cute. <laughs> well, whatever happened to old, I mean, uh, where, well, uh, I don't like to be nosy, Upsy. Oh. But to... <laughs> he went away to make his fortune, oh. but I've never seen him since. Well, didn't he leave any message when he left, Abigail? Yes. Yes, he left a note saying that someday he would return, and when he did, he... Oh, good heaven. I wonder. You wonder what? He said that some night he would return and toss a table at my window. Oh, my. Uh -oh. Do you suppose? Oh, but it couldn't. But still, I... Oh, my honest, have this investigated at once. Goodbye. <laughs> well, 
Well, if it was him that came back and threw a rock through her window, that lets you out, McGee. Mm. It lets me out of more than that. What do you mean? I mean this diamond ring of yours. I've been afraid. I mean, I am afraid. Uh, maybe I walked in my sleep again and... Uh, are you sure you had it on this morning? Yes, I am. Well, that's a load off my mind. I was afraid I'd got up in the night, swiped your rock, and heaved it through somebody's window. Well, come on, let's sift the ashes. Oh. Get the vacuum cleaner, Molly. We'll give this house a going over like it never has. Here, take my coat. gets the dirty. I've been looking for your diamond ring. I sifted all the ashes out of the fireplace and dumped them in the alley a grain at a time. Boy, that stuff sure makes you cough. Well, why don't you tie a handkerchief over your nose? I did. And then I had to breathe through my mouth. And that's what made me cough. <laughs> but your ring wasn't there. Well, I tell you, it's around someplace. Nothing is really lost till you quit looking for it, you know. Is that true? Certainly. Why? And I lost a couple of kneecaps. <laughs> Since I started putting on weight, I've quit looking for them. Oh, boy, am I tired. Well, I certainly appreciate your help, dearie. Now, listen, you take it easy and let me finish the house cleaning. I'll find my ring somewhere. No, sir. I'm going to turn this house upside down and shake it if I have to. Hand me that carpet sweeper. All right, darling. Here. And keep a sharp eye out in the corners along the baseboard. Oh, yeah. Heavenly days. My left hand feels positively indecent without that ring on it. Mm-hmm. I know how you feel, Molly. I lost my wristwatch once. And every time anybody'd look at my naked wrist, I'd blush clear up to my elbow. Listen, dearie, be sure to look under the edges of the rugs, won't you? Don't worry. Old Eagle Eye McGee is on the job. We'll get you. Oh, I wonder who that could be. Look out the window. Is there an armored delivery truck out there? No. Well, then it can't be the grocery man with my two pounds of sugar. Good day, Mrs. McGee. Hello, McGee. Oh, hi, Latrivia. What you all bundled up in the fur cap and mittens for? I regret to say that I neglected my business affairs today and yielded to the temptation to go out with a small party of friends. Oh. Uh, we have been boob sledding. No, no, no. Uh, you mean bob sledding. With the frantic little group of sportsmen I was with, Mrs. McGee, it is boob sledding. <laughs> They are imbued with the peculiar idea that to see how close one can steer a sled to a moving streetcar is the height of hilarity. <laughs> well, it is kind of fun at that, one, trivia. Yes, I imagine it would appeal to you too, McGee. You are the type that rocks rowboats and wears ladies' hats at parties. <laughs> Why, he does not. He always wears a lampshade. <laughs> Get a much bigger laugh with a lampshade, Latrivia. <laughs> that killed him. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. I shall try to remember that the next time. I'm... Oh, uh, but am I intruding? Were you cleaning house, Mrs. McGee? Well, yes. 
And then I lost my diamond engagement ring, Mr. Mayor. So we know it's around here someplace. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, do you mind if I take a look around? Oh, we'll be glad to have you, Latrive. Go ahead. Well, I don't see it anywhere. <laughs> You couldn't have found a flat car in a phone booth in that length of time. Uh, my eyesight is very penetrating, McGee. Oh. In fact, I was quite a student of mesmerism at one time. What's mesmerism? Uh, mesmerism. <laughs> Hypnotism. Uh, like this. Look me in the eye, McGee. Which one? Either one. Oh. Now relax. Mm. You're slowly coming under my dumb. Hmm? You have no will of your own. I've been telling him that for years, and I know hypnotism. Please. <laughs> McGee. All right, McGee. When I snap my fingers, you are completely subject to my orders. There. You see, Mrs. McGee? His mind is a blank. Look at that glassy stare. That's the way he always looks when he does crossword puzzles. <laughs> Isn't it, McGee? Isn't it, McGee? McGee! Well, heavenly days, he is hypnotized. Huh, of course he is. Watch this. McGee, you are an Airedale. A big brown Airedale. Speak. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Look at him trying to wag his tail. <laughs> no, 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 get down. Stop jumping up on me. Down, doggy, down. Oh! He bit me in the leg. Let me out of here. Well, aren't you going down and hypnotize him first? Oh, you'll come out of it shortly. I don't want to... Here, no! Get away from me! You, you brute! <laughs> Boy, I sure fooled him, didn't I, Molly? You fooled me, too. I was about to call the drugstore for some flea powder. Well, I had to get rid of that guy some way so I could get back to work. Some act, huh? It was wonderful. It was so realistic. I... McGee, pull in your tongue and stop that panting. I can't help it. I'm tired. This carpet sweeper works awful hard. Well, use the vacuum. Okay, plug in the cord, will you? All right. Thanks. What's the matter now? Motor won't start. McGee, have you been tinkering with it? Why should I tinker with the vacuum cleaner motor? I don't know, but have you? That's a silly question to think that I... McGee, have you? Oh, you mean with the vacuum cleaner motor. <laughs> yeah, come to think of it, I have. I took it apart to fix it. Well, couldn't you get it back together again, right? Ordinarily, I could, but... I took it apart on my workbench down in the basement, and I already had the lawnmower apart, and I didn't know which parts went back in which. That's lovely. Well, I'm glad you didn't have my sewing machine down there, too. I did. <laughs> but I kept the parts of that separate. Well, good for you. Yeah. I didn't want them to get mixed up with the works out of your electric mixer. What? <laughs> Days. Please, McGee, will you stop experimenting with the appliances? No, well, I was just trying to... Something is all. I thought if I fit a couple of little paddles to the mixing machine, I could use it for an outboard motor next summer. And my sewing machine? What were you trying to make out of that? A pencil sharpener? No, I... Hey, I bet you got something there. Oh. I bet if I attached a razor blade to no, the bottom... No, no, of... no. No, no, please. Go get the carpet sweeper and sweep these rugs. Yeah. Don't forget, I have a diamond ring laying around here someplace. Don't worry, I'll find it. I'm the Hello, Fibber. Hello, Molly. What's cooking, good looking? <laughs> I've lost my diamond ring, Mr. Wilcox. Yeah, be careful where you step, Harlow. We like mashed carrots, but not in the rug. <laughs> Woo! Am I hot tonight? <laughs> Well, gee, that's tough, Molly. Are you sure you lost it around here? No, absolutely. I always wear it right here on the third finger of my left hand. Hey, wait a minute. Let me see. Now, what good will it do to look at her hand? You're just hanging around the fairgrounds after the balloon's gone up. <laughs> hey, look at that hand. What's the matter with it? Nothing. It's lovely. Why, it's hands like yours that make the best possible advertising for Johnson's self-polishing glow coat. Oh, my. And glow coat is a beauty treatment for your linoleum, too. Now, I have 20 minute floor facial. Pour out a little glow coat, spread it around, and presto, in 20 minutes or less, it sparkles with pride and joy. <laughs> Arlo, you amaze me. <laughs> How so, Joe? <laughs> The way you keep up your enthusiasm. For seven years now and more, you've been whooping and hollering about Johnson's glow coat. Don't you ever let down? What do you mean, let down? After only seven years? 
Do you realize how many hundreds of years BG? BG. Before glow coat. Oh. How many hundreds of weary years women spent trying to keep their homes clean and bright with bunches of grass and crude brooms and dirty scrub brushes? The aches and pains and toil and... Oh, you wouldn't understand. Well, I hope you find your diamond, Molly. Thanks, <laughs> my, my, he certainly loves his work, doesn't he, dearie? Yeah, you know what he did? He what? went down to the Red Cross yesterday and gave him a pint of glow coat. <laughs> <laughs> he told him it was his life's blood. Oh. Well, we can't find that diamond, Molly. Move that chair, will you, so I can sweep on All the right. Ain't out of there any place. Oh, dear. You know what I can't understand is how that ring ever come off your finger. I thought it was on so tight. Well, it was. But whenever I worry, I lose weight. Well, what are you worrying about? Well, wouldn't you worry if you lost the diamond ring? <laughs> yeah, I guess I would at that. Oh, well, I better keep playing before I find it. Hello there, kids. Just stopped in to say goodbye. Why, Mr. Oldtimer? Where are you going? Joining the Navy, daughter. I'm an old salt, full of the old pepper. Eight bells and all's well. What? Believe the wheel and the life boy and look out. Lay off the top side on the ship's company. <laughs> sailing, sailing over the bounding main. May a shore me when she'll hey, blow. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Wait a minute, old timer. See? Hey. They won't take you in the Navy. You're too old. Well, you'd lay an awful egg in a crow's nest. <laughs> Is that so? Well, by John Paul Jones, Johnny, I've got my mind made up to join the Navy, and I'm going to do it. I already told the girl. Oh. I says, chicken, I says, <laughs> get off my arm and make way for an eagle. <laughs> I says, I... But now look, Mr. Oldtimer, you're way, way over the age limit. You can't get in if they won't take you. Then I'll stow away, daughter. I'll send you a snapshot of me on a destroyer. You ever get seasick, old timer? Oh, good gravy, Johnny. Why'd you have to mention that? <laughs> oh, that spoils everything. And I know I'd look cute in a sailor suit, too. I bet you would, too. <laughs> Indeed, you would. It's the navy blue that makes sailors like you, and it's sailors like you that make the navy blue. <laughs> That's pretty good, daughter, but that ain't the way I hear it. <laughs> the way I hear it, one fuller says, tell a fuller says. <laughs> You know what the Germans are going to do next in Russia? No, says Tullifeller. Well, what's the answer? Daughter, there's a feller with a little Charlie Chaplin mustache. I'd like to know that, too. <laughs> well, I'm still going to try and get in the Navy, kids. <laughs> The White Cliffs of Dover. I'll never forget the people I met braving those angry skies. I remember well as the shadows fell, the light of hope in their eyes. And though I'm far away, I still can hear them say, Thumbs up! Well, 
house has been since it left the lumberyard. <laughs> hey, Molly. Did you call me, McGee? Every day's look at you perspire. Uh, why not? I cleaned the whole downstairs, vacuumed all the rugs and cleaned out all the desk drawers and emptied the cigar ashes out of all the vases. Oh, good for you. Good for you. But I'll feel terrible if we don't find my ring. You see who that is. I'm going to look around upstairs once more before... Okay, I'll okay. Come in. Hi, mister. Oh, hello, sis. Now, I haven't got time to talk to you now. Mrs. McGee's lost her diamond engagement ring. Is she engaged? <laughs> no, she ain't engaged. She's married. Well, then why hasn't she got a wedding ring, hmm? She has got a wedding ring. She's also got an engagement ring. I thought she, she lost it. She did. Then she hasn't got it, huh? I know she hasn't got it, but she had it, and she lost it. Where? Look, sis, if we knew where she lost it, we'd go there and find it, wouldn't we? Maybe she swallowed it. Hmm. I swallowed a nickel once. <laughs> you did? Hmm? I says you did. Did what? You swallowed a nickel. I know it. <laughs> Look, sis, I'm busy. Go on home now and leave me in peace. Come back in the spring and we'll chase butterflies together or something. Go on, I'll beat it. Okay, mister. Well. But spring won't be here for six weeks more. Who said so? Well, gee, the, the grog hound saw his shadow yesterday. Grog hound? <laughs> you mean Uncle Dennis? <laughs> no, no. No, no, the grog hound like a little dog, kind of. Oh! You, you mean the groundhog. Sure. Well, I guess that proves it all right, sis. They say the groundhog is always right. Gee, do you think so, Mr. Hill? Absolutely. Nature gives them little animals the instinct for that kind of stuff like that there, sis. Mm -hmm. That's how the robins know where to fly down to where it's warm. Oh. And how the bears know when to go to sleep for the winter. Oh. And how the little moths... <laughs> how the little moths know when to start munching on your best favorites. <laughs> I guess you never thought of that before, did you, sis? Sure, I have, I bet you. Oh, you have, huh? Sure. Mm -hmm. But I always kind of laugh it off, mister. Huh? Because anybody with the brain of a bumblebee knows that a groundhog is just a stupid little quadruped that wouldn't know February 2nd from National Apple Week and hardly a proper source for intelligent meteorological forecasting. So long, long cat. <laughs> that impudent little twerp. One of these days I'm going to lose my patience and play clap hands, here comes Fibber on the back of her rompers. <laughs> now, let me see. I better put that piano back where I got it. Oh. Boy, am I wore to an oven. I got more creaks than the cricket and more pains than the greenhouse. My back is so... I'm almost ready to give up. Hmm. And you know, it just breaks my heart. I... Well... For goodness sakes, how nice everything looks, dearie. Oh, boy, it ought to look nice. I've lost seven pounds in weight, two inches in height, and a lot of interest in life. Well, <laughs> now you just sit down and rest, dearie. You've really worked hard today, and I appreciate it. Yeah, what good did it do? With your ring still missing? Well, I'll be... Look! What's that? What's what? What are you staring at? Your hand! Hey, your finger! 
Your ring, there it is. Why, you must be seeing things. My hand is as bad as... No, 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 no. Your right hand. You got your ring on the other hand. (laughs) Well, for... Oh, oh, McGee, thank you, darling. Thank you for finding it. (laughs) What do you mean, finding it? You had it all the time. Well, if I'm not the worst... Now I remember. I put it on the other hand this morning to remind me of something. Remind you of what? Never mind. It seems so silly now. Huh. Well, I want to know. I got a right to know. And I can keep from collapsing just long enough for you to tell me. Oh, <laughs> this, is, this is so ridiculous. <laughs> well, why did you put the ring on the other hand? Well, it was to remind me to ask you to help me with the house cleaning today. <laughs> weather when the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker come tramping across your kitchen floor with wet and soggy feet, your linoleum needs extra protection. Give it that protection with Johnson's self-polishing glow coat and see what a difference it makes in your daily work and in the appearance of your kitchen. As a matter of fact, it's when your floors get this extra punishment that you can see what a wonderful polish glow coat really is. It has a flexible film, which means that it wears evenly without chipping. It has a lasting luster, gives floors sparkling beauty that brings out and preserves the fresh colors of the linoleum. And glow coat is economical because a little goes a long way. Glow coat is self-polishing, needs no rubbing or buffing. You simply apply and let dry. But for glow coat results, be sure you get the one and only Johnson self-polishing glow coat. You know what? No, what? I made up my mind I'm going to quit joking about not using our car so much. You know, this is a serious business. I think our support of these wartime restrictions ought to be absolutely... Uh... Tireless. Huh? Yeah. Good night. <laughs> Good night, honey. Department has just announced new revised regulations for training aviation cadets. Under these new rules, men between 18 and 26, married or single, with or without college education, are now eligible for the Army Air Corps. More than two million more men may now join this exciting branch of the service and play an important part in America's all-out victory program. How to join? See your local Army recruiting station immediately. This is Harlow Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson's Wax Finishes for Home and Industry, inviting you to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. The makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn. Songs for the King's Men and music by Billy Mills. The show opens with O.G.O. Joy. Some speakers and writers have a tendency to use big phrases and words when small, simple words might be better. Civilization is a big word, for example, but home is a small word that we can all understand. A word that expresses everything we're fighting for, liberty, freedom, family. And it's a word that tells the part you women play in this war. For it's your main job to keep those home fires burning, keep your homes clean, orderly, cheerful. And it's part of your job to take care of the things you have, make them last a longer time. Now, that's not an easy job, but a useful product like genuine Johnson's Wax makes it easier. Because the regular use of Johnson's Wax gives lasting protection to floors, furniture, and woodwork, guards them against dirt and wear, makes cleaning easier, saves you hours of time, and adds rich beauty in the bargain. Try protective housekeeping in your home if you're not already a regular user of genuine Johnson's Wax. Paste, liquid, or cream.
Alexander Graham Bell could have foreseen that people would pick up his invention and say, guess who this is, he'd have dropped the whole idea. If Edison had known that his phonograph would wind up playing Chattanooga Choo Choo, he'd have spent more time on the electric light. That's how it is with men who have ideas, men with vision, men who do things, men who... Well, you'll get a rough idea listening to Fibber McGee and Molly. Can I tell you... Oh, but McGee, I don't want you to make me a footstool. I want to buy this one advertised by the bond time. That? That rickety, unseasoned, hammer scratch, not holy hunk of driftwood? That wobbly leg son of a cheap card table? It's not cheap. It's twelve ninety five. Well, go buy a thirteen buck hat then. I'm making this footstool. I'll turn you out the most unreasonably exact facsimile of this advertisement you ever laid your beautiful big green eyes on. My eyes are blue. They'll be green with jealousy when they see the footstool I'm going to make. Why, when I get started on a project of this Come time... in. Hi, Johnny. Hello, daughter. You ordered some stuff from the hardware store? No, Mr. Oldtimer, I don't... Think... I did. I ordered a few woodworking tools, Oldtimer. Is that they? You betcha, Johnny. <laughs> Three chisels, hand drill, scraper, spirit level, cross-cut saw, and some brass tacks. <laughs> How much, old-timer? Well, let me see now. Johnny, do I have four, seven, six, five, eighteen, nine, sixty-two, including the coffee. What coffee? Did you order coffee from the hardware store, dearie? No, I didn't. Now, look, old-timer, what's the idea? Now, wait a minute, Johnny. <laughs> Don't get your portion of pandemonium. I just... Uh, hey, daughter, what's pandemonium? <laughs> That's an uproar. That's what I thought. Now, don't get your portion of pandemonium, Johnny. You ordered this stuff from the hardware store, didn't you? Yes or no? Yes, but I... Wanted it delivered, didn't you? Well... Yes I... or no? Yes, but I... You knew they didn't have any delivery service, didn't you? Yes or no? No, I didn't. Well, they haven't. So I told them I'd bring it over here, and you appreciate that, don't you? Yes or no? Yes, but... What... Well, it's a cold day, and I stopped for a cup of coffee. You grudge me that. Yes or no? Of course not, though. Okay, 962, including the coffee. <laughs> well, here's $10, Mr. Oldtimer, and thank you very much. No, forget it, daughter. Glad to do it. You ain't sure about the coffee, Johnny. Oh, no, 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 but I still don't know why, according to this bill, you had to pay 85 cents for a cup of coffee. I like sugar in it. Oh, oh my. <laughs> well, thanks for stopping by with the stuff, old-timer. And I don't mind about the coffee. What's an extra little chisel among all these tools? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good, Johnny. But that ain't the way I hear it. The way I hear it, one fella says, tell a fella, my doctor done told me <laughs> My doctor done told me to eat a lot of carrots I've tried it and it sure builds up your resistance Is that so, says the feller To colds? No, says the first feller To carrots <laughs> Well, see you later, kids <laughs> Huh? When did you order these tools? Yesterday, when you first started thinking about the footstool. Say, I didn't realize you knew I was even looking at that advertisement. Uh -huh. Have you got eyes in the back of your head? No, but I got a head in the back of my eyes. <laughs> now, look, you know what I'm going to do? Wait till I cross my fingers. All right, what are you going to do? <laughs> I'm going to bring my tools to stop upstairs here and work in the living room. Oh, no. You huh? might wake Uncle Dennis, McGee. He's asleep, you know. He is? I thought he was going out with a bunch of fellas for some gin rummy. Well, he did, but uh, when he found out it was a card game, he came home. <laughs> well, I'll hammer real quietly. I wouldn't disturb the old fellow. Ah, oh, doggone it. And I wanted to get to work. Who's at the door? Let me peep. Uh-oh, Mrs. Uppington. Ah, dear old Uppy, the salt of the earth. You really think so? I sure do. You can't take much of her at a time. <laughs> And it takes a good shaking to get her to come out in wet weather. <laughs> come in. Oh, hello, Abigail. Oh, how do you do, my dear? And Mr. McGee. Hi, babe. What's new in the name? <laughs> oh, Mrs. McGee. Here's you simply a 
adore your husband when he's in one of those clever moods. Well, I wouldn't say adore, Abigail. Tolerate would be more appropriate. But uh, what can we do for you? Well, I just stopped in to ask you both over for a fish dinner tomorrow evening. My brother has sent me some marvelous mountain trout. Oh, boy, that's for me, Uppy. Uh-huh. I love trout. And they better be good, too, because I'm an expert on fish. Oh, really? Oh, indeed, yes, Abigail. I wish I could tell you what those old fishermen up in Oregon said about McGee last summer. <laughs> well, uh, why can't you? <laughs> because I'm too much of a lady, for one thing. <laughs> And for another thing, it ain't true. I still don't know how that mouse trap got on the end of my fish line. <laughs> hey, did I ever tell you how I caught the big trout in the Pahushka pool, Uppy? No, I do believe you did, Miss McGee. That's right, Abigail. I believe you are the one he didn't tell. <laughs> well, sir, the Pahushka pool was a kind of a little white place in the Pahushka River way up in South Wiki, um, or Wiki up Oregon. See? <laughs> there was a trout in there three feet long, and nobody had ever been able to catch him. Till I come along. Oh, good heavens, how thrilling. Did you use some special kind of bait, Mr. McGee? Yeah. I caught him with a Mack truck. <laughs> a Mack truck? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes, sir. I was standing in the middle of the Pahushka pool one day, all ready to cast, when along the road comes a wholesale drug truck. The driver was so busy watching me that he lost control of the truck, hit the bridge approach, run the thing off the bridge right into the Pahushka pool. And quick to flash, all the water run into the truck, drying up the Pahushka pool, and I walked over and picked up that big trout right out of the mud. Uh, my goodness, Mr. McGee, that's astounding. Uh, but why should all the water run into the truck? It was hauling a load of sponges. <laughs> oh, I tried. And uh, speaking of sponges, Abigail, we'll be very glad to come to dinner. <laughs> Hey, wait a minute. Uh, we'll come on one condition, Abby. Oh? What is that, Miss McGee? As air raid warden around here, I had complaints about you. You got a promise to get some heavy curtains or something and black out your house. Very well, Miss McGee. I shall naturally do anything to cooperate, although I consider the whole thing very, very silly. Oh, oh. now, Abigail, that's not the right attitude at all. What's silly about covering up your windows? <laughs> oh, Miss McGee, you're so naive, really. <laughs> Oh, don't you realize, my dear, that if the Japanese or the Germans should come to Wistful Victor, they'll be far too busy to go about peeping into people's windows. <laughs> Oh. 
Oh, dear. Come in. Oh, good day, Mayor Latrivia. Come right in. Oh, hi, Latriv. Just the guy I wanted to see. Oh, you wish to see me, McGee? Yes. <laughs> I think he wants to apologize, Mr. Mayor. I do, Latrivia. I do. I want to apologize for thinking you were a crook last week. I'm sorry. Well, that's quite all right, McGee. I'll admit the appearances were against me. I accept your apology. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just to show there are no hard feelings, why don't you come to dinner tomorrow night? Hey, Molly, we're going to Alpies tomorrow night. Oh, yeah. How about Thursday night, Mr. Mayor? Splendid, Mrs. McGee. Thank you very much. And bring your wife, Latrivia. Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Come on, bring her. I'm sorry, Mrs. McGee, but to be frank... To be frank, we ain't good enough to meet your wife, is that it? Why, if you ain't the stuck-up and a snob... McGee! Huh? Maybe Mayor Latrivia has some good reason he doesn't want to bring his wife. I have a very good reason. You see... There can't be any good reason for that. Latrivia's just high half, that's all. Why... Now, just a minute, McGee. If you can restrain your impetuosity for a brief interval... And never mind the big words, either. I know what you mean. You ain't fooling me with them jawbreakers, Latrivia. Now, McGee, he only said... I know what he said, Molly. And I don't take that from anybody. McGee, I merely attempted to interpolate a few words to indicate that you are irretrievably, yes, even incongruously in error. If you think... That's enough, Latrivia. Take off your coat. (laughs) Now, 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 stop this, McGee. You're just excited, dearie. I'm sure Mary Latrivia can explain himself. To McGee, I wouldn't consider it necessary, Mrs. McGee. But to you... Yes. Yeah? Well, it better be good, too, bud. That's all I gotta say, too. McGee, let the mayor talk. Why can't you bring your wife, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, why? Well, if you think I'm going out and get married just so I can bring a wife to your family clam bake, McGee, you're dripping wet. I'll see you for dinner Thursday. (laughs) Well, now, aren't you ashamed, McGee? Shamed and chagrined. <laughs> How did I know he wasn't? Gee, that was a natural mistake. You know, I thought he was married myself. Yeah. Seventy days, McGee. If you could get a lovely girl like me, certainly he ought to be able to find one. <laughs> well, I suppose that's the difference between having a character and being one. <laughs> now, what was I doing before he... Oh, yeah. Oh, don't worry. I got newspapers spread around, haven't I? Only amateurs make a mess of this stuff. I'm an expert. So you've told me. You certainly talk a wonderful little foot, too. Well, I build one, too. I remember one time... Hey, where's the saw? In your hand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember one time I was up in North Dakota. I'm the old man. Don't call me. Carpenter, too, Mr. Wilcox? No, I would say that, Molly. I don't think I could stand it. Stand what? Oh, sawing wood, pounding nails into it, cutting it to pieces, scratching it all up. It'd break my heart. You know why? No, why? Don't go away, folks. <laughs> Our Mr. Wilcox feels very deeply about certain things, and we don't like to discourage the enthusiasms of a grown boy. <laughs> Makes him sensitive. <laughs> why don't you like to do carpet drinks, sonny? <laughs> Well, I guess I've spent too many years selling people on the idea of protecting and beautifying wood surfaces. Trevor, you know, Johnson's Wax. <laughs> Bringing out the natural luster and charm of furniture and floors. Showing people how they can protect their wood, not deface it. I understand perfectly, Mr. Wilcox. Sure you do, Molly. Any housewife understands. They know that with Johnson's Wax, their woodwork and furniture and floors are practically everlasting, to say nothing of ever beautiful. Just like Johnson's self-polishing glow coat preserves and protects linoleum against dirt and wear. And there's never been a time when it was more important to take better care of our possessions and make them last longer. You see what I mean? You see what, see what I mean, folks? He means it. Well, why shouldn't I? Oh, you should. You should. But is it really true, Harlow, that you wrote your congressman and told him to start a movement to have the capital of the United States move to Racine, Wisconsin? <laughs> oh, that was just a suggestion. 
But look, what I came over for was to ask about Lillian. Oh, our horse. Well, she's just fine, Mr. Wilcox. Oh, that's good. Now, look, I brought her a little gift. Oh, look, Molly. Four horseshoes made out of felt. Oh. Yeah, just something for Lillian to wear lounging around in the garage. <laughs> Those open-heeled iron shoes of hers must get pretty tiring on that cement floor. Just tell her they're from Uncle Harlow. So long now. Uh-huh. My, my, wasn't that a sweet thought, McGee? Bedroom slippers for Lily. Yeah. yeah. Now all she needs is a smoking blanket and a subscription to town and country. <laughs> oh, I... See, how are you doing, McGee? Oh, swell. I got the legs all made. All I got... Hey, where are you going? Well, I've got to go upstairs and get some more yarn for my needle point, Jerry. I'll be back before you can say, oh, these legs are too short. <laughs> they are not too short. They're perfect. If Betty Grable was a footstool and had legs like these, I'll bet you... <laughs> Hi, mister. Oh, hello, little girl. Don't bother me now. I'm busy. Busy doing what, mister? Hmm, what you doing? Hmm, what you... Well, sis, at the moment, I'm on the verge of merging this virgin timber into a footstool. <laughs> Go beat it, will you? You distract me. Can I use the phone, mister? Hmm, can I play? Hmm? Ah, you better not, sis. I'm too busy. Well, gee, mister, now, I just... quiet. Just quiet. I'm trying to think. Now, let's see. Can I take this phone? Hey, you... mister. Huh? Why does wood have knot holes in it? Hmm, why does it? I don't know. Now, let me see. If I take all past me... Why does all wood have those funny marks in it, mister? I don't know, sis. Down here, the data water there. Hey, mister, why does wood smell so good when you saw it? Why does it? I don't know. You don't mind if I ask questions, do you, mister? Oh, of course not. How else can you learn anything? <laughs> now can I use your telephone, mister? Hmm? Gee, it'll only take a minute. No, 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 no. Now take it easy, sis. Relax. All righty. Now, let's see. Hey, mister, what's the ice pick for? That isn't the ice pick, sis. That's a all. Hmm? It's a all. It's a all of what? <laughs> that's all. Just a all. That's what they call it. A all. You mean that's what they all call it? <laughs> sure. But what is it? <laughs> I just told you, it's a all. Okay. Well, see if I... Hey, mister. Hmm? Can I use your phone? Hmm? Can I? Hmm? May I? Hmm? I said, may I? Why not? It's your phone. You shouldn't say, can I do this or that, fish? You should say, may I? May I what? Well, may I use your phone or whatever it is you want to do. What do you want to do? I want to use your phone. Can I? Okay, okay. Go ahead, <laughs> go ahead and use it, but make it snappy. Okay. Uh, well, police department, please. Uh, hey, you know somebody in the police department, sis? No. Well, then you haven't got any business bothering me. Okay, mister, I just want to tell Well, never mind. They ain't interested in your cat running away or your tortoise being turtle napped or... But, gee, mister, this was important. What's important? Come on, tell Uncle Fibber all about it. Well, when I came past Uncle Fibber's house, I saw some men taking a spare tire off his car out in front, and... <laughs> you did, huh? <laughs> well, that's very interesting. Now, let's see. What? What? My spare tire? Get back on that phone, sis. Call the police.
your footstool. All done. Good for you, McGee, and a handsome job, too. Thank you very much. Oh, it was nothing that any red-blooded American boy couldn't have done. <laughs> All of these now is a coat of shellac and some Johnson's wax, and you'd never know it from the picture in the advertisement. Ah, uh, when I think of what I... Come in. Package for Mrs. McGee. Sign here, please. All right. And thank you very much. Oh, that's okay, lady. If circumstances was reversed, and I was the customer, and you was the delivery man, I'm sure you, you would be glad to be of service, too. That's the way I feel about it. Philosophical. <laughs> Good for you, bud. And for your cheerfulness and all, here's a nickel for you. Uh, it's getting so you can't even depend on philosophy. <laughs> In that package, Molly. More yarn for your needlepoint? No, I just got the bag. Oh, for the love of Mike. Come in. Hello, folks. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Wimple. Hi, Wimple. Glad you drooped in. <laughs> you look kind of troubled. Yes, what's the matter? No, sweetie face and I had words. <laughs> words, eh? Yes. Yeah. We had words, only I didn't get a chance to use my... My, my, well, what was the argument? Well, it all started as a gag, you might say, Mrs. McGee. What was the gag, Wimp? Oh, an old bandana handkerchief she crammed in my mouth. <laughs> well, now, listen, you shouldn't let her do all those things to you, Mr. Wimple. Assert yourself. Be a caveman. Oh, I tried that, too, Mrs. McGee. I tried eating a caveman for a whole week once. What happened, Wimp? Oh, sweetie face crawled in the cave after me and dragged me home. Well, now you just wait. Someday it'll all change, Mr. Wimple, and you'll make her respect you. I really hope so, Mrs. McGee. Sometimes I think I just can't stand it any longer. Like yesterday, for instance. I really gave vent to my feelings then. You did, really? Oh, indeed I did. I was really in a rage. I said, look here, sweetie face, I said. I've had enough of this treatment. From now on, I'm going to be the boss around here, I said. Starting today, I'll give the orders. Oh, heavenly days, and then what? Then I dialed our number, but she wasn't at home. <laughs> You'll say that stuff in your sleep, Wimp, and then you will be in a pickle. Oh, I know, Mr. McGee. I've had that experience, too. I told Sweetie Faith exactly what I thought once while I was sleeping on the Davenport. Oh, my. Was she angry? Oh, was she angry? First, she picked up a book like this and threw it through a window like this. Wait a minute, Wimple. We didn't mean And to... then she threw a lamp on the floor like this. Oh, no, please, Mr. Wimple. And then Mr. she went into a rage and picked up a little footstool like this oh, and literally God. tore it apart. Oh, hey! No, I just made that footstool, Wimple. Don't do that with my footstool. Oh, oh. Can you imagine such a woman, folks? I'm just so discouraged. I'm going right out and shoot myself. A game of pool. He's discouraged. Can you imagine that? Look at that broken window. Look at the floor lamp. Don't look at those. Look at my new footstool. Smash the smithereens. Now I'll have to start all over. No. No, you won't, dear. Huh? Here's the one I ordered from the bomb town. That's the package that just came. What? You knew I was going to make one and you still ordered that one from the bomb town? Did you know this was going to happen? Can you see into the future? No, but I can remember the past. Oh, yeah. looking things over carefully to see which ones would be difficult to replace. When I got to the, uh, kitchen, to, the, to the kitchen, I, of course, noticed the stove, refrigerator, and other items made with metals. And then all of a sudden I realized that our linoleum is made of ingredients that aren't easy to get. 
I'm glad we have Johnson's self-polishing glow coat in our house so we can protect that linoleum and make it last. Linoleum which is protected with glow coat regularly will last at least five to ten times longer than if it's unprotected. Glow coat has other primary advantages besides protection. It saves work because it's self-polishing, needs no rubbing or buffing, and it makes kitchen floors beautiful, keeps the colors bright. If I were you, I would protect my floors from now on with Johnson's self-polishing glow coat. Don't you settle down. You're so restless, you make me nervous. Oh, I can't help it, Molly. I want to do something about this war. I want to get in and help. Well, my goodness, you've been buying defense bonds for all your worth. Yeah, but that's no sacrifice. That's just a darn good investment. I want to really get in there and pitch. I want to fight. Oh, but you're a little over age for that, dearie. Oh. I'm afraid you'll have to be one of the men behind the men behind the gun. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, I'm not so old. I'd make a wonderful captain of artillery. No. No, you just stay on the radio, dearie, and be a colonel of corn. Good night. Good night, all. This is Harlow Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson's Wax Finishes for Home and Industry, inviting you all to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. In that program, for taking better care of your automobile, don't forget the finish. If you want your car to be good-looking two years from now, clean and polish it occasionally now with Johnson's Car New. That remarkable labor saver that both cleans and polishes in one application. Two jobs at once in quick time. Car New will keep your car new-looking with a minimum of work and at low cost. And you'll enjoy driving ever so much more. Ask your dealer for Johnson's Car New, spelled C-A-R-N-U. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. You're listening to Hojo Radio. For your entertainment and pleasure, here is our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> our Miss Brooks teaches English at Madison High School. And like many other teachers, started last Monday. And like many other teachers, I attended a faculty meeting Monday afternoon. Here, our beloved principal, Osgood Conklin, gave me my semi-annual pat on the back. Then I picked myself up and walked back across the room. (laughs) And he instituted his new crackdown plan. More discipline, less horseplay, everybody toe the line, run the school in an orderly manner. After this mirth-provoking monologue, he chewed up a little furniture and stalked out. Well, maybe it was the faculty meeting, or then again, maybe it was the watercress and cucumber sandwich I had before retiring. (laughs) At any rate, I remember lying in bed Monday night and dozing off, when suddenly I seemed to be awakened by a loud pounding at my door. What is it? Uh, Who's there? It is I, Osgood Conklin, your beloved principal. I'm coming in. Mr. Conklin, is anything wrong? Wrong? There's plenty wrong. We've got to crack down. More discipline. Less horseplay. Everybody toe the line. Run the school in an orderly manner. But, Mr. Conklin, is this your idea of less horseplay? I was fast asleep. Oh, then I hope I'm not disturbing you. (laughs) I'll go right on sleeping. Good. Miss Brooks, I've got to talk to you. Well, pull up a cucumber sandwich and sit down. Thank you. Mr. Conklin, you're biting the arm of my chair. Uh, yes, so I am. Sorry, but you know how I get when I'm upset. Now then, Miss Brooks, we've got to have more discipline. Got to have discipline. Got to have discipline. Got to have discipline. You hear me, Miss Brooks? I just heard four of you. <laughs> you're right. There are four of me. More discipline, Conklin. Less horseplay, Conklin. Toe the line, Conklin. And run the school in an orderly manner, Conklin. I wish I could add just one more. Which one? Rest in peace, Conklin. (laughs) Uh, Enough of these pleasantries, Miss Brooks. As you know, our profession teaches us that we must learn by doing. So, here we go. Everybody up, 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 up. Rise and shine. Leave the sack. Leave the sack. (laughs) Mr. Conklin, are you telling me to get up now? Miss Brooks, do I have to dump your bed? No, sir, I'm getting up. (laughs) Now then, setting up exercises. Hands on shoulders, place. Now touch the floor. One, two. Sound off. Three, four. Open the door. Five, six. 
Why don't I pick up some sticks and beat him over the head with them? <laughs> ah, you're nervous, Miss Brooks. Overwrought. You should get more rest. Oh, now we're on the same side. I'll get back in bed, and you just fade into the woodwork. <laughs> Not so fast, young woman. First, we must practice our daily hair treatment. Hands on head, place. Now then, rub. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. How is One. that, Mr. Conklin? Am I doing it right? Oh, it feels great, Miss Brooks. I should have eight new hairs by Monday. <laughs> One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Time to get up, Connie. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Connie, why are you massaging that pillow? It's got to have eight new hairs by morning. (laughs) Connie, Connie, wake up. Oh, oh, has he gone? Has who gone? Oh, 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 just forget about it, Mrs. Davis. It isn't important. On the contrary, I think it's intriguing. Has who gone? Please, Mrs. Davis, it was just one of my nightmares. Oh, was it a bad one, dear? It was in Technicolor and starred Osgood Conklin. (laughs) I spent half the night rehearsing how to get up in the morning. That's why I was so nervous when you woke me. I know how dreams can affect you, dear, but you must put them out of your mind when you wake up. Why, I had some bad dreams last night myself. You did? Yes, I was in a jungle somewhere surrounded by lions and tigers. But if my cat Minerva walked in now, I wouldn't jump up on the chandelier. I mean, you must have better control of your nerves than I have. Meow! <laughs> See if we need any new bulbs up there, Mrs. Davis. <laughs> Where in the world did you come from? Oh, I haven't told her about that yet, Connie. She's only a kitten. (laughs) Well, you'd better have a little talk with her. She's been running around with a pretty old crowd. (laughs) Please, Connie, don't talk that way in front of her. Minerva's very high strung. Yes, I know. Lately, that cat's been as jumpy as a person. (laughs) Now, let's forget about about nerves and bad dreams and hurry in for a nice breakfast. I've got a brand new secret recipe for you. A secret recipe, Mrs. Davis? Yes. If I tell you how I'm making your egg this morning, will you keep it under your hat? Well, it may get my hair do a little icky, but I'll try. <laughs> I'm making you a delicious watercress and cucumber omelet. Oh, no. That would have started my nightmare. Besides, I haven't time to eat breakfast now, Mrs. Davis. Walter Denton's picking me up any minute. How come Walter's calling for you today? Your car isn't in the repair shop again, is it? No, but I decided not to drive for a while after picking up a couple of hitchhikers last Saturday. But, Connie, why should that discourage you from driving? I picked him up on my bumper. Would you lean over toward my side of the car a little more, please, Miss Brooks? Why, Walter Denton, what have you in mind? Oh, it's nothing personal. I just want to get a good look at you in my rear view mirror. Yup, it's just as I thought. You look harassed. Harassed and bedeviled. Yeah, but lovely... Well, thank you, Walter. <laughs> sort of. But, Walter, uh, to what do I owe these backhanded gallantries? Yeah, I was afraid you might take exception to my frankness. But I mean it all for your own good, Miss Brooks. If I have been less voluble concerning your obvious charms in the past, know, too, that I have been less voluble about the human frailties which you, like all mankind, have sometimes fallen heir to. Except, then, my plea for leniency. I'll grant you a full pardon if you'll tell me what you're talking about. (laughs) What are you trying to wheedle out of me, Walter? Well, now that you mention it, there is something you can do to help both of us out. I thought so. What is it? Oh, it's like this. You, like several of the other teachers, will be assigned to the stockroom during your free period to take inventory and give out supplies. I see. And what does my good friend Raffles have in mind? We split a carload of pencils and retire? Oh, oh no, Miss Brooks. My motives are purely altruistic. 
I merely want to assist an already overburdened teacher whose heart and spirit are big and willing, but whose mind and body may not long stand the strain put upon it by the forthcoming scholastic hassle. <laughs> now come clean. What's your cut in the projected Madison High School stockroom swindle? Cut? Oh, Miss Brooks, I'm surprised at you. Surprised and chagrined. Oh, when I think of your sense of integrity, your honesty... Please, and... Walter, if you polish this apple anymore, it'll be too slippery to pick up. <laughs> now, come to the point, Walter. Well, whoever helps out in the stockroom gets first choice of the textbooks, right? Right. And you want to help me so you can get yourself the brand new books, nice and clean, right? Wrong. I want the old ones with the answers already penciled in. <laughs> Now, why did I let that slip out? Oh, but you can see it my way, can't you? Sometimes in the impenetrable forest of education, the path is easier seen if someone has cleared the underbrush. <laughs> yes, but you're asking for a free ride on the bulldozer. <laughs> Don't you think it would be better if you relied on your own work, Walter? After all, with an old book, you could be copying somebody else's mistakes. Anybody's mistakes are better than mine. <laughs> Well, if you put it that way, Walter. Gee, thanks, Miss Brooks. Well, here we are. Thanks for the lift, Walter. I'll run along in now. Oops. Ooh. Gosh, Miss Brooks, didn't you see that mud puddle? Of course I did. I just thought it might be fun to go wading. <laughs> well, can I help you scrape off the mud? Well, I haven't time now. If I can just sneak by Mr. Conklin's office, I'll clean up when I get to my room. But suppose you can't sneak by his office. That, Walter, I refuse to contemplate. Believe me, if Mr. Conklin sees me tripping through the hall on these two lumps of mud, my name will be Shoes. <laughs> Starring Eve Arden will continue in just a moment, but first, perhaps the best known example on you. Miss Brooks is quietly sloshing down the corridor in her muddy pumps. Let's look in on Mr. Conklin, Madison's beloved principal, and adjust our wavelength to his stream of consciousness. So we come to the start of another school day. A nice muggy one at that, as if I needed bad weather to make me irritable. The teachers in this school have simply got... Now, who's that tracking her dirty shoes through our hallowed halls? <laughs> Think she's going to sneak past my office, does she? Well, we'll just wait till she's even with the door. And then... Oh, who goes there? <laughs> you, Mr. Conklin. How are things in the principal's office? <laughs> Fine, thank you. How are things in the Everglades? Just uh, take those shoes off and step in here for a moment, Miss Brooks. I want to talk to you. Yes, sir. Do you by any chance remember what I told the faculty at the meeting yesterday? Oh, certainly, Mr. Conklin. I've been going over it in my mind all night. Remember? Remember? <laughs> of course. I remember what was discussed at the meeting. The question is, do you? Oh, indeed I do, Mr. Conklin. Every word. We've got to have more horseplay and less discipline. <laughs> What's that? I mean, we've got to crack up. Crack down. <laughs> I won't have a repetition of last term's lack of discipline. There's only one way to run a school, and that's, that's in, in an, an orderly, orderly manner. manner. Exactly. Naturally, I need the cooperation of my staff. Hence, everybody's, everybody's got, got to, to toe, toe the line. line. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's no reason why things shouldn't go off like clockwork. One... To... Sound off! Oh. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Conklin. It's just that I spent a rather restless night. In fact, we both did. Uh, <laughs> I did. I'm still a bit upset. Well, there's nothing like concentrating on one's work to settle one's nerves. When is your first free period? Right after lunch. I figured I'd get a good rest then. I and... think not, Miss Brooks. I penciled you in for the stock room at that time. Oh, well, they have a lot of erasers in there. Maybe we could rub me out. <laughs> uh... No, I guess not. We are extremely short of supplies, Miss Brooks, so I want you to check every requisition very carefully before handing them out. 
And if for any reason you have to leave the stockroom, you know what to do? Raise my hand. <laughs> you lock the door. Is that clear? Yes, Mr. Conklin, I lock the door. Well, I'll be running along now. Uh, one moment, Miss Brooks. Haven't you forgotten something? Oh. Oh, yes. Rub, two, three, four. Rub, Mrs. two. Mrs. Brooks! Get your fingers out of my head! <laughs> oh, I thought lunch period would never get here, Mr. Boynton. Oh, me either. I'm starved. Yeah, I'll just put our tray down and sit opposite you. There. Now, it's funny how we happen to bump into each other at the entrance of the cafeteria. Quite a coincidence. Yes, it was. Of course, I had to run a little. <laughs> but I think it's nice to have someone take you to lunch, don't you? Yes, I do, Miss Brooks. It was grand of you to ask me. <laughs> Would you mind passing my soup over, please? Here you are, Mr. Boynton. Nothing like a good hot plate of soup to warm you up. I said that laboratory of mine's like an igloo. Even my hands are freezing. Let's feel them. Say, they are cold. Well, yours are nice and warm. How'd they get that way? I had them in your soup. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a shame we don't have a better heating system in this school, especially in the biology lab with all those little mice and rabbits and students. You're right, Miss Brooks. <laughs> I was talking to Mr. Jensen, the janitor, about it, and he's promised to speak to Mr. Conklin and get him to inspect the system himself. You see, I have a lot of electrical appliances in the lab now, but none of them give off much heat. I've got to have another outlet if I'm to attach any oh, other... excuse me, Mr. Boynton. Hi, Miss Brooks. Hello, Walter. Oh, we'd better be getting down to the stockroom. I don't want you to get nervous when the requisitions start pouring in. Or the books with the answers in them start pouring out, hmm? <laughs> well, all right, Walter. We might as well get going. Will you excuse me, Mr. Boynton? Oh, sure, Miss Brooks. And even though you asked me to lunch, I don't want you to worry about the check. Oh, well, that's very nice of you. I'll like pay it. my own, Miss Brooks. You just take care of yours. Well, the worst part of the supply rush is over, Miss Brooks. And now we can sort of take inventory of the surplus stuff that we can use. And that is, you can use for your class. Like what, Walter? Oh, paper, pencils, staplers. They bring 40 to 50 cents on the outside. And I really need one for my schoolwork. And, and then there are ink wells... Uh, paper clips? Yeah. This stockroom is only two doors from your room, Miss Brooks. Why don't I get an armful of stuff and stash it away under your desk right now? Walter, I am an English teacher, not a fence. <laughs> There's no such thing as surplus in the school system. Everything has to be requisitioned and... Wait a minute, what's this? That? Oh, that's an electric heater, Miss Brooks. An electric heater, hmm? Why, that's just what Mr. Boynton needs for his lab. I know what. I'll hook it up right now and surprise him. But what about a requisition? Walter, can I trust you? Oh, you know you can, Miss Brooks. Of course, and I do. So if you'll keep quiet about this heater, I'll get you a requisition for a brand new stapler. Gee, that's swell of you, Miss Brooks. Now I can take this one out of the lining of my jacket. <laughs> Well, Harriet, where's the heater I sent you for? It wasn't there, Daddy. I looked all over the stockroom, but there wasn't a trace of it. Did you ask Miss Brooks about it? Miss Brooks wasn't there. Nobody was there. And the door was open? No wonder my heater's missing. I distinctly told her... To... Now what? Come in! Excuse me, Mr. Conklin, but I've got to talk to you right away. Oh, hello, Mr. Jensen. Hello, Harriet. Oh, I better be going now, Daddy. I've got a class in a few minutes. All right, Harriet. Now, what is it, Jensen? I'm rather busy right now. Oh, this is important, sir. As custodian of the building, I feel it's my duty. You feel what is your duty? To tell you, sir. To tell me what? Please, Mr. Conklin, don't shout. That's one of the reasons. That's one of the reasons for what? For your high blood pressure. <laughs> now, when I was your age... Never mind that now. What do you want to see me about? <laughs> Biological laboratory. The furnace vent isn't large enough to heat that big room... It's so cold in there, Mr. Boynton's had to put earmuffs on the rabbits. <laughs> We've got to build another outlet. Outlets cost money, Jensen. We'll requisition another heater. Meanwhile, I've got to find the when one you that When you've got to put my... earmuffs on rabbits, brother, you're in trouble. <laughs> Besides, if an electric heater is hooked onto the present wiring setup, it can cause a short. Well, tell me about it another time. And I'm even worse party. than a short, Mr. Conklin, it might start a fire. I don't like to censure you, Mr. Jensen, but you are an alarmist. Yes, sir. 
Now I'm going down to that stock room and wait in back of it for Miss Brooks to return. I'll teach her to leave doors open. I'm glad we set up the heater in here before Mr. Boynton came back, Walter. Yeah, he'll sure be surprised, I bet. Uh, come on, Miss Brooks. Oh, there's the next class. I've got you in English this period. That's a coincidence, Walter. I've got you, too. <laughs> oh, Walter, here's the stock room and the door is still ajar. Didn't you lock it when we left? No, I thought you did. Give me that key. There. Mr. Conklin would have a fit if he found this door open. <laughs> All right, class, your next question is as follows. In The Mill on the Floss, George Eliot writes about a gentleman who is often compared with a gentleman in Silas Marner. Who is that gentleman? Are you talking about a fictional gentleman or George Eliot himself? Himself? <laughs> Walter, it happens that she wasn't exactly a gentleman. So what? He was a darn good writer. <laughs> next question. Goodness, that heating system is really noisy. Hello? Hello? Why, it's the voice. It's coming out of the vent here. What? Quiet a minute. Let me listen. Hello? Hello there! Can you hear me? Sure. What time's the break set for? <laughs> He was going to inspect the heating system. He's probably just stuck in a pipe somewhere. <laughs> in a pipe somewhere? Oh, I'll go call the fire department. Harriet, you stay here and chat with your father. <laughs> Why, Mr. Boynton, what made you ring the gong for a fire drill? Well, I heard you calling the fire department, and I thought... Oh, but that's not for a fire. Mr. Conklin's stuck in a pipe somewhere, and I just called the department to get him out. Well, most of the kids are out in the street by now. I better go keep them in line. A little extra preparedness won't hurt any. Stuck in a pipe? Oh, I'd better get back to my own room now. Uh-oh, here come the firemen. Well, here we are. Where's the fire? Uh, right this way, Chief. Yeah, come on, men. There isn't any fire, really. You see, it's just that somebody's caught in a pipe. Caught in a pipe? For this, I left a hand with a hundred aces and a double pinochle in it. Oh, please do something. My daddy's stuck somewhere. You've got to get him out. Well, where is he? Well, he was coming in over this bend here very clearly. <laughs> All right. Let's get at this thing with our picks, man. Oh, my. Walter. Walter. Walter, there's enough confusion around here as it is. Okay. Go tell Mr. Boynton to send all the children home immediately. Okay, Miss Brooks. Keep going, man. We've got to get him out of that pipe. I wonder where most of them are. Oh, what's that? That seems to be coming from the stock room. Hey, it is in here. Well, let's see now. Did Miss Brooks give me back the key? Oh, yeah. Here it is. Walter Denton. Can I lay this crime at your door? No, sir. Two doors down. <laughs> Well, we'll find out about this. What's going on here, Miss Brooks? Alfred! Who is it? When did he? What is Please, I'll explain uh... it all later. Right now, we've got to get Mr. Conklin out of this pipe. He's... Mr. Conklin! Oh, Daddy, thank goodness you're safe. Hello, Harriet. Stop that banging! What do you mean, stop? The principal's got himself stuck and we got to get the knucklehead out. <laughs> For your information, I'm the knucklehead who's stuck. I mean, I'm the principal of this school. <laughs> Mr. Conklin, how did you get out of the pipe? I was never in the pipe. But we heard you. You yelled, get me out of here. Yeah, what's the idea of yelling, get me out of here, if you're not stuck in here? <laughs> I was locked in the stock room. Obviously, this heat event connects with the vent in there, and as any idiot could figure out, well, how does any idiot get himself locked in the stock room? <laughs> <laughs> that will be all of that. I've had enough abuse from the fire department. Yes, we've had enough abuse from the fire department. Quiet, Miss Brooks. 
Now then, fireman, please remove your pickaxe from the school woodwork. Well, you needn't get so huffy. <laughs> a little hole. Here, I'll take it out. <laughs> Just what we needed, a larger classroom. <laughs> now then, Miss Brooks, I want some explanations, and I want them fast. Yes, sir. Who locked me in the storeroom? Where are all the students? Who called the fire department? Yeah, that's what I'd like to know. Don't you realize that these false alarms cost the city money? Now we've got to pack all oh, our stuff up. Where are all you firemen standing around for? Why don't you do something? Relax, Mr. Boynton. Mr. Conklin's out now. There's nothing left to do. Nothing left to do? But my lab is on fire. What? what? That's more like it. Come on, man! <laughs> well, Miss Brooks, that leaves just you and me. <laughs> you and me and one more question. What's that, Mr. Conklin? <laughs> did you happen to run across an electric heater in the stockroom? Yes, I did. And did you happen to connect it anywhere? Like Mr. Boynton's laboratory, for instance? Yes, I did. A oh, funny thing about that. I was told by Mr. Jensen just this morning that another electrical appliance on that circuit would cause a fire. Now, you've got to be punished, Miss Brooks. <laughs> you hear me? You've got to be punished! <laughs> Where are you going, Miss Brooks? To take a cold shower. This is the longest nightmare I've ever had. Hello there, this is Dell's Good Neighbors. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, it wasn't much of a fire, and as soon as they put it out, one of the firemen got a hook and ladder, climbed up, and brought Mr. Conklin's blood pressure down. <laughs> when he was slightly more rational, he called me into his office again. Miss Brooks... Since Mr. Boynton failed to remind me about the electric hazard in the biology laboratory, I have decided that he is almost as guilty as you are. Oh, but Mr. Conklin, he... Silent. <laughs> you, Miss Brooks, will stay after school and help Mr. Boynton clean up the debris those firemen left behind. I don't care if he keeps you both here all evening. Mr. Conklin, is that my punishment for starting the fire? Exactly. Got a match? <laughs> Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, written and directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Conklin was played by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Gloria McMillan, Arthur Q. Bryan, and Frank Nelson. Be with us again next week at this same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. This is Jimmy Matthews speaking. Soap, your beauty hope, and luster cream shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, is as fond of sports as most of us, but somehow basketball was never one of her favorites. It isn't that I don't like basketball. I just hate it. <laughs> this aversion started when I was refereeing a game in teacher's college And in the excitement, I swallowed the whistle <laughs> Of course, it was only a small whistle But it gets pretty embarrassing when every time you hiccup, traffic stops <laughs> Anyway, last Wednesday morning, Mrs. Davis, my landlady, woke me a full hour earlier than usual 
She told me that Walter Denton, the manager of the basketball team, was waiting to see me in the living room. If I could have had one free throw, I'd have thrown him out and gone back to sleep. But Mrs. Davis wouldn't let me. Come on now, Connie. The boy seems very concerned about something. You've got to see him. Oh, all right, Mrs. Davis. Where's my robe? I sent it out to the laundry, Connie. Here, I brought you one of mine to wear. This was part of my trousseau. I took it along on my honeymoon. Oh, we had a wonderful honeymoon. Just you in the bathrobe? <laughs> No, uh, my husband was along. Heavens, didn't people talk? <laughs> he does love this robe. It's beautiful material, isn't it? Lovely. What is it exactly, Mrs. Davis? Ostrich feathers over seersucker? <laughs> <laughs> no, dear, it's satin. And that big feather boy is worn around the neck. Here, slip it on. There. <laughs> now you throw this boa around your neck. So. How do you like it, Connie? Mm. Very tasty. <laughs> Come on out into the living room, Connie. Walter's anxious to talk to you. All right. But I don't know why he has to drop around in the middle of the night like this. Here we are, Walter. While you're chatting with Miss Brooks, I'll fix us all a bite of breakfast. Oh, thanks, Mrs. Davis. Greetings, Miss Brooks. <laughs> what brings you out so early, Paul Revere? <laughs> the British want their colonies back? <laughs> Normally, your witticisms would tickle my risibilities, Miss Brooks. But this morning, I've got to talk to you about something that's... Where did you go? <clears throat> this blo boa just blew across my... <laughs> is your problem this morning? Well, it's not really my problem, Miss Brooks. That is, it isn't my personal problem. But as the manager of the basketball team, I'm in big trouble. Is something wrong with the team, Walter? Oh, not the whole team, Miss Brooks. It's, well, it's just stretch. All right. <laughs> there, now what's the trouble? Uh, no, you don't understand, Miss Brooks. Stretch is our star player, one of the best forwards we've ever had. And he may not be eligible for the big game with Clay City High tonight. And that's why you've got to get in there and pitch. Well, I'd love to help out, Walter, but I'm afraid my midi blouse and bloomers must be moth-eaten by now. <laughs> now, here's what... Uh, better blow again, Miss Brooks. It's back. <laughs> Thanks, Walter. <laughs> Breakfast, Nook, you two. Everything's ready. Coming, Mrs. Davis. We can continue this later on, Walter. Come on, let's eat. Well, I had breakfast before I left the house. Oh, then would you rather wait in the living room? Oh, no, that was over a half hour ago. <laughs> Hi, Mrs. Davis. Uh, where do you want me to sit? Oh, uh, just sit right down here on my left, Walter. There. Now, would you like some eggs after you've eaten your oatmeal? Well, as I just told Miss Brooks, I already had some eggs and oatmeal at home. Oh, I see. So I'll just have some French toast. <laughs> you must come over for dinner some night after you've had dinner. <laughs> I'll make you some in a jiffy. Just drink your juice meantime. Say, this orange juice tastes rather peculiar. Now, that's because you're drinking it through that boa. <laughs> Better blow again. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> now, to get back to my dilemma, Miss Brooks... Couldn't we delay him after breakfast, Walter? <laughs> I'm sorry to bother you like this, but I'm afraid it's imperative. You see, Mr. Conklin's made a rule that anybody who fails a subject is ineligible for any sports until he's passed the first test of the new semester in the subject which he failed. And Stretch failed last term. So? So with a, with a teacher Stretch has in English who's giving him the test this term, he doesn't stand a chance of passing. Who has he in English? Oh, Lady Enright. I mean, Miss Enright. <laughs> Well, I'm sure Miss Enright's a very capable teacher. Well, here we are, some nice French toast. I made it from a famous Turkish recipe. A Turkish recipe? Yes. The Turks are famous for their French toast, you know. They are? Of course they are, Walter. You should taste their Chinese kumquats. <laughs> Can I help you, Walter? I don't want to stuff myself, Mrs. Davis. Uh, those three pieces on the end will be plenty. And uh, now about Miss Enright. You know, I don't think it's fair for her to give Stretch a test. I heard she was jilted by a basketball player years ago. Walter, you shouldn't talk that way about Miss Enright. Just because someone doesn't reciprocate the affection of someone who's fond of them doesn't make the person who's fond of someone a monster. And I got that sentence from an old Turkish recipe. <laughs> Say, Miss Brooks, speaking of someone not reciprocating someone's affection, have you heard from Mr. Boynton lately? Ouch, get those punches up, Walter. Let's forget about Mr. Boynton for now. 
Just what is it you want me to do? Hmm? Well, I was talking this over with Harriet Conklin, and we decided to get Stretch transferred out of Miss Enright's class. Of course, this means somebody's got to work on Harriet's old man. Look, Walter, Harriet's father happens to be our principal. You will kindly refer to him as Mr. Conklin. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Brooks. Well, Harriet and I and Stretch are supposed to meet at school this morning, and that's why I'm here so early, to discuss getting Stretch out of Miss Enright's class and into yours. Into mine? But you know how crowded my class is now. Every time I enter my room, it looks like payoff night at a pyramid club. <laughs> Miss Brooks, we gotta hurry down to school and meet Harriet. Now, oh, there must be a way to get Stretch into your class so you can give him the test, while I, as manager of the team, sit across the aisle from him and give him moral support. Are you sure that's all you'd give him? Oh, I just want Stretch to feel at home. He's not very good in English, and, well, with me there, maybe he'd get more confidence. Confidence based on the mere proximity to one which in the same subject has always flourished so startlingly. If anybody sits near Stretch, it better be Harriet. She at least speaks English. <laughs> but she's so honest in tests. I mean, she has the most peculiar way of holding her left hand when she's writing down answers. Now, all you can see is her elbow. Oh, not that I ever tried to copy from her. Oh, no, of course not. It was just a coincidence that after the final exams last term, your neck was so far out of joint, you looked like a Balinese dancer. <laughs> Walter, as much as I'd like to help you kids, I can't. And the less I see of Mr. Conklin for a while, the better. But why, Miss Brooks? Because Mr. Conklin holds me responsible for what happened last week, remember? The fire in Mr. Boynton's laboratory, which started when the circuit was overloaded after I plugged in an electric heater that belonged to Mr. Conklin. Well, what is that? And then the firemen to... had to tear down the wall when they thought Mr. Conklin was stuck in the heater vent, which he wasn't because he was locked in the stock room when I slammed the door on him. I asked him. <laughs> and whose fault was that? Yours. That's what I like, a nice orderly mind. Come on. And so you see, Miss Brooks, without Stretch on the team, we'll probably lose the biggest game of the year. But what can I do about it? Oh, I told you, Miss Brooks, you can work on Harriet's old man. Walter, I told you not to use that expression. Okay, Mr. Conklin. But gosh, other kids have been transferred to other classes. Yes, but not for such a thin reason. Just to win a basketball game is oh, no but reason. but this is a Clay City game, and it wouldn't be so bad if the coach hadn't taken sick yesterday. The coach is sick, too? Desperately. This is the saddest thing since humoresque. Fortunately, we have an ex-basketball star teaching here who's been made temporary coach. But it would just break his heart if he lost his first game. Who is this coach, Harriet? Mr. Boynton. Mr. Boynton? Are you sure? Positive. Well, don't stand there, girl. We've got to go to work on your old man. <laughs> Starring Eve Arden will continue in just a moment, but first, here is Vern Smith. Want to win $49,000 in cash? That's right, $49,000 in cash. The first prize offered by the makers of Palmolive Soap in their big, exciting 49 Gold Rush contest. Second prize, $4,900. And there are 4,949 other cash prizes. What a chance to win. $100,000 in cash prizes, and it's easy to enter. Simply finish this sentence, I like Palmolive soap because, in 25 words or less. That's all. Just 25 words or less to finish the sentence, I like Palmolive soap because. Then mail your entry right away with a Palmolive soap wrapper. Easy, isn't it? And remember, thousands will strike it rich in this big 49 gold rush contest. Enter as often as you like. Get entry blanks and complete rules from your dealer or send your entries on plain paper with your name and address and dealer's name and address plus one palm olive wrapper for each entry. Mail to Gold Rush Contest, Box 49, New York 8, New York. You better write that down. Gold Rush Contest, Box 49, New York 8, New York. Get palm olive soap right away to help win a lovelier complexion and try for your share of the $100,000 in cash prizes. Well, I realized that some ancient gossip about Miss Enright's prejudice against basketball players would never cause Mr. Conklin to give Stretch a transfer. But after a brief council of war during study period, I hit upon what seemed like a pretty good plan. 
I would tell Mr. Conklin that the boy was unhappy in his class because his fellow students were picking on him, as I told Walter and Harriet. In a democratically operated high school, no boy should be forced to remain in surroundings that are not conducive to his getting the most out of the school curriculum. Bravo, Miss Brooks, bravo. Yeah, bravo. What did you say? (laughs) Now, when Stretch gets here, we'll have to find out just what annoys him the most in his English class. Oh, that's him now. Come in, Stretch. Hi, Stretch. You know Miss Brooks. Hi. Hi. (laughs) We haven't too much time, so I'll come right to the point. What bothers you in Miss Enright's class? Bothers me? Yeah, they treat you terrible, don't they? The other kids, I mean. The other kids? (laughs) (laughs) They pick on you and call you names, don't they? Names? (laughs) <laughs> this is the most backward forward I ever met <laughs> Look, the kids do call you one name we all know about Stretch Now, why do you suppose they tack that on you? Well, I don't know Maybe it's because I weigh 112 pounds and I'm six foot five. <laughs> Serves me right for getting over the flu last year <laughs> Look, we're trying to help you become eligible for the Clay City game You want to play in it, don't you? I sure do, Miss Brooks. There isn't anything I wouldn't do to... Well, then keep quiet and listen. Sorry, Walter. Go ahead, Miss Brooks. Well, first of all, I hate nicknames. What's your real name? Fabian Snodgrass. (laughs) Fabian Snodgrass? That's right. Look, Stretch. (laughs) We really want to help you. The kids here feel that if I give you the exam, you'll stand a better chance of passing. Not that there's going to be any funny business, you understand. Oh, I understand perfectly, Miss Brooks. Walter wouldn't want any part of anything that wasn't strictly on the up and up. You said it, Stretch. You just listen to old Walter and you'll be all right. I always do, don't I, Walter? You're our manager and you always know what's best for all of us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. (laughs) And if you don't listen, Walter won't tell you about the rabbits anymore. (laughs) But let's get back to your... Scholastic achievements, or lack of them. What subjects did you pass last term? All of them, but English. Just barely, but I passed them. And I can't understand why I didn't pass English. I always done my homework very good. (laughs) Very well. Very well. Stretch, uh, isn't it true that you couldn't always do your work properly because of the other pupils harassing you? I ain't never worked near as hard at any subject as I done in English, hardly. (laughs) But, uh, it wasn't all your own fault that you failed. There were other students in the class, all kinds of students, doing all kinds of things. Yeah, they were a swell bunch of kids, all right. But, you know something, Miss Brooks? It it wasn't the grammar that done it. No? Then what did done it? Done did it. Who did it? everything. Uh, it, it was the composition that made Miss Enright flunk me. We was allowed to pick our own theme. We were allowed to pick our own theme. Used to, huh? <laughs> like I said, we could write about anything we wanted, so I got my idea off on the radio. It's not very bright of me to ask, but uh, what kind of a radio idea did you write about? I wrote in 25 words or less, I hate English because. (laughs) Come in. Good morning, Mr. Conklin. Uh, Can I speak to you for a moment? If you know how to speak at all, you can. But if it's permission you want, you may. Sorry, Mr. Conklin. I haven't taken English since I was a girl. But I'd, uh, I'd like to request a transfer for one of the students here. He's in Miss Enright's class at the present time. But, Miss Brooks, the new term has already started. You know we can't issue any transfers at this late date. Oh, but this case is extraordinary, Mr. Conklin. A boy's life is being made miserable by his classmates. What boy? Fabian Snodgrass. They call him all sorts of names. Anything worse than Fabian Snodgrass? <laughs> thing, they call him Stretch. Stretch? What's so terrible about that? I'm sorry, Miss Brooks, I can't do anything for you. But Mr. Conklin, he failed English last term because of the conditions in Miss Enright's class. And if she fails him in his test this term, he won't be eligible for athletics. Athletics? 
There's too much emphasis on athletics in the school system now. No, Miss Brooks, the boy stays where he is. Uh, come in. Well, hello, O.C. I, uh... Oh, I'm sorry. Didn't know you were busy. Oh, uh, come in, J.B., come in. Miss Brooks, this is Jason Brill, principal of Clay City High. How do you do, Mr. Brill? How do you do, Miss Brooks? What brings you all the way to Madison, J.B.? Well, everything's running so smoothly at Clay City, I thought I'd drop over and find out how things were with you. I heard you had a fire over here last week. A fire? Oh, it was nothing at all, really. Oh, indeed. Some teacher just blew a fuse, that's all. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you got yourself locked in the storeroom, too, didn't you? Uh, <clears throat> you better go into my inner office. If you'll excuse us, Miss Brooks. But I still want to talk to you, Mr. Conklin. I'll talk to you later. Just wait here in my outer office. All right, Mr. Conklin. I'll wait right here. Are uh, you sure I'm not disturbing you, Osgood? That teacher out there, a pretty bit of baggage, isn't she? <laughs> yes, she is. I'd like to check her sometime. <laughs> Well, Osgood, uh, we haven't seen each other since the big Clay City Madison High football game. We gave you a good drubbing in that one, 79 to nothing, wasn't it? It was not. It was 78 to nothing. <laughs> but we had a good excuse for losing that one. Yes, I know. Your team showed up. <laughs> that was nothing to what our basketball team is going to do to you tonight. Why, we should win by 40 points. What? Why, we'll wipe up the gym with you. Uh, Will you care show... to make a little wager on that, Osgood? I'm not a betting man, and you know it. Oh, come on, Osgood. Just to make things interesting, how about a nice new hat to the winner? Well, I do need a new hat. Uh, you're on, J.B. Fine. Well, I'll be running along now. See you at the game tonight. May the best team from Clay City win. Oh, you haven't a chance. Oh, well, you're still here, Miss Brooks. Yes, Mr. Conklin. Well, uh, goodbye, Miss Brooks. Goodbye, Mr. Brill. Oh, and Oscar. Yes? If you want to, you can check her with me sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Old reprobate. Now then, Miss Brooks, come to the point. Just what do you want me to do about this, uh, this... Uh, Stretch. Uh, Stretch snodgrass. Just because a kid happens to be a star basketball player is no reason for other kids to make fun of him. I'm sorry, Miss Brooks. I can't change the rules in the middle of a semester just on account of some star basketball player. After all, there are other students in this school who... 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 Who did you say star basketball player? Yes, sir. And if he passes a test today, he's eligible for the game tonight? That's right, Mr. Conklin. And your own daughter Harriet and Walter and everybody seems to think that he'll have a better chance if I give him the examination. Miss Brooks, in a democratically operated high school, no boy should be forced to remain in surroundings that are not conducive to his getting the most out of the school curriculum. <laughs> I'll have him transferred at once. Uh, there's just one thing I insist on. Yes, Mr. Conklin? The test must be absolutely impartial. At Madison, we have just one standard procedure, one examination. With liberty and justice for all. Come on, Walter. There's Mr. Boynton. Okay, Harriet. Oh, pardon us, Mr. Boynton, but the cafeteria's pretty packed today. Oh, yes, I know. Why don't you sit at this table with me? Now, that's what I call taking the bait. I mean, thanks, Mr. Boynton. Uh, we wanted to talk to you before Miss Brooks came up. You see, Stretch is taking his English test in Miss Brooks' free period, right after lunch. Oh, but I thought Stretch was in Miss Enright's class. He was, but Daddy transferred him because he doesn't want the boy to be unhappy. Now it's up to us, especially you as basketball coach, to see that Miss Brooks is in a very good mood when she gives him the test. Maybe she'll even let us be there. But uh, what can I do? Oh, just be nice. You know, even if she doesn't order salad, spread a little oil around. I'm always courteous to Miss Brooks. Well, then be more than courteous. Be, uh, be civil. Well, what my attitude toward Miss Brooks has to do with... She's coming over now. Be terribly nice. Remember, this is the biggest game you'll ever coach. Hello, Mr. Boynton. Well, how do you do, Miss Brooks? How are you, Harriet, Walter? Oh, we're fine, Miss Brooks. Oh, uh, won't you join us? Oh, sit right here by Mr. Boynton. I'll move the chairs closer together. There. Thank you. Now then, what looks good today? You do, Miss Brooks. You look simply lovely. Well, that's 
High praise coming from you, Walter. It should have come from you, Mr. Boynton. Hmm? <laughs> uh, Miss Brooks, if you'll just tell me what you want, I'll go get your tray filled up. I really haven't given it much thought. So neither have I. That's one nice thing about having a perfect figure. You can eat anything. Oh, I don't think my figure's so perfect. <laughs> Not you, Mr. Boynton, Miss Brock. Here, let me wipe off the table in front of you. No, pass me those glasses of water, will you, Walter? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Here's one for you, Miss Brooks. Oh, here, Miss Brooks. Take my knives and forks, too. I'm not hungry just yet. I am. I'm starved. I'd eat some roast beef today if it wasn't so expensive. Expensive? What's that got to do with anything? Mr. Boynton's treating you. <laughs> There goes the water. Uh, it must have gone down the, the wrong pipe. Yeah, the pipe that likes to go Dutch. <laughs> Look, uh, I appreciate this attention, but there's something I think you all ought to know. What's that? I'm giving Stretch his eligibility test in private. In private? That's right, and if you'll meet me after school, I'll refund all courtesies extended to me during this lunch period. <laughs> Now, Stretch, you say you've completed the written portion of the examination? Yes, ma'am. To the best of my ability. I was afraid of that. <laughs> well, put the papers to one side and we'll get into the oral test. Oh, excuse me, Miss Brooks. What do you want, Walter? I forgot my rubbers. Oh, don't pay any attention to me, though. Just keep going. Hi, Stretch. Never mind that. Sorry. You're on your own, kid. I'll just look around over here. Well, keep away from Stretch. First question. I just want to come in for a minute, Miss Brooks. For what, Harriet? I lost my fountain pen. I'm sure it's in one of these desks. Oh, you go right ahead, Miss Brooks. Hi, Stretch. Hi, Harriet. Why don't you look over here by me? Cut that out. Where do you think you are? <laughs> well, she's pretty. It's a good thing that wasn't one of the test questions. Look, Stretch, you're fond of radio shows. Now, just make believe you're on a quiz program. I beg your pardon, Miss Brooks, but I think I left a book in here. This test should have been given in the Rose Bowl. Uh, sit right down, Mr. Boynton. Stretch is about to get the oral test. Oh, well, I'll be very quiet, Miss Brooks. So will Stretch, I'm afraid. <laughs> but here goes. Question one. Name three plays by William Shakespeare. William who? <laughs> Shakespeare. He was a tall, thin fellow with a little goatee. Oh, him. Three plays, huh? Mm-hmm. Um... Uh, maybe I shouldn't look for my rubbers now. Uh, maybe it's just much ado about nothing. Walter! <laughs> much ado about nothing? He said it, Miss Brooks. That's one answer right. Go ahead, Stretch. Think of another one. Another one? Um... Don't make any mistakes now. This could easily become a comedy of errors. <laughs> a comedy of errors? Good for you, Stretch. Now, now, just one more. <laughs> Boynton, I'm surprised at you giving a pupil hints in a private test. But, Miss Brooks, I didn't say anything. I'm just rooting for the boy. Oh, well, I guess this is something of a tempest in a teapot. <laughs> I, I think I got the third one, Miss Brooks. What is it? Teapot. <laughs> that is absolutely wrong. Would you like to try for tempest? Yeah, tempest. Next question. <laughs> What plays did Shakespeare write between the two entitled Pericles, Prince of Tyre, and Coriolanus? Where did everybody go? <laughs> would, would you repeat the question, please? Certainly. What plays did Shakespeare write between the two entitled Pericles, Prince of Tyre, and Coriolanus? Um, uh... Well, don't stand there. Think, boy, think! <laughs> Well, Mr. Conklin, I have the result of both tests, written and oral. Good, good. Just put everything on my desk here. I'm not even going to check these papers, Miss Brooks. I'm that sure of your integrity. Thank you, Mr. Conklin, but as you know, we weren't alone I never the mind test. that, Miss Brooks. The examination was based on the 100% system? That's right, but every once in a while, somebody... Please, would... please, Miss Brooks. It's all done with. Uh, passing is 65%, is that correct? Yes, sir. Fine. Now, what was the boy's mark? 39. <laughs> 
Uh, Miss Brooks, I would like you to jot down my latest ruling on eligibility for athletic activities. (laughs) Proceed, Mr. Conklin. No student who has previously failed a subject will be eligible for any athletic team if he fails the first two tests in any term. Mr. Conklin, may I say that I have never seen such touching concern for the hopes and ambitions of Madison students. Well, thank you, Miss Brooks. I remember when I was a boy struggling Oh, and one hard... more thing, Mr. Uh, Conklin. Uh, yes? When you get your new hat, wear it in good health. <laughs> As our Miss Brooks returns in just a moment, but first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight, show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a luster cream shampoo. Only luster cream brings you K. Dumit's magic formula blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Gives loveliness lather even in hardest water. Glamorizes your hair as you wash it. Luster Cream, not a soap, not a liquid, but a dainty cream shampoo. Leaves hair fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen, soft, manageable. Gives new beauty to all hairdos or permanents. Four-ounce jar, one dollar. Smaller sizes, either tubes or jars. Tonight, try Luster Cream Shampoo and be a... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful Luster Cream girl. You owe your crowning glory to a luster cream shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, we gave the Clay City team a pretty thorough drubbing. And right after the game, I congratulated Mr. Boynton. Honestly, Mr. Boynton, I thought you did a superb job of coaching. Thanks, Miss Brooks, but the kids deserve most of the credit. They played a great game. Yes, they did. You know something, Mr. Boynton? I haven't been so excited at a basketball game since I swallowed a whistle in teacher's college. Miss Brooks, that's pretty serious. What did you do about it? Nothing, but I intend to see a doctor about it (laughs) one of these days. Brought to you by Palmolive Soap, your beauty hope, and luster cream shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, written and directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Men, do you shave with a lather or brushless shave cream? Palmolive shaving cream comes both ways, and whichever way you prefer to shave, you'll find that using either Palmolive brushless or Palmolive lather shaving cream can bring you more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Here's the proof. 2,548 men tried the new Palmolive way to shave described on the tube, and no matter how they had shaved before, three out of every four got more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Get palm olive brushless or palm olive lather shaving cream today. For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North. Tune in Tuesday evenings over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at this same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. You're listening to Hojo Radio. Stay tuned. The Jack Benny Program, presented by Lucky Strike. Smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Your level best. That's how you'll feel when you light up a Lucky. Because Lucky's fine tobacco picks you up when you're low, calms you down when you're tense. Puts you on the right level to feel and do your level best. It's important to you as a smoker to know that fine tobacco can do this for you. And every smoker knows. L-S-M-F-T, L-S-M-F-T. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco, mild, ripe, light tobacco. Remember, more independent tobacco experts, auctioneers, buyers, and warehousemen smoke Lucky Strike regularly than the next two leading brands combined. So next time you buy cigarettes, remember that Lucky's fine tobacco picks you up when you're low, calms you down when you're tense. 
by putting you on the right level, the lucky level, to feel and do your level best. That's the lucky level. Smoker lucky to feel your level best. Smoker lucky to feel your level best. Get on the lucky level where it's fun to be alive. Get a carton of luckies and get started today. And listen, here's a Christmas gift suggestion that's bound to make a big hit. Say Merry Christmas 200 times by giving the gay holiday-wrapped carton of 200 luckies. And for that extra special someone on your list, give Lucky Strike 500, the handsome Christmas gift box of 25 packages of Lucky Strike cigarettes. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, the sportsman, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Gentlemen, there are only five more days till Christmas. So let's go down to the local department store where Jack and Mary have gone to do their last minute Christmas shopping. Mary, Mary, read my Christmas list, will you please? Uh, gold cufflinks, platinum cigarette lighter, silk pajamas, a star sapphire ring, a Cadillac, a diamond stick. No, pen. no, Mary. Those are the things I'm asking Santa Claus to give me. <laughs> my shopping list is on the other side. Oh. Uh, oh, here it is. A package of lifesavers, <laughs> razor blades, toothbrush, shoelaces. Jack Benny, you ought to be a Mary, chef. I gave you the wrong one. Here's my Christmas list. See? Don Wilson, wallet. Well, let's go. The leather goods counter's over there. Okay. Gee, this yes, store sir. is crowded. Hmm? Can, uh, can I help you, please? Oh, yes. I'd like to see some of your wallets. Well, we have a large variety. All these wallets you see here are $1.98. A dollar ninety-eight? Yes, sir. Uh, Jack, here's some better wallets over here. Oh, yes. I think Don would like this one. It's a uh, genuine cowhide. Cowhide? Uh, how much is that? Forty dollars. <laughs> cowhide. Forty dollars? Jack, stop squeezing it. It won't give milk. <laughs> But, Mary... Look, Jack, Don has been with you 15 years. It's about time you got him something nice. But, Mary, $40. Oh, Jack, for heaven's sake, for once in your life, show Don you appreciate his loyalty. You know, Mary, you're right. I'm going to get Don this wallet. He deserves it. Mister, I'll take that $40 wallet. Yes, sir. Does that, uh, does that include the engraving? Oh, yes. Uh, what would you like to put on it? The price. <laughs> Now, wait a minute. I want to enclose one of these cards. Let's see, what'll I write? To Don. A very Merry Christmas from Jack Benny. Here it is, mister. Make a nice gift package and see that Mr. Wilson gets it before Christmas. Yes, sir. Come on, Mary. I want to go to the sporting goods department and get something for Phil. Now, here we are. Gee, they sure have a nice assortment of guns and hunting equipment, Jack. Yeah, I think I should be able to get something for Phil here. They seem to have almost... May I help you, sir? (laughs) Yes, uh, yes, clerk. I'd like to get something for a friend who is quite a sportsman. Well, we've got all kinds of camping equipment. Uh, Does he sleep outdoors much? Yes, sometimes right in front of the house. (laughs) Jack. Uh, clerk, he has all the camping equipment he needs. His favorite sport, though, is hunting. See, he makes two or three trips a year to the High Sierras. Oh, does he hunt bear? Well, a few days ago, he... Uh-oh. Hey, mister. Mister, ask me that again, will you? Does he hunt bear? No, Patrillo makes him wear his union suit. <laughs> What's, uh, what's the matter, clerk? Didn't you get it? Yes, and if you'll lend me your handkerchief, I'll wipe it off. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I-, I didn't come here for any of your silly wisecracks. He thinks he's smart, doesn't he, Mary? Uh, don't talk to me. I'm pretending I'm not with you. <laughs> 
<laughs> what? And now, sir, supposing you look over some of these items while I take care of another customer. Okay, okay. Do you mind if I fool around with this gun? Not at all. It's loaded. <laughs> Say, Mary, Mary, I wonder if Phil... Hello, Mr. Benny. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, Mr. Kitzel. Are, are you doing your Christmas shopping? Yes, I'm buying a Christmas present for my wife. She's always complaining she hasn't got what to wear. Mm-hmm. So I think I'll get her something sporty in the line of clothes, you know? Oh. Well, that sounds nice. Why don't you get your wife a pair of slacks? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> you never saw my wife. <laughs> She's not the type to wear slacks. Why? Well, she should be slack. She's lumpy. <laughs> oh, your your wife is a little chubby, eh? A little chubby. From the back, she looks like Don Wilson from the front. <laughs> And sideways, you wouldn't believe it. I'll take your word for it. Tell me, Mr. Benny, what are you getting your neighbor for Christmas? My neighbor? Yes, uh, Ronald Goldman. (laughs) Oh, no, that's Ronald Coleman. I don't know what to get him, but I'll think of something. Yes, I suppose. Well, I better finish my shopping. Lumpy is expecting me home for dinner. (laughs) Goodbye, Mr. Gitzel, and Merry Christmas. The feeling is reciprocal. (laughs) Come on, Jack. Uh, Make up your mind. We still have other shopping to do, you know. All right. You know, I think I'll take this fishing outfit. Oh, clerk. Uh, Just a minute. I have other customers. Oh, all right. I'll wait. Uh, That'll be 876, madam. Hmm. Uh, have you decided on that, sir? Good. That'll be twelve seventy-five. Gee. Uh, yes, ma'am. Sixteen fifty out of twenty. Gosh. Ouch. Finally got your nose caught in it, didn't you? <laughs> Never mind. Just give me that fishing rod. Now wrap it up, and I'll call for it later. Come on, Mary. Gee, my nose hurts. Well, it's your own fault. Now, let's finish our shopping. Hey, hey, wait a minute, Mary. What's the matter? I've been thinking about that card I put in Don's gift. You know, I think I should have written something clever. I'm going back to the wallet department. Oh, for heaven's sake, Dad. Oh, clerk, clerk. Yes, sir? Remember me? I, I bought a $40 wallet here a few minutes ago, and I'd like to change the card. But, mister, I've already got it wrapped with ribbon and tinsel and everything. Well, I'm sorry, but you'll have to open it up. I want to change the card. But, mister... Now, please, I'm a customer here. Open it up. Okay. I know what I'll do. I'll write a poem. Oh, fine. Henry Wadsworth, tight fellow. (laughs) Let's see. uh... Oh, oh, I've got one. To Don. This gift is from Jackie and golly, oh, shucks. I hope that you like it. It costs 40 bucks. <laughs> there you are. There you are, mister. Wrap this up with a gift. I'm wrapping it. I'm wrapping it. <laughs> Come on, Mary. You know, Mary, I'm glad I'm giving down that $40 wallet. Yeah, it'd be kind of tough to get a rhyme for $1.98. Yeah. Now, Mary, let's go up to the mezzanine and... Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. Hello, Livy, you little fugitive from the doll counter. <laughs> <laughs> hello, Phil. My, you're certainly loaded down with packages. Yeah, I've been shopping all day. Got presents for everybody. How about you two? Well, I'm nearly finished with my shopping. Your five bucks is almost gone, huh? <laughs> Bill, for your information, I just spent $40 on Don Wilson. What'd you do, take him to lunch? (laughs) No, I... Uh, Look out, Phil, one of your packages is slipping. Yeah, there it goes. (laughs) Oh, darn it, now I'll have to get Remley another present. (laughs) Let's move away, I'm getting dizzy. Uh, Phil... Did you get gifts for the rest of your band? Yeah, I bought every guy marks for a pair of bedroom slippers. Bedroom slippers? For your musicians? Uh Uh-huh, I thought if I could get them started with those, maybe we could get shoes on them later. (laughs) Oh, that would be wonderful. (laughs) Anyway, I got all my boys taken care of. The only one I ain't got a gift for yet is Alice. Uh, maybe she'd like Taboo. Could be. She thought he was great in Elephant Boy. (laughs) 
Well, that's Sabu. He's a picture star. I wouldn't know. I'm a radio man myself. <laughs> well, I'll be running along. I've got to get Remley another bottle of toilet water. <laughs> toilet water? Phil, that bottle that broke was toilet water? Certainly. If it was the other, do you think I'd have stood here and let it soak into the rug? <laughs> See you later, Jackson. Bye, Mary. Goodbye, Phil. Come on, Mary. You know, I'm going to be on Phil's show, but he doesn't know it, you know. Hey, let's go up to the mezzanine. They always have nice things up there. Okay, here's the elevator. Yeah. The mezzanine, please. See, that's funny, Mary. Four guys running one elevator. Second floor. Christmas toys for girls and boys, sweater shirts and ties. Corset stays, meant to pays, toothpicks any size. You will like Lucky Strike, buy them here because they're round and firm and fully packed, just like Santa Claus. Fellas, you passed my floor. Look, at I wanted to get off at the mezzanine. Third floor. Here you'll find Venetian blinds, pool and billiard cues, movie reels, rubber heels, boots and button shoes, coaster bikes, Lucky Strikes, try one and you'll see. Your best bet in cigarettes is LSMFT. Fellas, look, take me down, will you? I wanted the mezzanine. Fourth what? floor. Oh, for heaven. Pots and pans, garbage cans, silverware and knives, buggy whips and pillow slips, china wear and chives, cartons of smokes you love, make a perfect gift. Luckies are the best by far, so give your friends a lift. Look at fellas, please. I wanted the mezzanine. Take me to the mezzanine. Fifth floor. Tootsie rolls, donut holes, button hooks and bows, violins that fit your chin, shovels, rakes and walls, railroad pipes, lucky strikes, get them on this floor. Once you smoke the lucky strike, we're sure that you want more. Look, boys, I want to finish shopping. Now take me down to the mezzanine. Going down. Mezzanine, gasoline, alligator bags, coats and boats and billy goats and girdles if it's sags. Let us off, let us off, we've got things to do. Merry Christmas to you all, and a happy new year to Thanks. Uh, look, Jack, we're back on the main floor. Well, how do you like that? I asked him to say it's just as well. You know, I've been thinking about that card for Don's wallet. Jack! I don't think it's an appropriate card for a $40 gift. I'm going back and change it. Well, I haven't got nerve enough to face that clerk. I'm going to buy something for my sister, Babe. Babe? What are you going to get her? Well, she asked me to send her a telescope. What does Babe want with a telescope? Uh, she lives across the street for the YMCA. <laughs> Well, I'll meet you here later. I'm going to change that card. Oh, clerk. Clerk. Yes, sir? What can I... <laughs> oh, it's you again. Yes, yes. I, I want to change the card in that gift. Oh, no. No, no. First you buy the gift. Then you write the card. Then I wrap the gift. Then you change the card. But look, Mr. Then I unwrap the gift. Mr. And then you rewrite the card. And then I wrap the gift. And now you want to write another card. Look, uh, never mind that. Just unwrap the gift, will you? I've already sent it down to the delivery department. <laughs> well, look, uh, you'll, you'll just have to go down there and get it. All right, I'll go. I'll go. I haven't run into anyone like you in 20 years. Oh, why did the governor have to give me that part? <laughs> Look, look, just bring me my package, will you? All right, all right, I'll get it, I'll get it. I'll get it. Hmm, what an eccentric character, you know? Something like it. Stevie, uh, Stevie, maybe we can buy something for Mr. Benny here. Okay, Joey, let's look around. Something I can do for you boys? Yes, we'd like to buy something for the treasurer of our club, the Beverly Hills Beavers. A present for the treasurer of your club, eh? How old is he? About the same age as you. Thirty-nine. <laughs> well, boys, it's none of my business, but how come you picked a 39-year-old man to be the treasurer of your beaver club? Because he's such a good businessman. He puts all of our dues in the treasury, and then he lends it out at ten percent. <laughs> 
Oh, I see. Who does he lend it to? Us. <laughs> and now that it's Christmas, we were thinking of getting him a necktie. Well, that's always a nice present. Why don't you buy him one that matches his favorite suit? No, we like this one. It matches his eyes. Oh, are his eyes blue? Bluer than the waters of Lake Louise under a sultry summer sky. <laughs> My, where did you boys learn that? Every beaver has to memorize it before I can borrow money. <laughs> well, I'm sure he'll like this tie. It's a dollar fifty cents. I'll wrap it up for you. Thank you. Here you are, mister. Now, let's not have any more trouble. Make the card out right this time, will you? Yes, Jack, we've wasted enough time. All right. Uh, how do you think this sounds, Mary? To Don. Your pear-shaped tones, many announcers ate. But no one can match your pear-shaped shape. <laughs> Isn't that a cute, huh? Yes, Jack, it's a beautiful poem. Nick Kenny would be proud of it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hello, Mr. Benny. Hello, Mary. Hello, Dennis. Uh, Dennis, I didn't expect to run into you here. Oh, I brought my mother's lunch. She's the Santa Claus. <laughs> Your mother is the Santa Claus with a white beard and everything? Yeah, and she sure fooled my father. He climbed up on her lap and told her he wanted Hedy Lamar for Christmas. <laughs> Oh, for heaven's sake, what did she do? I don't know, but now my father goes around singing All I Want for Christmas is my two front teeth. <laughs> oh, say, say, Dennis. Dennis, listen. Come here, come here a minute, will you? Huh? Dennis, you, you've been a nice kid. You've been with me so long. Here it is Christmas, and... Well, here's a $50 bonus. Oh, uh, that's just a trick to get me to buy something for you. It is not. I don't care if you don't get me anything. Oh, yeah? Last year when I forgot to buy you a present, you picked me up and threw me in your Bendix. What? And then you charged me 40 cents for washing my shirt. Look, kid, if you don't want... Oh, my goodness. What's the matter, Jack? Just a minute. Oh, clerk. Now what? Now what? <laughs> That that card I wrote to Mr. Wilson, I left it right here on the counter, and I, I can't find it. Oh, don't worry about it. I found it, and I put it in the package, wrapped it up, and sent it down to the delivery room. Well, I, uh, I forgot to sign the card. Let's go. You're creating a scene. It's okay, lady. I'll get his package. The customer is always right. And this jerk is a customer. <laughs> you see, Mary, you, you've got to know how to handle these people, you see? Now, come on. Let's shop around till he gets the package from the delivery room. Will you? Say, Mary, what do you think I ought to get for my sister Florence? Well, I don't know. Uh, laundry might be nice. Say, yeah, that sounds pretty good. Uh, there's the lingerie counter right over there. Oh, yeah. Uh, pardon me, but would you mind waiting on us? Uh, why not? <laughs> Your money's as good as anybody's. <laughs> well, could you show me something in silk lingerie? Certainly. What's your size? <laughs> Look, they're not for me. Uh, they're for his sister, size 34. Okay. Here's a whole box of them. Uh, will you lay the lingerie out for us, please? Well, just a minute till I put my gloves on. Gloves? Touching that stuff with my bare hands makes me a nervous wreck. <laughs> What? Especially the black ones. <laughs> Look. Look, mister, we haven't got all day. Show us something in size 34. Okay. Here's a nice little garment. A genuine, pure silk nighty. Gee, that's awfully pretty. I think this would be very, uh, 
Uh, wait a minute, mister. What are these little loops on the bottom of the nightgown? The loops? <laughs> yeah, the loops. <laughs> yes, uh, what are the loops for? When you go to bed, you hook them over your toes so the nightgown won't creep up on you. <laughs> Well, really, wrap it up and send it to my sister, Mrs. Florence Fenchel. Here's the address. Yes, sir. Oh, look, Jack, there's Rochester doing his Christmas shopping, too. Yeah, shh. I want to hear what he's getting. Can I do anything for you? Yes, I'm looking for a Christmas present for my boss. Perhaps if you told me something about your employer, I'd be able to make some suggestions. How old is he? That and what happened to the gas man are the two burning issues of Beverly Hills. <laughs> Well, you can't go wrong if you get him a nice scarf. We have some beautiful silk ones for $20. Yeah, yeah, I'd like that. Shh. Jack, he'll hear you. No, I'm afraid $20 is more than I had in mind. We also have some lovely ones for $15. That's still too much. $12.50? Uh-uh. Well, we have other gifts for about $10. $7.50? <laughs> $8.50? Five dollars? When you get down to a buck and a quarter, wrap it up! <laughs> well, that's not much of a gift. What does your boss usually give you for Christmas? A brand new dollar bill and a lecture on the evils of wine, women, and song. <laughs> oh. Well, look, if he's that kind of a man, why do you keep working for him? Well, it's kind of hard to explain. But he's good, thoughtful, kind, considerate. And he gives me his old toupee to cover my bicycle seat. <laughs> oh. Well, here's a nice red scarf, which is really an excellent buy. I'd rather take this one here. The color will match his eyes. Are his eyes blue? Bluer than the waters of Lake Louise under a sultry summer sky. <laughs> oh, are you a beaver? No, but I work like one. <laughs> By that. I don't know, Mary. Some little joke, I guess. Now, come on. Let's go and see. Oh, Mary. Mary, I just thought of something. Not again. Come on with me. It'll only take a minute. <laughs> oh, clerk. Clerk. Here's the package. I got it up from the delivery room. Now, go on and sign the card. No, no, no. That's not important now. I want to change the wallet. <laughs> what? <laughs> Instead of the $40 one, I'll take the one that costs $1.98. Gee, he was such a young fellow, too. <laughs> well, I'll take the dollar ninety-eight wallet and put the money in his hand. <laughs> Come on, Mary, let's go. Now, I wonder if we have to. Oh, look who's here! Hey, Don, Don. Well, oh, hi, Jack. Hello, Mary. Gee, what trouble I'm having in this store. Wish I didn't have such a big stomach. Why? Well, it seems there's a piano missing, and they searched me three times. <laughs> Oh, oh. Don, have you bought your wife's present yet? Oh, yes, I did that yesterday. But today I bought a gift for our gardener. Your gardener? Well, what'd you buy him? A $40 wallet. <laughs> a $40 wallet? For your gardener? Jack, the only other ones they had were $1.98, and I wouldn't give that to a dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can start barking, brother, and Merry Christmas. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, as is our custom every Christmas, at this time, Dennis Day will sing Ava Maria. Oh. 
Gentlemen, on behalf of my sponsors and my entire staff, I want to wish all of you a very Merry Christmas. Good night. The Jack Benny Program, presented by Lucky Strike. It is Smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Your level best. That's just how you'll feel when you light up a Lucky. Because Lucky's fine tobacco picks you up when you're low... Calms you down when you're tense. Puts you on the right level to feel and do your level best. It's important to you as a smoker to know that fine tobacco can do this for you. And every smoker knows. L-S-M-F-T. L-S-M-F-T. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Remember, more independent tobacco experts, auctioneers, buyers, and warehousemen smoke Lucky Strike regularly than the next two leading brands combined. It's good to know that fine tobacco picks you up when you're low, calms you down when you're tense. By putting you on the right level to feel and do your level best. That's the lucky level. So, smoke a lucky to feel your level best. Yes, the next time you buy cigarettes, remember, Lucky's fine tobacco puts you on the right level, the lucky level, where you feel your level best and do your level best. Smoke a lucky to feel your level best. Get on the lucky level where it's fun to be alive. Get a carton of luckies and get started today. <laughs> The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, today marks Jack Benny's first program on the Columbia Broadcasting System. So, let's go back a couple of hours and pick up Jack and Mary on their way to the studio. Rochester is driving. <laughs> Not so fast, Rochester. Don't cross the double line. Look out for that car. What's the matter with you? I'm driving as carefully as I can, boss. Well, just watch it, that's all. Oh, for heaven's sake, Jack, calm down. Don't be so nervous. I'm not nervous. Then stop pacing up and down on the running board. <laughs> no 
okay, Mary, I'll admit it. I am nervous, and you can't blame me. Today's my opening broadcast on CBS. All right, so you're opening on CBS. What do you mean, all right? Do you realize it's the first time my program will be heard in Alaska? Well, so what? I've yet to see a walrus smoking a lucky strike. <laughs> oh, yeah? I saw one last night. <laughs> that was Jerry Colonna. <laughs> I'll have to apologize. I threw him a fish. <laughs> anyway, Mary, this is no time for joking. I'm upset. Oh, for heaven's sake, Jack. Why should you be worried? You must have a million dollars down in your vault. I know, but I don't want to break up the serial number. <laughs> I mean, Mary, stop asking me questions, will you? <laughs> I'm in no... Rochester, I don't want to have an accident on the way to the studio. Now, slow down. I'm only going 12 miles an hour. (laughs) Don't give me that. What does it say on the speedometer? Made in 1899. (laughs) I mean, besides that. Jack, you're working yourself into a breakdown. Rochester, see if you can get something on the radio so Mr. Benny can relax. Yes, ma'am. That concludes another broadcast by your friendly philosopher. And now for a special announcement. Remember, only two more hours and Jack Benny will be on CBS. Turn that off! (laughs) That's all they've been broadcasting for the past week. Six more days for Jack Benny. Five more days for Jack Benny. Four more days. Two more hours. Well, Jack, if you don't like it, make him stop it. I will not. I can't figure you out. First you don't like it, then you do like it. I've never never seen you this way. He's been a nervous wreck all week, Miss Livingston. Last night he didn't sleep a wink. He just kept tossing and turning and whimpering like a baby. Well, wasn't there anything you could do for him? I tried everything. I even threw him over my shoulder and burped him twice. (laughs) Oh, Rochester, stop exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating, boss. You've even been talking in your sleep. Talking in his sleep. Yeah. Miss Livingston, who is William Paley? Uh, William Paley is the head of the Columbia Broadcasting System. Why? He has now replaced Henry Lamar in Mr. Benny's dream. <laughs> Stop, Rochester. I, I never dreamed about Mr. Paley. Yes, you did, boss. All night long you kept saying, P-A-L-E-Y, P-A-L-E-Y. <laughs> Look, Rochester, I'm upset enough as it is without your disgusting... Oh, fine. That's all I need now, a traffic cop. Rochester, he wants us to pull over to the curb. Caught you, didn't I? (laughs) What's the matter, officer? Were we speeding? Don't flatter yourself. You went through a red light. Officer, the light was green when we started through the intersection. Yeah, I know, but it changed twice before this jalopy got across. <laughs> Look, officer, I'm afraid this is my fault. I'm in a hurry. I'm talking to the driver, so keep your... Bi- Wait a minute. You're Jack Benny, aren't you? Yes, yes, I am. Well, then you must be on your way to the studio to do your first broadcast for CBS. That's right. Well, only a louse would give you a ticket on a day like this. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, shake hands with Officer Sam Louse. <laughs> what? I'm sorry, Mr. Benny, but beauty is beauty. Now, I'll write this. Calling all cars. Calling all cars. Uh, excuse me a minute. This may be important. Attention all officers. There has been a holdup on 4th and Olive. Investigate a double murder at Hill and Grand. Only two more hours and Jack Benny will be on CBS. <laughs> Gee, they have that announcement on your radio, too. See, the police must like my program. Yes, they use it down at headquarters for the third degree. <laughs> third degree? It, twice I confessed and I didn't even do anything. <laughs> well, you can go, Mr. Benny, and I won't give you a ticket. I can't stand the tears in those big blue eyes. Thank you. Go ahead, Rochester. Drive on, will you? Just a second, boss. I've got to start the motor. Oh, gee whiz, Jack. I hope you don't have trouble starting it like you always do. Don't worry about that. I mean, yesterday I had the motor tuned. Go ahead, Rochester. Start it.
who tuned it, Spike Jones? <laughs> Mary, please. Rochester, try it again, will you? Don't worry, boss. I'll get this motor started. But close your eyes. Why? I'm going to use the whip. <laughs> I don't care what you use. Let's get to the studio. <laughs> See, Mary, they've got a nice lot here, haven't they? Yeah. Uh, here's your parking ticket, mister. Thank you. And, boy, be careful when you park my car. Why? <laughs> Come on, Mary. Uh, say, Jack, as, uh, as we drove in, did you see that big sign on the building? The big sign? Or what did it say? Uh, Jack Benny has switched to CBS. Bill Harris has switched to Sterno. <laughs> oh, yes, it was his New Year's resolution. Well, here's the artist entrance. Let's go in. Oh, doorman. Yeah? I'm Jack Benny. I don't care who you are. Wipe your feet. <laughs> well, look, when Mr. William Paley comes in, tell him I want to see him right away, will you? Okay. You know, Mary, even though I'm trying to keep calm, I can't help being nervous today. I guess every actor feels oh, that Oh, Jack, look who's coming down the hall. Amos and Andy. Oh, yeah. They're coming this way. Hello, Amos. Uh, hello, Miss Benny. Hello, Miss Littleton. Hello. Uh, uh, by, by the way, uh, Miss Benny, we understand that you're going to be on the network here with us. Yes, yes, that's right. Well, Miss Benny, uh, me and Andy just want to wish you a lot of luck. Well, thank you, boys. Thank you very much. Uh, say, Andy. What is it, Andy? Uh, that Miss Benny is supposed to be a big comedian. Uh, he didn't say nothing funny. Mm. <laughs> well, uh, just like I told you, Amos, he ain't nothing without Rochester. <laughs> Were, were you boys talking to me? Uh, no, 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 Here we are, Studio B. Well, I want to see what my dressing room is like. I'll meet you later. Okay. Oh, hello, Phil. Oh, hold it, fellas. Hold it. All right, break it up a minute. Hiya, Jackson. Welcome to Petrillo's Inner Sanctum. <laughs> look, Phil. Phil, I want to talk to you. Me? Yeah, look, at here it is a new year. We're starting on a new network. So, Phil, you've got to do something about your musicians. Really. Why, what's wrong with my lads? <laughs> look, Phil, look, I don't expect them to wear full dress suits. I don't even want them to wear coats or jackets. But for the love of heaven, why don't they wear ties? Well, Jackson, most of these boys are out on parole and they don't want nothing around their neck with a knot in it. <laughs> that I can understand. But the worst of all is your pal Remley. He's a disgrace. Hold it, Jackson, just a minute now. Hold it. Calm down a little bit. Don't say nothing about Frankie. You ought to be a little more considerate of him. Since he was a baby, poor Frankie never had no mother or, or father. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, Phil. I didn't know that Remley was an orphan, you know. Oh, he ain't no orphan. When he was born, his folks took one look at him and joined Parents Anonymous. <laughs> look, Phil, there's so much work to be done. I'm so nervous. Now, I want to make sure that you picked a good number for our first program. What are you and the boys going to play? Jackson have been giving it plenty of thought. In fact, I've been thinking about it all week, and I finally decided on that's what I like about this stuff. <laughs> oh, no, Oh, wait, Phil, don't start that over here. Now, I haven't told you this before, but that song is what drove Edgar Bergen into retirement. <laughs> now, believe me. Okay, Jackson, okay, if that's the way you feel about it. Now, look, about that dialogue stuff on this show. Shall we try that old running gag about hunting bear? No, 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 you hooked me on that too often. But, hey, wait a minute. I'll tell you, let's do it. But this time, Phil, let me pull it on you. You see, I'll start it by saying, Hello, Phil, would you like to come hunting with me up in the high Sierras? Certainly, Jackson. Are you going to hunt moose? No, I'm going to... 
Lose? Bill, that's not right. What am I supposed to ask you? Are you going to hunt bear? No, I'll be wearing buttons and bows. <laughs> oh, Harris, they might not let you sing your song on this network, but you'll allow some up some way. Bill, that's the last time I want to hear that joke. Now, play any number you want. I got to go out and look for Mr. Paley. All right, fellas, look, let's run over Dennis' song first. You all ready, kid? Yeah, I'm ready, Phil. <laughs> Look up, look up, when everything's looking down. Whenever you're low, let everything go, come out of that gloomy frown. Look up, look up, whenever those clouds are gray. It's gonna be fun whenever that sun starts chasing those clouds away. There's no room for old man gloom, so shake him. You're bound to take him Just try a smile or two But whatever you do, look up Look up Don't ever give up the fight When everything's wrong, it's never too long Till everything turns out right So whatever you do, look up Shake him, you're bound to take him. Just try a smile or two, but whatever you do, look up. Look up. Look up. Look up. Don't ever give up the fight. When everything's wrong, it's never too long. Till everything turns out right. So whatever you do, look up. Mary, I, I've looked all over for Mr. Paley. Here he is, the head of the whole Columbia network. I can't find him. He must be around here someplace. Well, let's go and rehearse the script first. We haven't got much time, you know. Okay, you know, the closer we get to doing the broadcast, the more nervous I am. Come on, let's get back into the... Jack, look out! Oh, for goodness sake, who was that? Gene Autry. <laughs> Gene Autry? Side saddle? <laughs> What a studio this is. If his horse has a better dressing room than I have, there's going to be trouble. Now, come on, Mary. I want to see Mr. Paley before we go on the air. And then we'll Oh, try... hello, Mr. Benny. I just finished rehearsing my song. Huh? Oh, hello, Don. I mean, Phil. Jack, it's Dennis. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, Dennis. Hey, wait a minute. Dennis, why are you wearing that top hat, white tie, and tails? Well, it's our first show on CBS, and I thought I'd dress up. Well, Dennis, I think that's very nice of you renting a full-dress suit for our first broadcast. Oh, I didn't rent it. This is the suit my father got married in. <laughs> oh. Well, Dennis, you should have had it clean. There's ketchup on the lapel. Oh, that's not ketchup. My father wouldn't say I do, and my mother punched him in the nose. <laughs> Look. Look, Phil. I mean, Dennis. Look, I'm glad you dressed up for our first show. Well, you know, Mr. Benny, Charlie McCarthy starts on CBS today, too. No, no, Dennis. Now, don't get mixed up. I'm the only one who's starting today, not Charlie McCarthy. Well, that's funny. I heard the doorman say to somebody, we've got that dummy over here now. <laughs> yeah, I wonder who he meant. Well, it isn't Mary, so it must be either you or me. <laughs> Dennis, don't bother me with that talk. I've got to go in okay, and... Hey, say, Jack. Jack. What? Did you notice it? Certainly, Mary. I noticed it the minute I saw him. Well, uh, why don't you ask him? No, no, Mary. You ask him. Not me. All right, I will. Dennis. Dennis, I want to get something straight. Look, at you wanted to dress up for our first broadcast at CBS. Is that right? Uh-huh. So you put on your father's top hat, white tie, and tails. But why are you wearing hip boots? I couldn't find the pants. <laughs> Well, 
serves me right for asking. I, anyway, <laughs> I'll take one more chance. Dennis, why wear hip boots? Why didn't you wear your own pants? I did, but I lost them by force of habit. <laughs> what? As I passed NBC, I walked by, but my pants walked in. <laughs> Come on, Mary. Instead of talking to him, I could have seen Mr. Paley. Now, let's go in and we'll... Hello, pro- Mr. Benny. Oh, hello. Hello, Mr. Kitzo. <laughs> Mr. Kitzel, what are you doing here? Mr. Benny, I want to be among the first to congratulate you on moving to this network. Well, thank you, thank you. I hope you approve of the move. Yes, I do immensely. <laughs> CBS is my favorite network. Oh, you, you like their shows? Oh, yes. Especially on Monday nights when they have my friend Hoyman and Lux. <laughs> that's, uh, Mr. Kitzel, that's Lux. Lux, Lux. I like them both. Uh, by the way, Mr. Kitzel, did you enjoy New Year's Eve? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> did I have a good time? But I think I had one drink too many. Oh, then you were you were a little high. Hi. Oh, my. I was stinking. <laughs> oh, Mr. Kitzel, I can't believe it. Yes, yeah, shame on me. <laughs> and you know, when I sobered up, I found myself doing something terrible. I was kissing somebody's wife. Whose? Mine. <laughs> Well, Mr. Kissel, we've got to look over our script before we go on the air. It was nice meeting you again. Feeling is likewise, Mr. Benny. Goodbye. 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 <laughs> well, come on, Mary. Let's go in. We'll, we have to rush this before we get through. One, two, three, four. One, two, What's three, this? four. Hello, Joe. Testing, testing. One, two, three, four. Hey, what are you doing? I'm the engineer. I'm testing the microphones. Jack Benny will be on the air in a few minutes. I know, I know. Yeah, who wouldn't know? With all this fuss they're making, you would think they were getting Al Pierce. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah? Well, let me tell you something, buddy. I happen to be Jack... Oh, Jack, Jack. Oh, hello, Mary. I mean, Don. Don, hello. (laughs) Excuse me, Don. I'm so nervous today. Well, I can understand that, Jack. I'm jittery myself. I've got butterflies in my stomach. You have, Don, you could have the Northwestern football team in your stomach. They'd make more yardage than they did in the Rose Bowl. Now, what do you want, Don? Well, Jack, we'll be on the air in a few minutes, and you haven't run through the commercials yet. We can't do that. The audience has started coming in now. Well, that's good, Jack. We can get a reaction and see what we've got. Don, we're not going to go through... Jack, you're in it. I don't... I am? (laughs) You mean in the commercial? Yes, the boys are going to sing Frank Lesser's big song hit, A Slow Boat to China. Frank Lesser song? Oh, well, that's great. Where are the sports? Well, here they are. Okay, take it, boys. There is no verse to this song. But we don't want to wait a moment too long to say that we'd like to get you on a slow bus to Glendale. All to ourselves alone. About Lucky Strike, you see, we know you like them. Ellis, Ellis, M, F, F, T. You said it. While we are riding, all the time we'll be fighting. Smoking that good old cigarette. We'd like to get you on a slow band to Van Me? On a slow freight to Frisco. She? All by ourselves alone. I can hardly wait. Open up that golden gate. Get you and tell you all about that cigarette. Please pay attention. I'm listening already at some rhyming. Please like to get you on a slow plane to Plainfield. Plainfield? Smoke in those luckies all the way. I'll just puff and puff. How about this clever stuff? We would like to get you on a rickshaw to Shanghai. A rickshaw? All by ourselves alone. We'll never make it. All by ourselves alone. Don! 
John, John, that was wonderful. Listen, you know, you better be prepared for an encore. Well, it's all, Jack. The boys haven't prepared any more lyrics. Well, we're only rehearsing. Can't they add lib as they go along? How about it, folks? One more call. <laughs> you see, you see, now, the audience likes the idea. They want it. Well, all right, Jack. The boys will just have to make it up. They've nothing prepared. Oh, that's what I mean. Add lib something. Take it, fellas. What's the difference? <laughs> We'd like to get you on a walk to Waukegan. Waukegan? All by ourselves alone. Gee, I'd love to go, Cousin Cliff and Sister Flo. We have no lyrics that can be understood. But what's the difference? You've messed it up already, but good, poor lesser. We'd like to get you on a slow horse at Belmont. A horse? We want to hear you grow. I'll lose all my dough. I don't want to be a schmo. We'd like to get you on a sandwich to Denver. A sandwich? All to ourselves alone. Leave off the onion. All to ourselves You see? You see, Don? You see, that was great. It's going to be swell on the show. Stand by, please. Three minutes. Three minutes? I can't understand why Mr. Paley didn't come down to see me. Now I'll be a nervous wreck all through my first show. Two minutes and a half. How do you like that? One, two, three, four. Hello, Mom. Dennis! <laughs> Get away from that microphone. I can't understand what... Oh, that must be Mr. Paley now. Come in. Come in. Yes? Mr. Benny? Yes? I'm Don Thornburg, the head of the Western Division of the Columbia Broadcasting System. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Thornburg? <laughs> uh, what, uh, what, uh, what can I do for you? Well, I understand you've been looking for Mr. Paley. Yes, yes, I have. Uh, where, where is he? Well, Mr. Paley is in New York. He only comes out here on urgent business. Well, this is... <laughs> This is rather important, Mr. Thornburg, but perhaps you can help me. Well, I hope so. What is it? Well, well. Yes, Mr. Benny, what is it? Well, do you have the authority to validate my parking lot ticket? <laughs> Do you? Mr. Thornburg! Five seconds! Mr. Thornburg, come back! Two seconds! Mr. Thornburg! You're on the air! Oh, yeah. Hello again! This is Jack Benny talking. Mr. Payne! Mr. Payne! I was here! Mr. Payne! Ladies and gentlemen, travel on our highways is increasing. It is now 11% above the pre war peak. So be careful if you drive the car or even if you take a walk. Watch for traffic lights. Observe safety and traffic regulations. The life you save may be your own. Jack will be back in just a moment. But first, smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. You see, Lucky's fine tobacco picks you up when you're low, calms you down when you're tense. Put you on the right level to feel and do your level best. It's good to know that fine tobacco can do this for you. And that's why it's so important that you select and smoke the cigarette of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. For as every smoker knows, LSMFT, LSMFT, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. The experts, men who know tobacco, look to Lucky Strike for their own personal smoking enjoyment. Yes, more independent auctioneers, buyers, and warehousemen smoke Lucky's regularly than the next two leading brands combined. So, smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. That's how to get on the Lucky level, where there's real joy in living, where it's fun to be alive. The Lucky level, where you feel your best and do your best. Smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Get on the Lucky level, where it's fun to be alive. Get a carton of Luckies and get started today. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, not to be outdone by the quartet, Mary and I have cooked up a little number. We'd like to get you 
to stay tuned on Sunday and listen to CBS. It'll be such fun for you and me and everyone. Get you and tell you how much you laugh at spite. Next comes old blue eyes. Amos, you will surely like. With Andy. Then wait until you get Sam Spade to thrill you. Yeah. And guess when the villain will confess. I'm not going to say you'll have to listen in today. Then comes Luigi. You'll hear him on CB. Tune in on CBS. That's now our network. Tune in on CBS. Be sure to listen in to the little Lucky Strike program, Your Lucky Strike, starring Don Amici on this network. And don't forget, on Saturday nights, the Lucky Strike Hit Parade, starring Frank Sinatra. the Columbia Broadcasting System. You're listening to Hojo Radio. Stay tuned. The Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. <laughs> the makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coats present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn with songs by the King's Men and music by Billy Mills. The show opens with Hallelujah. <laughs> Saturday night baths and Saturday afternoon floor scrubbing are pretty well gone forever. We now know that that weekly scrubbing of linoleum floors was very harmful and eventually ruined the linoleum. It's so much safer, so much easier to protect floors with the modern floor polish, Johnson's self-polishing glow coat. You not only save your linoleum and make it last longer, but you save yourself lots of work. Because glow coat needs no rubbing or buffing. You simply apply and let dry. Glow coat is self-polishing. Glow coat is no ordinary polish. When you use it, you'll notice its lasting luster. You'll see how it wears evenly and smoothly without chipping. That's because glow coat has a flexible, not a brittle film. One trial will also convince you that glow coat is economical because a little goes so far. Make a note to remind yourself to buy some Johnson self-polishing glow coat this week. Some people think it would be a great thing if we were able to peer into the future. Personally, we think it's a blessing that we can't. For instance, here at 79 Wistful Vista sits the lady of the house darning socks for the master of the house, who doesn't know that a messenger boy is approaching with, ah, what can be in store for Fibber McGee and Molly. to buy some new socks. Huh? I've darned these so many times, they're practically handmade. <laughs> okay, I'll get some tomorrow. But it's an awful nuisance. Gee, I wish I was a kid again and could go barefooted. Do you really? Well, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> these guys that keep yearning for their childhood days are just kidding themselves. I wouldn't go through that again for a million bucks. Why not? 
Oh, I was a regular little gangster when I was a kid. Oh, go on. <laughs> I ever tell you about the morning I and Skinny Crandall and Bones Biddle and Stinky Hooper tried to wire a tie to wire across the schoolhouse steps? <laughs> then waited in the bushes for the teacher to show up? No. <laughs> yeah. No, you nasty boy. What happened? <laughs> well, we waited till noon and then suddenly realized it was Saturday. <laughs> So we started running down to the old swimming hole, and I tripped on the wire and down your bus. Come in. Parties for Mrs. McGee. For me? Are you Mrs. McGee? Well, what do I have to do? Show you my marriage license? <laughs> no, I can see Mr. McGee. Nobody else would live with him. <laughs> Fresh kid. Why, when I was his age, I was polite and thoughtful. Yes, you were, you little gangster. I wonder what this is. Oh, heavenly days, four pounds of Valentine candy. Oh, who's that from? Oh, as if you didn't know. Huh? <laughs> you darling. <laughs> you did remember, didn't you? <laughs> well, I, well I, ain't there a note in it or, or something? Well, why should there be? Who'd be sending me Valentine candy but you? Valentine? And my favorite kind, too. <laughs> well, I, I don't... I, I'm, well, I'm glad you like it, Molly. What kind is it? Now, listen, don't be so coy, McGee. Huh? <laughs> you can't fool me. <laughs> no? <laughs> well, Valentine's Day comes but once a year, they say. <laughs> or is that Christmas? And, <laughs> no? Well, it's Valentine's Day, too, I guess. Uh, isn't there any... Uh, didn't I put a note in it? Well, I don't see any, but you didn't have to. If a man can't send a valentine to his wife without a lot of explanations, I'd like to know who... Hello there, Johnny. Hello, daughter. Hey, can I speak to you alone a minute, Johnny? Why, well, sure. Excuse us a minute, Molly. Certainly. Go right ahead. What's on your mind, old-timer? Look, I'm selling valentines, Johnny. Want to buy one for the kid there? Nothing women appreciate more than a little touch of sentiment, you know. No, thanks, old-timer. <laughs> she just got a big box of candy for a valentine. She did, eh? Good for you, Johnny. Well, I don't know whether it is or not. Just between you and me, I don't remember sending it to her. Then you better buy one of these and send it too. Oh, no. Then she'd get suspicious. Ah, uh, don't be a fool, Johnny. The more you send them, the better they like it. Hmm? Here, here, here's a beaut. All lace and stuff. Mm. Says, uh, roses are sweet and so is your soul. I'm going to throw out my sugar and put you in the bowl. <laughs> No, thanks. I don't want any Valentines, old-timer. I don't mind wearing my heart on my sleeve, but I hate the idea of a mailman dragging it all around town in the rain. Uh, thanks, anyway. Okay, Johnny. Uh, sorry to keep you waiting, daughter. Just wanted to talk a little business with Johnny here. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Old-timer. I was busy darning his socks anyway. Just look how he tears holes in them. Yes, he's a holy terror, ain't he? <laughs> well, I gotta get back to my job, kids. Be seeing you. What do you mean, your job? What you doing? Oh, I'm caretaker down at the Wistful Vista Recreation Center. Oh. Keep the tennis courts in condition. Oh, must be quite a chore. Oh, no. Just a few swipes with a claw full of Johnson's wax, and I'm caught up for several days. Johnson's wax? On a tennis court? Yep. Table tennis, Johnny. Oh. Well, so long, kids. <laughs>
wish you'd never sent me this candy. I just can't keep my hands out of it. It's so good. Don't you like it? Hmm, sure I like it. Why shouldn't I like it? Well, you keep eyeing the box like you were afraid it was going to eat you. <laughs> I do? <laughs> well, I guess I just got a complex about candy. Ever since my mother used to feed me butterscotch to pull out my baby teeth. <laughs> Never believed in that string on the doorknob business myself. Well, there's no butterscotch in this candy, dearie. Now, that's what I keep telling my teeth. Besides, <laughs> hey, who's walking around upstairs? Oh, poor Uncle Dennis. He's all upset. What about? Oh, he's thinking of starting a lawsuit against Walt Disney. Walt Disney? Yeah. What for? Oh, that pink elephant sequence in Dumbo. <laughs> Uncle Dennis says he saw him first. <laughs> Well, he's all wet. You can't copyright a hangover. <laughs> anyway, what right? Come in. Good day, Mrs. McGee. Good day, McGee. Hi, Latrivia. Hello, Mr. Mayor. Have some candy? Uh, thank you, no. I'm on a low-carbohydrate diet. Well, you better stock up on them, then, Latriv. <laughs> they tell me there's going to be a shortage of low-carbohydrates. <laughs> you don't say. Huh? If I might make a suggestion, McGee, it would be to the effect that people who have no clear comprehension of a subject under discussion would be well advised to maintain a discreet silence. <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> well, he said, dearie, that if ignorance is bliss, happy days are here again. <laughs> or if you don't know what you're talking about when you pipe up, Pipe down. <laughs> oh, yeah? Well, now, look here, Latrice. Uh, just a moment, McGee. Will you please refrain hereafter? Don't ask him to make any promises about the hereafter, Mr. Man. <laughs> His forwarding address is unknown. <laughs> What are you talking about anyway, Latrivia? And quit shaking your finger in my face. I'm liable to think it's Halloween and start bobbing for knuckles. <laughs> All right. But hereafter, McGee, please refrain from telling motorcycle policemen that you are a close relation of mine and they can't do that to you. Do what to you, McGee? If he's referring to what I think he's referring to, he means that I got a ticket yesterday for parking eight minutes overtime. For parking one hour and eight minutes overtime? Well, can I help it if I forgot to set my watch back last Sunday night? <laughs> you weren't supposed to set it back. You were supposed to set it ahead. In that case, it would be two hours and eight minutes. There'd be no such a thing. It'd be eight minutes less than one hour. There's two hour parking on Oak Street, so the city owes me 52 minutes. <laughs> now, wait a minute, boys. Let's get this straight. Let's say you parked at exactly 3 o'clock and... But I didn't. I parked at 8 minutes to 4. Oh, for goodness sakes, you might at least park on the even hour. The odd minutes make these arguments too confusing. Yes. Anyway, McGee, the justness of the complaint does not concern me. What I object to is you're assuming that I, as mayor of Wistful Vista, would use the power of my office to obstruct the due processes of law. Furthermore, you had no business telling the officer that I was your nephew on your mother's side. <laughs> You leave my mother out of this, Latrivia. A fine thing. Dragging a guy's family into a sordid case like this. For shame. But McGee, he didn't say... And to think a guy like him is our mayor. It ain't enough that him and his Cossack cops ride roughshod over the common citizens. No, he's got to get personal. He's got it out. Just a minute, McGee. You were the one who saw... Oh, he dragged my family through the mud and the slime of a court trial. All the nuts up to public ridicule. Just so... All right, all right. I'll fix the ticket. I'll find the policeman. I'll resign. Good day. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I should have been a lawyer. But you had no business telling the policeman that the mayor was your nephew. Oh, no, I just proved it, didn't I? I made him holler uncle. <laughs> Give me a piece of that candy. Any chocolate-covered peanuts in there? Well, you ought to know. You bought it. Huh? I... Oh, uh, well, I, uh, well, I didn't specify every piece that went into the box. I bet you did. There's Ooh. everything I like in it. Oh. oh, you're so thoughtful, McGee. Oh, shucks. Uh, Valentine's Day. I think it was a Valentine's Day we first went out together, dearie. Yeah. I carved our initials inside of a big heart on that old oak tree in back of the brewery. The schoolhouse. The brewery. Schoolhouse, McGee. I remember it was the brewery because the only grove of trees where you could hitch a horse to. McGee! 
For 20 years and more, I've been telling people it was back at the schoolhouse, and I can't change it now. <laughs> Heavenly days, what's romantic about a brewery? <laughs> well, if it had been in back of the schoolhouse, I'd have ruined my jackknife. The only tree back there was a big steel flagpole. <laughs> well, just the same, I insist. Hello, folks. Oh, hi, Harlow. Have a piece of candy. It's wonderful. Stop bragging, McGee. I ain't bragging. I don't even know... <laughs> Here, have a nugget, Harlow. No, thanks. Say, do you people ever see Life magazine? Yes, we do, Mr. Wilcox. McGee always gets Life, Colliers, the American magazine, and Disturbing Detective. And anybody who would read Disturbing Detective ought to get Life. <laughs> Hanging is too good. And Molly, I gotta get disturbing detective. On account of the back cover. Why for the back cover? I'm trying to see how long Charles Atlas can keep his chest expanded like that. <laughs> did you ask, Mr. Wilcox? Well, the Johnson Wax people have got a double-page ad in Life next Friday, and I didn't want you to miss it. We're featuring the Consumer's Pledge for Total Defense. What you mean, Pledge? Well, look. <laughs> <laughs> look, here's one of the cards for Molly to sign. Uh, read it, Molly. All right. As a consumer in the total defense of democracy, I will do my part to make my home, my community, my country ready, efficient, and strong. I will buy carefully. I will take good care of the things I have. I will waste nothing. Place for signature. Consumer Division, Office of Price Administration. Well, I'll certainly sign that, Mr. Wilcox. Thanks, Molly. This is mighty important right now. If there was ever a time to conserve and save and protect and preserve, it's today. And Johnson's Wax does all of them in so many ways. It's a pretty necessary item on your kitchen shelf. Oh, say, and that reminds me. I'd better go in the kitchen and see if I have enough on hand. Excuse me a minute, boy. Certainly, Molly. Well, now I'll have a chaw of your chocolates, chum. Uh, here, help yourself. And look. Yeah? You didn't send this candy to Molly, did you? Not me, pal. I don't send candy to married women. I'm allergic to buckshot. <laughs> Why, didn't you? If I did, you can bop me with a bonbon if I remember doing it. <laughs> well, maybe you walked in your sleep again and crashed a confectionery. Say, I wonder... Oh, no, that ain't possible. The candy stores aren't open that late. Still, hey, you call on a lot of stores, don't you, Harlow? Sure, now that I'm taking these pledge cards around. Well, look, kind of snoop around and see what you can find out, will you? See if a guy about my size yeah. wearing purple pajamas and green slippers yeah. <laughs> with a sleepy look on his puss... Came wandering in any place and bought a box of Valentine candy. Hey, like hey, hey, hey. Easy, easy. Here, oh, here she comes. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay, pal, okay. I'll tell George what you said. So long. See uh, you later. So long, George. Uh... Hey. <laughs> Who's George McGee? And, uh, uh... What do you want Mr. Wilcox to tell him? Uh, George? Yes, George. <laughs> oh, George. <laughs> yeah, he's, uh... Oh, oh he met old George Frahulis. <laughs> Who on earth is George Frihulis? Oh, uh, he used to have a tire shop out on 14th Street. <laughs> Just sold it and took up blacksmithing. <laughs> <laughs> I just told Harlow to wish him good luck. <laughs> Though why a guy in the horseshoe business should need anybody to Talk tell him... Talk to me one of those coconut creams, McGee. They're delicious. Here. Yeah. Thank you. My, I don't know when a box of candy has intrigued me like this one, dearie. Yeah, me either. I mean, me too. What? Uh, I mean, I, well, I'm glad you like it, Molly. You always did like mixed chocolates, didn't you? Yes, and weren't you nice to remember it? Yeah. But then you always were thoughtful. <laughs> always the gentleman. <Yeah. laughs> remember the time I dropped my handkerchief at the dance? And you and Otis Cadwallader both rushed to pick it up yeah. and bumped your heads together and knocked each other out. <laughs> yeah, but I came too. <laughs> that guy's still unconscious. Oh, oh, my, you were jealous of him. I believe you still are. Oh, I am not. Say, I saw in the paper last night that he's in town. <laughs> What's the matter? This candy kind of choked me. <laughs> In fact, I think any of it would cook me. What do you mean? I mean that Otis Cadwallader. He might be the guy who, who well, he'd make me choke on a caraway seed. <laughs> the very mention of his name. Ah, my... you see, you are jealous. I never saw such a la... Come in. Oh, hello, Mrs. Uppington. Uh, how do you do, my dear? And Mr. McGee. Hi, Uppy. Come on in, out of the rain. Oh, it's not raining, Mr. McGee. It ain't? I'd have swore I saw a big drip in the doorway. <laughs> Come on in, anyway. Uh, Have you. a hunk of candy, Abigail. Sweets to the sweet, you know. In this case, a chocolate-covered dill pickle might be more McGee. appropriate. 
Have one, Abigail? Oh, thank you, no, my dear. No candy for me. I must keep my weight down, you know. <laughs> and you're doing swell at it, too, Uppy. Oh, do you think so, Mr. McGee? <laughs> I sure do. What, what did I just tell you just this morning, Molly? Well, he said, isn't it wonderful how Mrs. Uppington keeps her figure? Oh, now, really. <laughs> and I said, it certainly is. Uh, well, I flatter myself. And then I said, yes. But why anyone would want to keep a figure like that is beyond... Mr. McGee. <laughs> I prefer not to speak of my, uh, dimensions. <laughs> okay, up if you say so, they're unspeakable. <laughs> I, what, what? He just means that if you prefer not to mention your weight, it's unmentionable. Oh, I see. Well, I just stopped by Mrs. McGee to show you my new bracelet. See? Heavenly days, Abigail, is this really mm. yours? Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Don't tell me that's genuine, Uppy. Indeed it is, Mr. McGee. Wow. Oh, I spent more for it than I should possibly, but this is a, the sort of thing that will become a valuable heirloom, you know. Well, you'd better be careful, Abigail. You don't let it lay around the house, do you? Oh, no, my dear. Boy. In fact, I'm on my way to the bank right now to put it in the vault. Well, I should hope so. That thing is practically irreplaceable. Yeah. Oh, of course it is. Yeah. Oh, I just adore it. I'm such a happy, happy girl to own a genuine solid rubber band. Well, good night. The King's Men sing Don't Touch It. When I was just a tiny tot down in Tennessee, I kept my mammy on the spot for looking after me. I'd fool with this and fool with that, messing round about. And when I'd grab my pappy's hat, mammy dear would shout, Don't touch it, ah, 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 better leave it alone, don't touch it, mm-mm, hey, hey, you'll catch it. When pappy gets home, if you don't mind what I say, Happy Mr. Sunday hat down in Tennessee. He fuss and fuss and cuss and cuss and start to look for me. Then pretty soon I'd have a date in the old woodshed. And with remorse I'd meditate on what my mammy said. Don't touch it. Ah, ah, ah. Can't you leave it alone? Don't touch it. Nay, nay, you'll catch it. As sure as you're born. If you don't mind what I say. One day I went this happy downtown to buy a shoe. He said it was good for any man to have a sip of brew. But when he went to take a nip, we heard an awful roar. We turned around, there was Mammy shouting through the door. Don't catch it. Ah, can't you leave it alone? Don't catch it. Nay, nay, you'll catch it. As sure as you're born, if you don't mind what I say. Happy were my childhood days down in Tennessee. The dear old-fashioned country ways still appeal to me. I'd gladly be a boy again to mess around about. I'd step on Happy's Derby just to hear my mammy shout. Don't touch it. Ah, ah, ah. Better leave it alone. Don't touch it. Mm-mm. Hey, hey. You'll catch it. When Happy gets home, if you don't mind what I say. Candy McGee, help yourself to all you want. Oh. Any man who remembers his wife like this for Valentine's Day deserves anything he can get. I wish you'd quit saying that, Molly. Why, for goodness sakes, you did send it to me, didn't you? <laughs> who just you sent it? <laughs> well, then don't be so modest. You certainly have changed since we were married. I have? How so? Oh, <laughs> when we were going together and you'd send a box of Turkish delights or a Tootsie Roll, you kept reminding me of it for weeks. <laughs> you'd say, how about a kiss, baby? And I'd say, no, not now. And then you'd pout and say, okay, no more salt water taffy for you. <laughs> and then I'd say... Oh, no. Come in. Hello, folks. Oh, Hello. <laughs> Hi, Wimp, old man. How's everything? Oh, just peachy, Mr. McGee. <laughs> well, you're 
you're looking very well, Mr. Wimple. Is your wife away? No, but Sweetie Face has been very busy with the new women's ambulance unit. Well, the ambulance unit, eh? Yes. She a nurse or a driver, Wimple? Neither one, Mr. McGee. She holds up the ambulance while the other girls crawl under it and make repairs. Wife is very strong, isn't she, Mr. Wimple? Indeed, she is. <laughs> Why, do you know, I've seen her tie a bow knot and a steel crowbar. Gee, really? Yes, sirree. Wow. And I don't mind telling you, I had a terrible time getting it off, too. <laughs> My neck was sore for weeks. <laughs> well, there's one thing about your married life, Wimp. You never know what's coming next. Yes, that's something to be thankful for, isn't it? <laughs> but I really owe a lot to Sweetie Face. Yeah. She's made me what I am today. Uh, and what is that? <laughs> Come, let's not get clinical, Miss. <laughs> I'll bring her over sometime, Wimp. I'll get four flat irons and we'll play peas porridge hot. <laughs> Oh, I just can't get her to go out anywhere socially, Mr. McGee. She says she'd rather stay home with her artwork. Oh, artwork? Does she paint, too? Oh, indeed she does. She did a wonderful painting of two moonshiners working down in the Kentucky hills. Oh. What's she call it? Uh, still life. <laughs> I'll never forget the time I asked you to paint me. <laughs> And did she do it? In a way, she did, Mrs. McGee. She gave me a beautiful shellacking. Uh, I, I suppose she was just being playful. Of course, of course. She has a grand sense of humor. One day I said to her, Sweetie Face, let's not play so rough. And she said, All right, Wallace, let's play beanbag. And I said, oh, dandy. And then everything went black. <laughs> my, my goodness, I, I never knew beans came in 500-pound bags. <laughs> We never offered Wimple any candy. Well, it's probably just as well. One sweetie face in the family ought to be plenty. <laughs> the poor fella. Yeah, the way he gets pushed around, he must have come from a long line of wheelbarrows. <laughs> He's... I'll get him, McGee. 79 Wistful Vista, Molly McGee speaking. Who? Oh, hello, Mr. Wilcox. Oh, Wilcox. Hey, let me take it, be Molly. Be quiet, I'm... McGee. I can't hear. What was it, Mr. Wilcox? Well, Molly, that's the important call. I've been expecting oh, you. I can't hear a word he said. Oh. What'd you say, Mr. Wilcox? Oh, well, I... Yes, I'd be glad to take the message. Oh, now I am, son. Yes, yes. Oh. All right. Why didn't I go? Yes. Yes, I'm telling Mr. Wilcox. Oh, is you... <laughs> well, thank you for calling. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> McGee. Huh? What on earth goes on, anyway? <laughs> Well, I might as well admit the whole thing, Molly. I, I never felt right about it anyway. About what? About the... Uh... Hey, wait a minute. What did Wilcox say? Well, he said to give you this message and you'd understand. Yeah? He said, Elks Club, punch board, two weeks ago, deliver this week. Elks <laughs> So that was it. Ha, now I remember. Oh, oh, boy. Is that a load off my mind? <laughs> is what a load off your mind? <laughs> oh, it wouldn't interest you, Molly. But it would, McGee. Huh? You were interested enough in me to send me this lovely candy, and I'm interested in your affairs, too, <laughs> Okay, here. I'll tell you. You see, the Elks wanted me to act as chairman of the boxing committee a couple of weeks ago. And yes. I said I'd think it over. So I delivered my acceptance today. <laughs> Simple, ain't it? But what's this about a punch board? Oh, oh that. <laughs> That's what we fellas call the boxing committee. The punch board. Oh. <laughs> Hand me a piece of that candy, will you, Molly? <laughs> Give me two pieces. Give me a handful. I never mind. <laughs> Most of us today have our weather eye out for worthwhile economies, places where we can make one dollar do the work of two. 
One way you can accomplish that same thing is by taking better care of what you have and saving on replacements. Protect your floors, for example, and save money on costly refinishing by polishing, polishing them regularly with genuine Johnson's Wax. The coat of wax acts as a shield against both dirt and wear. It's easily applied and can be touched up or renewed as often as necessary. The result is not only money-saving protection, but greater beauty for your entire home and less work for you. You can use that same Johnson's Wax to protect and beautify your furniture and woodwork, your window sills, Venetian blinds, shoes, luggage, refrigerator. If you do this, you'll be practicing what housekeeping authorities call protective housekeeping. Johnson's Wax is now available in three forms, paste, liquid, and cream wax. Sorry, folks, our time's up. Good night. This is Harlow Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson's Wax Finishes for Home and Industry, inviting you all to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. Let me remind you again to clean and polish your car with Johnson's Car New, the new labor saver that does two jobs at the same time, both cleans and polishes in one application. Car New, made by the makers of Johnson's Wax, gives your car back its original showroom shine, increases your driving pleasure. Thousands of car owners have learned to say, your car looks like new when you use car new. Don't put it off. Buy a can of Johnson's Car New this week, spelled C-A-R-N-U. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. <laughs> Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn, with songs by the King's Men and music by Billy Mills. The show opens with It's High Time. disturbed period of our history have come a few great songs. One that I like especially from the last war is Keep the Home Fires Burning. It's more than a song. It's an expression of the deep significance of home that a man feels when he's away from it. And it points to the great daily service that women of our families give us, keeping the homes cheerful, clean, comfortable, livable. That's a very important service, never more appreciated than now. Women who practice protective housekeeping with the regular use of Johnson's Wax find their work easier and results more satisfactory. Housekeeping authorities recommend Johnson's Wax, not only for protection, but also for the great beauty it gives to floors, furniture and woodwork, and to window sills, shoes, luggage, Venetian blinds, lampshades. You can give all these things a longer life of service with genuine Johnson's Wax in paste, liquid, or cream wax form. <laughs> the lady of the house at 79 Wistful Vista is a pretty calm individual, taking the antics of her husband as minor phenomena in an otherwise normal life. But his maneuvers the past few days have even her a little perturbed. And here, one making faces at himself in a mirror, and the other watching him in wonder, we find Fibber McGee and Molly. McGee, please stop making those faces. What on earth is the matter with you? I'm rehearsing. Rehearsing for what? Do they need an air raid warden for the monkey house at the zoo? 
Yeah. No, no, I, I'm practicing to be a comedian. Comedian? Yeah, what our country needs right now is a lot of laughs. Oh. How are they going to get them? New comedians, that's the answer. I see. Sure. You're the chap that replaces Chaplin and the Abbott and Lou of Costello. <laughs> Uh, roughly, that's the idea. Well, roughly, it's ridiculous. <laughs> I thought so, too. What do you mean, ridiculous? I know whereof I'm speaking about. Remember that picture me ma- we made with Ed Bergen and his little petrified partner? Look who's... <laughs> you mean look who's laughing? Yeah. Well, uh, what about it? They never give me a, br- a proper break in that picture. <laughs> I can be a lot funnier and I can prove it. Yeah? Oh, I was great in the heavy stuff and the romantic scenes, but... You I... didn't have any romantic scenes. And why not? Jealousy, that's why. Oh. Afraid I'd steal the picture. So now I'm going to make a few reels of home movies and show them producers that McGee is really comical. Oh, dear. Yeah. Such modesty. Mm-hmm. Anytime you hide your light under a bushel, dearie, it'll be a million candle-powered light under a cellophane bushel. <laughs> <laughs> now tell me what... Oh. That's probably a delivery boy I'm expecting. I'll get it. What have you ordered now? A corsage of shrinking violets? <laughs> <laughs> Better be a shrinking violet than a silly aster. <laughs> Come in. Mr. Fibber McGee live here? That's me, sis. Package for you from the Woodsville Vista Home Movie Company. Sign here, please. Oh, okay. Now, here you are. <laughs> I was expecting a boy. So was my father, but life is full of surprises. <laughs> Ah, he means he thought the delivery boy would be a, a boy, dearie. Oh, uh, our delivery boy joined the army. Oh, good for him, sis. What outfit? Brown suit, leather belt, overseas cap and leggings. It's the latest style. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what part of the army, dearie? Uh, 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 you know what they say, lady. Keep your trap shut and nobody will get caught in it. Good day. <laughs> Smart babe, take an appendectomy to get anything out of her. <laughs> well, uh, what did you get at the home movie shop, McGee? As if I didn't suspect. Oh, uh, wait till I show you. There. Oh, a little movie camera. Yeah, the six reels of film. Now, I'm going to make my own screen test and send it to Hollywood. I'm going to send Prince to Zanuck and Warner Brothers and Sam Goldwyn and RKO and... And uh, Swift and Company. <laughs> Swift and Company. They make pictures? They've got what it takes. <laughs> but now look, <clears throat> look here, you funny fella. Huh? Uh, how can you do your comical acting and take your own picture at the same time? Ah, that's where you come in. You're going to be the cameraman. Oh, no, you don't. Sure. No, no, I won't be a party to it. I may tolerate your foolishness, but I won't put you on a negative, and that's positive. <laughs> Now, don't look at me like that, McGee. After all... It's, it's okay, Molly. You you just haven't got faith in me. That's all. Let go. But, McGee, don't you see Forget that... Forget it, Molly. I, well, I'm a guy's own wife. Ain't got any confidence in a guy. <laughs> How can you expect a guy McGee, to... McGee. Huh? Give me that camera. How do you work it? Here, it's all loaded. <laughs> now, where I set it for indoor work? There. Now I'll set it for fast action. There we are. Now all you got to do is look at me through this little dingus and press this button, see? What? Well, how do I stop it? Take your finger off the button, is all. You catch on? Well, I guess so. But now listen, I warn you, this first reel may be pretty wobbly. Oh, that's all right. We'll we'll give it a gag title like maybe How Green Was My Molly. Oh. Oh, that'll kill him. <laughs> and none too soon either. <laughs> After they see this, they will have seen everything. Yeah. Well, what do we do now? Now look, first I'll do a fast scene. See, you point the camera at the door, and I'll come dashing in like the cops were after me. Yeah. Then I'll knock over the end table and get all snarled up in the lamp cord. Oh, That's man. always good. <laughs> now, now remember, keep the camera on me. Uh, wait, I put a funny hat on, and I'll be right back. Oh dear. <laughs> what have I gotten into now? Are these the wages of cinema? <laughs> Side the camera, Molly. Here I come. That's it, Molly. Cut. Cut what? Cut the pill. What with? No, 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 no. Stop it. <laughs> Take your finger off the button. <laughs> be terrific. Did you catch the funny look on my McGee. pen? McGee. Huh? Why, you're all cut on the arm. You fell on that broken lamp. Oh, forget it. Once I get into the real thing, I'll have a stuntman to do the hard stuff. 
Hey, let's run through that scene again. I just thought of another way to do it. This time I'm going to do a flip-flop across the radio. Oh, dear. Now get ready. No wonder they sell candy in theaters. It keeps the audience from grinding their teeth. <laughs> All right, dearie. Here I come. Sakes, McGee, hold still. Mm. How can I dab this stuff on your neck if you keep wiggling like this out there? Yark! Don't forget now. That's iodine you're using, not soothing syrup. Well, it's your own fault. Oh. You might have known if you slid down that banister, you'd sail across the hall. Boy, I bet you got a wonderhead wig on and them size 12 shoes. How much... Oh! oh. Reels. How much skinny you got? Ah, oh, what's a few bruises? You know what I'm going to do for the next shot, Molly? Oh. I'm going to go up on the roof and jump off with an umbrella for a parachute. Oh. <laughs> That'll be a panic. No, no, McGee. I won't let you do it. Oh, why not? We can get a new umbrella for three bucks. <laughs> yeah, but can you get a retread on your sacroiliac? <laughs> I won't hurt myself. I know how to fall. Red Skelton showed me. Just relax. Come in. Oh, hello there, Mr. Oldtimer. Won't you come in? No, oh, thanks, daughter. Just dropped by to borrow a pair of water wings. Oh, hello there, Johnny. Hi, Oldtimer. We don't have any water wings, but have a chair. Don't you know this is be kind to your metatarsals week? <laughs> Won't you get it, Molly? I said that... Ain't funny, McGee. <laughs> Wouldn't even be funny if I knew what a metatarsal was, Johnny. Metatarsal is a bone in your back. Mm. <laughs> no, it's not. It's a bone in your foot. Oh, I know, but uh, he'll find my foot in his back if he ain't more sick. <laughs> what you doing, Johnny? Studying medicine? Sure smells like a hospital in here. Oh, he got cut and bruised a little, Mr. Oldtimer, and I've been doctoring him up. Yeah, but as I always say, I'm an easy bruise, but a quick heal. <laughs> That's pretty good, Johnny. That ain't the way I hear it. The way I hear it, one feller says to tell a feller, See, he says. You know what I'm going to do if the government won't leave me buy enough sugar? Sure, says t'other feller, to whom it was an awful old joke, raise cane. <laughs> well, if you have no water wings, I guess I'll be scooping along. Well, what do you want with water wings this time of the year? I'm going skating down the lake, daughter, and I hear the ice is getting thin. So long, kids. <laughs> Wonderful. 
whole world. Now, let's see. Be good at the camera, Molly. We'll take this one out in the kitchen. I'll load up my arms with grub and dishes, see? Then I'll trip over a chair and crash the whole business. <laughs> Maybe wind up with ketchup streaming all down my oh. face. <laughs> How's that? Huh? Delightful. Uh-huh. Delightful. Let's use my best Haviland china, too. Oh, fine. We might as well put a little class into this picture. Oh, swell. We'll show them we spared no expense when it comes to making... Hello, oh, oh. Hello Mr. Wilcox. Hi, Harlow. Come on in and watch us make some home movies. Say, you'd better take it easy, pal. You look like you'd lost an argument with an octopus holding eight buzz saws. <laughs> <laughs> ah, sir, I can't quit now. I'm going to finish this job. We only got two reels of film left, and I got to get them developed and sent to Hollywood. Do you see how stubborn he is, Mr. Wilcox? Yeah. He's a regular Cecil B. DeMule. <laughs> Well, let's see a sample of this giggle opera. Okay, come on out in the kitchen. Better take some of my good glassware, too, McGee. Okay, I'll take... Stop that! (laughs) Use the old jelly glasses. They break just as funny as my crystal wear. What's the scenario, Fibber? Oh, scenario, we're taking a picture. Now watch. I pile this stuff up on my arm, see? Like this. Yeah. You get the camera ready, Molly. Go ahead, dearie, I'm ready. Now, when I say go, start the film. I'll pretend I'm getting myself a snack out of the icebox. Yeah. Then I trip and fall with a big crash, see? <laughs> This'll be a howl. Skip the build-up. Make with the funny stuff. Okay. Okay. Action, camera. <laughs> now, let's see. Half a dozen eggs, a bowl of salad, some tomatoes, a bottle of milk, a couple of bananas. That's enough. Look out for that chair, Fibber. Huh? Better do it over again, McGee. You didn't break either arm. <laughs> oh, that was a honey, wasn't it? Did you get the surprise expression on my puss when Wilcox hollered at me? <laughs> That'll register swell. Yeah. Look at the mess on my kitchen floor. Huh? Let me take the camera, Molly, quick. While that milk and those eggs are still oozing together. Here, but what are you going get to... Get a damp cloth, quick. What? I'll shoot you as you wipe those things off the Johnson glow-coated floor, see? Wonderful scene. Oh, I see. All right. Start going. Hey, wait a minute. Don't use that film for that. I only got a few people... Out of the way, Fibber. You're in the light. What? That's it, Molly. Yes. This will show how easily spots and stains are wiped off a of glow-coated linoleum. Yes. Keep smiling. <laughs> ah, swell. No trouble at all, you see. But now another little spot on the left there. That's it. Now face the camera and spread your hands out to show how easy it's been. Yes, but... Ah, that's great. Hey, who's making these movies anyway? What'll Sam Goldwyn say when Did he sees Did you get it all right, Mr. Wilcox? I think so, and great, too. You know what they say, one picture is worth a thousand words. Well, I got a few thousand choice words for anybody that'll butt into a guy's career like that. It's a fine we'll thing. We'll send you a print of it, Mr. Wilcox. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I'll write a title for it. Something like, uh, in these days of strife and wars, you save your wife and save your floors. <laughs> Self-polishing glow coat throughout the nation is quite an item in conservation. I'll run home and write that down before I forget it. (laughs) Boy, that big palooka, he ruined the whole scene. That's nothing to what you ruined, dearie. Just look at your shirt. What's the matter with it? Well, that's the first combination salad I ever saw with sleeves. (laughs) And why are you holding your elbow? Oh, I cracked it when I fell over the chair. Just temporary. I can get it fixed. Come in. How do you do, Mrs. McGee? Hello, McGee. Well, Mayor La Trivia. Don't pay any attention to McGee's looks, Mr. Mayor. I never do. (laughs) He had a little accident in the kitchen. Yeah, I was... uh... Hey, look who La Trivia's got with him, Molly. Hi there, little girl. Hi, Mr. McGee. Well, I didn't know you were a pal of the mayor's, sis. Ain't you starting to round up the boats kind of early to trivia? (laughs) (laughs) Excuse me, please. I'll go call the camera shop while you talk to the mayor, McGee. Uh, Certainly, Mrs. McGee. McGee, I was walking past your house, and I found this child making marks on your front sidewalk with a piece of red chalk. Marks on our sidewalk? Hmm? Wow. Well, now, suppose you explain yourself, sis. Well, gee, mister, I was just helping my daddy. How? Hmm? I says how. How what? (laughs) How were you helping your daddy? Drawing chalk marks on your sidewalk. I know that, but what's that got to do with how... You try it, Latrivia. Uh Oh, very well. Now, listen, little girl. Defacing community property is a misdemeanor. Who's she? Who's who? Misdemeanor. She isn't anybody. She's... Now, listen. 
Marking up a sidewalk is very rude. It's unsightly. I know it. Then why did you do it? I was helping my daddy. How were you helping your daddy by drawing chalk marks on Mr. McGee's sidewalk? Yes. Yes, what? Yes, I was. I'm in... Okay, McGee, take it. (laughs) Now, sis, let's be sensible. Did your old man, I mean, did your daddy tell you to mark up my sidewalk? No, but somebody had to do it, I betcha. Why? Hmm? I says, why did somebody have to do it? Because my daddy said so, I betcha. No, we're getting somewhere, McGee. Well, I don't know where. Now, just what did your daddy say that made you mark up his sidewalk? Well, my mommy and my daddy are going to have a party. And they were talking about who was going to be at the party. Yes, 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 yes. And my mommy said, how about the McGee? Yes. And my daddy said, no, sir. We got to draw the line at the McGee's. And so I ran out and did it. (laughs) Take it, La Trivia. So long, McGee. Men sing What's Buzzin', Cousin? What's buzzin', Cousin? What goes on with that look in your eyes? What's buzzin', Cousin? Does it mean what I think it implies? What's tickin', Chicken? What gives out with that cute little grin? What's knittin', Kitten? How's the bound of my out am I in? Oh, come on, let's have our fling. We know that spring has sprung a hung. Ask your mother to hold her tongue. She had a fella when she was young. What's buzzing, cousin? What you say to a cuddle or two? What's cutting, button? What's dunking, punkin'? What's buzzing with you, buzzing with you, cousin? Baby, what's what with you? You got a fatal, fatal, fatal fascination. fascination. It's a wonder I'm not under observation. What's yummy with you, mommy? Here's a cue for such a beautiful thrill. What's a cooking, pretty looking? Would you trade and I won't, for I will. Wish I knew just how to say, come kiss me in Hawaiian. Give me a poo on the honey, how I really wanna. You can't kill a guy for trying. What's buzzing, cousin? You got him for the capital. Ooh, what's ducky wucky? What's hotsy totsy? What's tooty fruity? What's boogie woogie? Baby, what's fun with you? so fast, Molly. Don't forget I got a sprained ankle. No, I'm not forgetting your ankle, dearie. Or your cracked elbow, or your cut neck, or your lame back, or your loose teeth, or your bruised ribs. <laughs> Did I cover everything? You forgot my skin knee. <laughs> well, it's only another block to the camera shop. That's good. When did they say the films will be ready? Well, they're rushing them. I told the man you wanted to, to send them to Hollywood. Oh, what did he say? Well, he just made a funny noise and hung up. <laughs> Are you suffering terribly, dearie? I sure am, but it was worth it. If these films don't prove I'm a marvelous comedian, I'll eat my hat. Say, what size hat do you wear? Seven and a quarter. Why? Well, I'm going to weave you one out of spaghetti or something. I always like to see you enjoy what you eat. Look, McGee, here comes Mrs. Uppington. Oh, boy, get a load of that lid. Does Ruth Goldberg own a hat shop? (laughs) She never got that monstrosity out of a hat shop. That's an old bird's nest built by a cross-eyed blue jay. (laughs) I never saw... Oh, hello, Abigail, darling. Where did you get that lovely hat? (laughs) Oh, how do you do, my dear? And Mr. McGee. Hi, Upsy. Uh, Do you really like it, Mrs. McGee? I never saw anything like it. Uh, Me either. Though once when I was looking at a drop of swamp water through a microscope. (laughs) Tell me, 
Abigail, darling. Is that an original creation? Oh, but of course, my dear. I have the most marvelous milliner. You must let me take you down there sometime, Mrs. McGee. She could do wonders for you. Uh-huh. I've often remarked that if you would only wear some decent... Uh, I mean, uh, you could be utterly charming except for your... Never mind, um... Abigail. I get it. But you know, I'm awfully hard to please. And you, <laughs> you lucky girl, they can throw any old thing on you. <laughs> and they usually do. I'd give four bits for a handful of catnip. <laughs> of course, Mrs. McGee, my milliner might be just a trifle uh, beyond your, uh, well, that is, she's horribly expensive, you oh, know. Oh, I can see that, Abigail. I could never afford to wear the kind of hats you do. Well, I mean, of course, that anyone in my social position... Can must... get away with almost anything. <laughs> Isn't it the truth? When you've had enough, folks, holler and I'll toss in the towel. <laughs> In fact, Mrs. McGee, I was telling my modiste about you, too. She insists that I bring you in. She has an amazing knack at draping difficult figures. Well, uh, she must have, Abigail. And if she can do as much for me as she's done for you, well, believe me, somebody ought to give her the business. (laughs) Yes, she will appreciate it. Why, good heavens, Mr. McGee, I never noticed. What's that? How did you acquire all those bandages and splints? Oh. What happened? Oh, well, God. he's suffering from a career end collision, Abigail. <laughs> we'll explain it to you later. In the meantime, let you and I go shopping together sometime. I know some dandy places. <laughs> all right, my dear. We'll go to my favorite shop first and take in the rummage sales on the way home. So oh, goodbye. <laughs> Burns me up, McGee. She tries to give the impression that she has more of everything than anybody else has. Yeah, she's right if you're talking about chins. <laughs> well, come on, you poor lad. Do you feel all right? Frankly, no. I don't. I feel like... Well, a... hello there, Mrs. McGee. <laughs> hello, Mr. McGee. Oh, hello, Mr. Wimple. Hi, Wimple, chimp. Which way did my wife go? Oh, what do you mean, Mr. Wimple? We haven't seen your wife. Well, my goodness, Mr. McGee. You mean you got so bruised and battered all by yourself? Well, we were taking some old movies, Mr. Wimple, and McGee took a couple of bad falls. Wait till you see the prints. You'll think they're terrific. Sweetie Face and I took some home movies last week ourselves. She was making some educational pictures for the police department. Jiu-jitsu, you know. Uh, Black and white? No. Black and blue. Clear up to all you in the pictures. (laughs) They were black and white. (laughs) You sure take a lot of punishment for a little guy, Wimp. I wish I could get over the effects as quick as you do. Oh, it's just a matter of regular exercise. <laughs> uh, Mr. McGee, every morning before breakfast, I take a two-mile run. Oh, do you really? Where do you run? Oh, just around the dining room table. <laughs> Sweetie face is so irritable when she gets up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she must have caught you this morning, Wimp. You're walking kind of stiff. Oh, I'm just suffering from housemaid's knee, Mr. McGee. <laughs> Housemaid's knee. Yes. Last night I cracked in some mud and Sweetie Face mopped up the kitchen floor with me. <laughs> well, I simply must be getting home, folks. I've got to help Sweetie Face with her homework. What's she studying? Part 4, Section 6 of the new police manual. How to throw tear gas bombs. Oh. If you're going past this evening, stop in and we'll all have a good cry. <laughs> certainly has what it takes, hasn't he, McGee? Yeah, but I'd hate to have to take what he gets. <laughs> oh, here's the home movie shop, Molly. Well, hold the door for me, will you? All right. I don't want to bump this elbow again. Uh, yes, sir, what can I... Oh, you poor chap, let me help you to a chair. Here. Thanks, but I, I was kind of wore out. Yes, off. I've got to get him home to bed as soon as we get through here. Now, uh, what could I do for you folks? Well, I- I'm Mr. McGee, bud. Remember? You sent me off that camera in those films. Oh, yes. We picked them up a couple of hours ago, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, just a minute, now. see if the prints are ready. McGee, you look awfully pale. Can you hold out till we get home? Oh, sure. Wait till them Hollywood guys take a gander at them prints. 
They'll tumble all over themselves trying to sign me up. Oh, Mr. McGee. Yeah, bud, you got my films? Let me see them. Hey, you got a projection room here? Where... Just a minute, please. You can't expect to get them till you pay for them, McGee. Oh, excuse me. Oh, you pay him, Molly. I'm too stiff to reach into my pocket. <laughs> you usually are. <laughs> How much do we owe you, sir? Uh, $3 for camera rental, $18 for film, and nothing for the advice. What advice? McGee, the next time you try to take pictures, first take the rubber cap off the lens. <laughs> Why, bud? Your films are all blank. Oh, my. Awesome. <laughs> your present kitchen linoleum. If it's fairly new, you'll certainly want to take good care of it and make it last a long time. If it's old, all the more reason now for treating it properly. Linoleum should not be cleaned by the old-fashioned scrubbing method because continuous scrubbing only ruins it. It should be kept clean with a floor polish that also protects it. And that polish is Johnson's self-polishing glow coat. Glow coat guards linoleum and other floor surfaces against wear and dirt, prolongs their life. You'll notice when you try Johnson's Glow Coat that it has a lasting luster, a smooth, even surface that doesn't chip because the Glow Coat film is flexible, not brittle. And you'll see that Glow Coat is economical, that a little goes a long way. These are just some of the reasons we say there's only one Johnson self-polishing Glow Coat. Try it, won't you? Turn over, McGee, whilst I rub some more liniment on your back. No. Oh, okay. You think you'll ever go on with your movie career, dearie? No. i just been thinking, Molly. Remember that newsreel we saw last week of Mussolini making a speech on that balcony? Yes. I could never be that funny, could I? No. That's what I thought. Good night. Good night, all. <laughs> This is Harlow Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson's Wax Finishes for Home and Industry, inviting you to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. Don't put it off any longer. Decide right now to take better care of your car's paint job. It's so easy now, thanks to Johnson's Car New, the sensational auto polish that both cleans and polishes in one application. Two jobs at once in quick time. No program of better car maintenance is complete without looking after the outside as well as what's under the hood. Buy a can of Johnson's Car New very soon from your regular Johnson's Wax dealer, auto supply store, or service station. Car New is spelled C-A-R-N-U. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Thanks for listening to Hojo Radio. We have more classic radio coming your way next. I'm Ali Soap, your beauty host and luster cream shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair, bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks teaches English at Madison High. Well, like many other romantically inclined people... She sent the object of her affections, Madison's bashful biologist, Philip Boynton, an unsigned card for Valentine's Day. And then she sat down to wait for his reply. It wasn't that his reply was long in coming. It just didn't come at all. (laughs) Knowing Mr. Boynton, I wasn't too surprised that he forgot about Valentine's Day, but I was determined to change the locale of our next date. For the past six weeks, we had spent every Friday afternoon at the zoo. Now, I am definitely not anti-animal, but I am a school teacher, and hence, after spending three hours in the monkey house, I just can't afford to buy taboo by the court. <laughs> I was brooding about it in the school cafeteria on Friday when Harriet Conklin walked over. Mind if I sit down with you, Miss Brooks? Not at all, Harriet. But don't you usually have lunch with Walter Denton? Oh, yes, I do. But he's manager of the basketball team, you know, and he's giving the boys an extra skull practice. Really? Whose skull are they using today? I hope you're not expecting Mr. Boynton to have lunch with you, Miss Brooks. He told me he was eating his lunch in the laboratory because he didn't want to leave McDougal alone. Oh, don't tell me that frog is sick again. Not actually sick. It's just spring fever or something. It's kind of fun to have lunch without any men around anyway. Don't you think so, Miss Brooks? Well, yes and no. 
What do you mean, yes or no? No. <laughs> we haven't had a real woman-to-woman -woman talk in a long time. You know, Walter Denton is crazier about me than ever. All I have to do is whistle and he comes running. Really? It's the only way to train them. That's what you ought to try with Mr. Boynton. I have, but every time I whistle, he opens his lunchbox. <laughs> Sometimes his dog-like affection and constant worship becomes absolutely cloying. Well, I wish Mr. Boynton would cloy me once in a while. <laughs> By the way, Harriet, when Walter takes you out on a date, where do you usually go? Oh, all sorts of places, Miss Brooks. A drive in the country or, or a long walk in the park. Or sometimes we go to a movie and hold hands. Do you ever go to the zoo? The zoo? Oh, gosh, No. Except when Mr. Boynton takes us there for his monthly lecture. That's where I've got an edge on you kids. I hear it every week. <laughs> but Mr. Boynton takes you to the movies once in a while, doesn't he? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, we went last week. Was it romantic? Oh, extremely. We stood in a crowd of people behind a velvet rope for a while, and then an usher said, there's one down front. Yes? That was the last I saw of Mr. Boynton for three hours. <laughs> I got a seat in the balcony. Oh, golly, that's a shame, Miss Brooks. You couldn't hold hands at all, could you? Not even with the long gloves I was wearing. <laughs> but about those Fridays in the monkey house, Harriet... I'm it... surprised at you, Miss Brooks. You don't really let Mr. Boynton take you to the monkey house every week, do you? Well, I think it's the monkey house. It can't be the Taj Mahal with all those bananas. Uh... <laughs> well, well, if it isn't Madison High's Ferris. May I join this charming bevy of pulchritude? Why, Walter, what a lovely speech. Yes, you are a delightful child, Walter. But if you'll excuse me, Miss Brooks, I'd like to get my entree at the steam table. Oh, can I be of service, Fair Harriet? I'll gladly fetch what you want. No, thank you. But if you'll sit up nicely when I return, I'll pat you on the head. Arf, arf. <laughs> can I get you anything, Miss Brooks? No, thanks, Harriet. Just bring back a roast beef bone and a can of strong heart. <laughs> Okay, Harriet. You know, I think it's wonderful the way you kids get along. You're very fond of Harriet, aren't you, Walter? Very. A plus which Harriet's the principal's daughter and I'm manager of the basketball team. And there are things that I can accomplish quicker if I can get to Mr. Conklin without having to go through regulation channels all the time. What's good about getting to Mr. Conklin so fast? Well, I like getting things done fast that need getting done fast. Uh, like New Jersey's, for instance. Like New Jersey's what, for instance? <laughs> Not New Jersey's anything. New Jersey's for the basketball team. Oh, we need them badly. You do at that. The ones the team wore in their last game looked awfully fuzzy. They didn't wear any in their last game. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure the new ones will come through all right. I'm taking Harriet out on a date tonight, and I can bring it up casually when I see Mr. Conklin at his house. I don't like to suggest a career for you, Walter, but I have a feeling you're going to kiss an awful lot of babies before you're much older. <laughs> oh, I could never be a politician. I'm too sincere. Oh, but why are we talking about me? You seem to have a problem of your own on your mind, Miss Brooks. Is it that obvious, Walter? I have been thinking about Mr. Boynton, but only in connection with getting him out of the zoo and into my parlor. Hmm, that shouldn't be too tough. What kind of a web are you spinning? Web? Look, Miss Brooks, at the risk of feeling like a traitor to a fellow male, I'll help you plot Mr. Boynton's overthrow. But frankly, I'm kind of hungry right now. Then why don't you eat, Walter, and we can finish building the bomb after lunch. <laughs> oh, say, there's Mr. LeBlanc, the new French teacher. Oh, he ought to know plenty about romance. He's a real Frenchman. I'll call him over. Don't and... you dare, Walter. When I'm ready to take my case to the United Nations, I'll let you know. <laughs> Besides, I've seen Mr. LeBlanc on dates with Miss Enright lately. So what? Miss Enright goes on dates with anybody. Gosh, every time she sees Mr. Boynton, she makes goo-goo eyes at him. That's not nice, Walter. Miss Enright's eyes are always that way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's unethical. Unethical is better than lonesome, Miss Brooks. Oh, Mr. LeBlanc. Walter, please. You I... call me, Walter? Yes. Would you be kind enough to come over here a minute? I'd like to talk to you about something very important. Well, you better talk to him, anyway, Walter, because I refuse I to... I bring my coffee along and... Oh... How do you, Miss Brooks? Fine. How do you, Mr. LeBlanc? <laughs> what, uh, what did you want to talk to me about, Walter? Oh, it isn't important. I'll see you later. Now, that's what I call a real subtle maneuver. <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's a funny boy, no? No. <laughs> well, 
Now, now it's just you and I, Miss Brooks, eh? I'm afraid it's just you, Mr. LeBlanc. I've got to see Mr. Conklin about something. Mr. Conklin? Please, Miss Brooks, I think Mr. Conklin's a fine principal. But do you have to mention him during the lunch period? <laughs> You've got something there. I guess it can wait a while. It's only a question of giving him my weekly dollar. Do you owe him a weekly dollar? For what? It's a long and grim story, but I think I can boil it down to the repulsive essentials. A couple of weeks ago, I took an electric heater of his, connected it in Mr. Boynton's laboratory on an overloaded circuit, and shorted the building, started a small fire, and ruined the heater. Why do you do that? I like sirens. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't do it purposely, Mr. LeBlanc. It was an accident, one for which I'm paying at the rate of a dollar a week. And today's dollar day at Madison. <laughs> Well, that is too bad, Miss Brooks, but it is not money that causes you to look the way you do today. Is there a sign on my forehead? How do I look today? Well, there are only two things that can make a woman have the look you have on your face. Uh, one is an affair of the heart. The other is the meatballs in this cafeteria. <laughs> <laughs> but, but neither of them is insurable, eh? I'm sure. You haven't eaten those meatballs lately. <laughs> Look, it's nice of you to try and cheer me up, Mr. LeBlanc. Oh, please, but... call me Paul. And I'm not trying to cheer you up. I'm trying to help you. First of all, tell me this. Did you receive any messages on Valentine's Day? Oh, scared. I got one from Zimmerman's Bakery, one from the finance company, a lovely little card from Bertie's Bicycle Shop, in the shape of a pump, that one was. <laughs> and, uh, oh, yes, a dandy little poem from Sam, our neighborhood scissor sharpener. I think I remember that one. It went, uh... I've applied my grindstone to shears both old and new, but I never met a scissors one half as sharp as you. <laughs> Wasn't that a peachy sentiment for Valentine's Day? Oh, uh, quite amusing, yes, but not to you, I'm afraid, because you're not in love with Sam the Scissor or Bertie the Bicycle. No, my problem is Boynton the Biology. <laughs> Miss Wilkes, since we have taken me into your confidence, I would like to make a suggestion. You must play... How do you say in this country? Uh, uh, you must play difficult to acquire. Difficult to acquire? Ah. Oh, you mean hard to get. Mm. Uh -huh. Precisely. <laughs> now tell me, tell me the truth. When Mr. Boynton asks you for an engagement, do you ever say no? Well, no. But it isn't just because of Mr. Boynton. I'd hate to disappoint 400 monkeys. <laughs> that is, I haven't gone out with him much lately at all. Because he do not ask you. Like that. I am glad. Miss Brooks, there's one way to get a man interested that never fails. You must make him gel out. <laughs> I've tried that, Mr. LeBlanc, but he just, just doesn't gel out very easily. <laughs> ah, yes, but you've tried it only once. That is not enough. How do the big American advertising work? A repetition over and over the same thing. What is it you hear on the radio all the time? Smoker Benny. <laughs> Get him again. Smoker Benny. <laughs> if you repeat this often enough, you know what happens. Yeah, Jack gets pretty burned up. <laughs> no, Mr. LeBlanc, I'm afraid Mr. Boynton is too wrapped up in a frog to pay any attention to me. Oh, but of course. I forget Monsieur Le Frog. Mm. You know, in France, we have a proverb. Le chemin au cœur d'homme et par son grinelle. Translation, the way to a man's heart is to his frog. That's <laughs> oh, very touching, but I don't see what it has oh, to do with... Oh, it's so simple, really. Here you have a man with his little pet, Monsieur Le Frog. And here you have a woman with her pet, Mademoiselle La Frog. Now, we convince the man that Monsieur Le Frog is lonesome. And where can his poor little frog find companionship? With Mademoiselle La Frog. And when the two little frogs are together, where are the man and the woman? Pricing junior beds for tadpoles. <laughs> no. No, Miss Brooks, no. The man and the woman are also together. Now you know, Miss Brooks, what you have to do to get Mr. Boynton to be a bat to your dog. No? Yes, I've got to build a better frog trap. <laughs> Look, Mr. Le Frog, uh, LeBlanc. <laughs> this idea is oh, a little impractical. coming, Miss Brooks. Oh, you look better already. Hello, Walter. Mr. LeBlanc is quite an idea man. <laughs> we were just discussing a really fantastic scheme. 
Not only fantastic, but ridiculous and absurd. Walter. Yes, Miss Brooks? Run down to Peterson's Pet Shop and get me a female frog. <laughs> Starring Eve Arden will continue in just a moment, but first, here is Vern Smith. The makers of Palm Olive Soap are giving away $100,000 in prizes. First prize, $49,000, plus over 4,900 other cash prizes in the big 49 Gold Rush Contest. Hundreds will strike it rich in this exciting Gold Rush Contest. One of them may be you. It's easy to enter. Just finish this sentence in 25 additional words or less. I like Palm Olive Soap because... That's all. Just 25 words or less to finish the sentence, I like palm olive soap because. Then mail your entry right away along with a palm olive soap wrapper. Try for your share of that $100,000 in prizes right now. Your chance of winning $49,000 is as good as anyone. Get entry blank with complete rules from your dealer or write your completed sentence on plain paper. Include your name and address and dealer's name and address. Mail with one palm olive soap wrapper for each entry to Gold Rush Contest, Box 49, New York 8, New York. Better write that down. Gold Rush Contest, Box 49, New York 8, New York. Enter as often as you like, including one wrapper with each entry. Get palm olive soap right away to help win a lovelier complexion and try for your share of the $100,000 in cash prizes. <laughs> Well, I gave Walter my last dollar to buy a female frog, and while he was out getting it, I took advantage of a free period to visit Mr. Boynton in his laboratory. Hello, Mr. Boynton. Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. I just dropped in to say hello, Mr. Boynton. Hello. Well, goodbye, Mr. Boynton. <laughs> oh, don't go yet. I've just been examining McDougal. You know, my frog. He's got me a little worried. He's way off his feet, and we'll, we'll look at him. <laughs> Don't you think his eyes pop out more than usual? What did you say? I, I said, don't you think his eyes pop out more than usual? Yes. For a minute, I thought he was Eddie Cantor. <laughs> Hi, Mac. <laughs> of course, you know what's wrong with Mac, don't you? Uh, no, Miss Brooks, I don't. Well, it's getting very close to spring, and it's just... After all, you raised him from a tadpole, and it's only natural that you should still think of him as your baby, but he's a big boy now. <laughs> what do you mean, Miss Brooks? Well, just this, Mr. Boynton. Did it ever occur to you that Mac gets lonesome all alone in that cage? Oh, I let him out of the cage quite often. He hops all over the lab. But what good is that? He hasn't got any friends here. Oh, I don't know. There are always a number of guinea pigs around. Of course, he doesn't pay much attention to them. Well, naturally. Guinea pigs make fine friends for other guinea pigs. A frog might crave a different kind of companionship. Oh, well, what about me? I'm very close to McDougal. <laughs> I've been his constant companion. If I were a frog, I don't think I'd consider that the ideal arrangement either. No, I think I'd want something a little more frog-like. What are you getting at, Miss Brooks? Look, did you ever sit down and tell McDougal about the birds and bees? Well, what does he want with birds and bees? He won't even make friends with guinea pigs. <laughs> well, let me put it this way. Mrs. Davis, my landlady, has a cat named Minerva. Now, around this time of the year, Minerva keeps us both awake half the night with an almost incessant yowling. Well, have you tried giving her a saucer of milk? That's not what she's yowling about, Mr. Barton. <laughs> Very yes, I know. And believe me, if I thought it would quiet her down, I'd give her an autographed picture of Elsie the cow. But it won't. She's yowling because she's lonely. Why, Miss Brooks, I didn't know you were so aware of these biological manifestations. Where did you learn all this? My mama done told me. <laughs> I mean, I found out about a lot of things since... Since I've acquired my pet frog. Pet female frog, that is. Oh, you have a pet frog, Miss Brooks? What's her name? Her name? Uh, Millie. Millie? Yes, from the picture, The Mating of Millie. <laughs> oh, she's awfully cute, too. <laughs> well, you think Mac almost understood what you were talking about? Well, don't think for a minute he doesn't. What do you say, Mac? Would you like to come over and play with Millie this afternoon? <laughs> Hooray! Today you are a man, Frog. Oh, this is amazing, Miss Brooks. <laughs> Look, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you if... Uh, uh, shine what... up your hope chest, Millie. Here it comes. 
Uh, I'd like to ask you, Miss Brooks, uh, how about a, a double date? That is, if you, well, if it isn't too much trouble. Shall we say my place for tea? Splendid. Just bring a pogo stick and a deck of cards, Mr. Barnhill. A pogo stick and cards? Yes, while Mac and Millie play gin, you and I can have a hopping contest. <laughs> oh, l'amour, l'amour. Excuse me, uh, could you come over here to the door a minute, Miss Brooks? I've got to get to my next class. Oh, certainly, Walter. I'll just be a minute, Mr. Barnhill. Did you get it, Walter? Yes, it's in this paper bag, Miss Brooks. Here. Thanks. That's okay. I hope it works, Miss Brooks. Well, I'll see you in English. What's in the bag, Miss Brooks? This bag? Oh, just a roast beef sandwich Walter brought me. Well, it's a pretty active one. Hey, look out, it's falling out of the bag. Here, here, let me see that. Yeah, I've got him. Oh, Miss Brooks, do you realize what you've got here? Sure, an F-R-O-G. I didn't want to mention it in front of Mac until we got home. Oh, but this I... is a male frog. You, you can always tell. Because in the species Dimorphognathus from West Africa, there's a very apparent dimorphism in the dentition. The male's being provided with a series of large serrated teeth in the lower jaw, which in the female is edentulous. Well, slap me with a wet lily pad. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Boynton. I've got to be running along now. Oh, why, Miss Brooks? I've got to see a boy about a frog. Here, here, I'll put it back in the bag for you. Now, just hold the top tighter and he won't get away again. I, I still don't comprehend why you got this male frog. Well, I didn't know how you and McDougal would react to the idea of keeping Millie company, so I thought I'd play safe and get this one, too. Ooh, ooh. Oh, I don't think Mac likes the idea very much. Uh, don't be jealous, Mac. Let him live his own life. <laughs> we better not come over this afternoon, Miss Brooks. I'm afraid it'd only confuse Mac. Look, Mr. Boynton, I don't care if a frog wants to play hard to get. But there's something I'd like you to remember. Well, what's that, Miss Brooks? Well, I don't want to sound too much like an English teacher, but when one plays hard to get too often, one sometimes don't get got. <laughs> I'll just take this frog into my room and see how Walter happened to make such well, an awful... Well, there you are, Connie. I've been looking all over for you. Mrs. Davis, what are you doing in the hallowed halls of Madison High? Well, I know how you've been waiting for a Valentine card from Mr. Boynton, and I just had to tell you that all hope isn't lost. But today is Friday, Mrs. Davis. That's just it, Connie. Some mail came this morning that should have been delivered Monday. A Valentine? No, a bill from the gas company. <laughs> now, that's the nicest bit of sentiment since Sam scissors. <laughs> they say that if we don't pay it immediately, they'll shut off the gas. Just my luck with Mr. Boynton coming over for tea. It couldn't be the electric company promising to shut off all the lights. No, son. <laughs> and I'm short some money or I wouldn't bother you in school like this. You know, Minerva cost me a lot lately with her special diet. No. Just how much do you need, Mrs. Davis? Well, if you'll forgive a slang expression, one greenback will do it. I just happen to have one on me. He's in this bag here. <laughs> now, don't look so alarmed, Mrs. Davis. I'm not cracking up completely. Look, just take this frog back to Peterson's Pet Shop and they'll refund my dollar. I'll explain why I bought the frog later. You don't have to explain anything to me, Connie. If you want a frog for a pet, it's perfectly all right. But why are you giving it back? To keep the gas on, for one thing. <laughs> Besides, it's a male frog and I've got to have a female. Well, you don't have to spend any money for that. I'll get you a female frog in the park. I never thought of that. I'd certainly appreciate it, Mrs. Davis. Will you bring it back with you after you've paid the gas bill? Certainly, Connie. And I just know that you'll be very happy together. And so, class, you are to have these compositions ready by next Tuesday. That's the end of the period. Class dismissed. Except Walter Denton. Come up to my desk, Walter. Oh, I'm glad you asked me, Miss Brooks. I wanted to explain about that frog. You see, Mr. Peterson was out to lunch when I got to the pet shop, so I got you one out of the park pond. But was it all right? I mean, was she a girl? No, Walter. She was a boy with big serrated teeth in her lower jaw. And what about the dollar I gave you? Oh, here it is, Miss Brooks. <laughs> I didn't have time to give it to you before. Thanks, Walter. That'll be all for now, then. I'd better get over to Mr. Conklin's office and make my payment on that heater. Well, here I am, Connie. Hello, Walter. Hello, Mrs. Davis. Goodbye, Mrs. Davis. Well, what do you think, Connie? Mr. Peterson didn't sell Walter that frog at all. I know, Mrs. Davis. But he said it was a very good specimen and traded me a lovely female for him. And instead of giving us any money, he promised that when our frog becomes a husband, we'll get the pick of the litter. <laughs> I can hardly wait, but where's the female frog? Oh, I had that in a paper bag and it seemed very insecure, so I put the frog in a desk across the hall. 
Nobody saw me. Across the hall? But that's Mr. Conklin's office. Mrs. Davis, you wait right here. And if I'm not back in five minutes, call the coroner. Now, what is it? Come in. Oh, it's you, Miss Brooks. Please transact whatever business you have in this office in a hurry. I've got an appointment with the doctor. The doctor? What's the matter, Mr. Conklin? Oh, just a checkup. A lot of nonsense, if you ask me. My wife's been telling him all sorts of foolishness about the state of my nerves. To hear her tell it, I've not only got the world's highest blood pressure, but I'm jumpy, anxious, overwrought, but irritable. Mr. Conklin... Don't interrupt! <laughs> and I'm ill-tempered. <laughs> now, what is it you want? I just want to give you a dollar towards the heater I accidentally injured. Here. Oh, thanks. Well, sit down for a minute and I'll give you a receipt. I've got a regular Board of Education receipt book around here somewhere. But, Mr. Conklin, your desk drawer... Please, Miss Brooks. <laughs> Don't tell me where I keep my things. Of course it's in the desk drawer. Let's see now. Book should be right over here next to this blotter. Oh, that's funny. That's it. Oh, here it is over by this frog. <laughs> Hello, little frog. Miss <laughs> Brooks, it won't take a moment to get the receipt... Never mind that. What is this frog doing in my desk? Calm down, Mr. Conklin. Ours isn't the only school that's overcrowded. <laughs> I thought you'd never get home from school, Connie. How long did Mr. Conklin spend bowling you out? Oh, it seemed like hours, but actually it was only a few minutes. You should have been there when Mr. Conklin and Millie here faced each other across his desk drawer. Poor thing, her heart hasn't stopped beating yet. Mm. Neither is yours, Connie. You're as jumpy as Minerva. Are you sure Mr. Boynton said he'd be over for tea? Oh, definitely, Mrs. Davis. I told him all about how lonely Minerva was and compared her to McDougal. So he's bringing Mac over to meet Millie. It's the first time in weeks we've had a date away from the zoo. Oh, oh is that Mr. Boynton now? I'll go make the tea, Connie, and you receive him alone. All right, Mrs. Davis, coming. Well, it's nice to see you boys. Come in. Let's go into the living room. Oh, thank you, Miss Brooks. Uh, here's something for Millie. It's from McDougal. Oh, I'll open it for her. Well, wasn't that thoughtful of Mac, Millie? Just what you needed, a clump of wilted lettuce. Here, I'll put it in this little box I keep her in. <clears throat> oh, I guess Mac wants to see what Millie looks like. Oh, of course. Here, just hold him up. There we are. <clears throat> This is Mac, Millie. <laughs> I think she likes him, but Miss Brooks, didn't you say you had a cat on the premises? That's right, Minerva. She usually sleeps in the piano during the day. Here, Minerva, come out of the piano. Oh, well, she'll probably wake up in a little while. Sit down, Mr. Boynton. Oh, before I do, don't you want to open this big box? For me? Well, what in the world can this be? <laughs> It's a cat, Miss Brooks. I brought him over to keep Minerva company. <laughs> well, here comes Minerva now. <laughs> like each other, too. Miss <laughs> Brooks, Miss Brooks, where are you going? You know where I'm going. I'll meet you by the third monkey from the left. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks returns in just a moment, but first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight, show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a luster cream shampoo. Only luster cream brings you K. Dumas' magic formula blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Gives loveliness lather even in hardest water. Glamorizes your hair as you wash it. Luster cream, not a soap, not a liquid but a dainty cream shampoo. Leaves hair fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen. Soft, manageable. Gives new beauty to all hairdos or permanents. Four-ounce jar, one dollar. Smaller sizes, either tubes or jars. Tonight, 
Try Luster Cream Shampoo and be a dream girl, dream girl, beautiful Luster Cream girl. You owe your crowning glory to a Luster Cream Shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, Mr. Boynton finally took McDougal and his cat and left. Mrs. Davis and I had dinner, and then we sat down in the living room to spend a quiet evening. Minerva went back to sleep, and everything was nice and peaceful when the phone rang. Lie down, Minerva. It's not for you. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Minerva. It is for you. <laughs> Next week, tune in to another Our Miss Brooks show brought to you by Parmelly Soap, Your Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, written and directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Here's good shaving news. Three men out of every four can get more comfortable, actually smoother shaves with Palmolive Brushless Shaving Cream. This is not just a claim. Here's the proof. 1,297 men tried the Palmolive brushless way to shave described on the tube. And no matter how they shaved before, three men out of every four got more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Try Palmolive brushless yourself. See if you don't get more comfortable, actually smoother shaves the proved Palmolive brushless way. For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North. The exciting, fun-packed adventures of an amateur detective and his beautiful wife. Tune in Tuesday evenings over most of these stations. And be with us again next week at this time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Tom Olive Soap, Your Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, was as grateful as any other teacher for the Washington's birthday holiday observed last week. And far be it for me to criticize the actions of the father of our country, but I can't help wishing that he had taken more than just one day to be born. <laughs> of course, the one day off was better than nothing, but I must admit I looked forward to a weekend of not teaching with considerable anticipation. It isn't that I'm not fond of my pupils. I think they're a wonderful horde of kids. <laughs> But after the events of last Friday, I seriously considered giving up teaching and taking a course in rug tatting or peanut art. <laughs> it started Friday after school. Mr. Boynton, the usually bashful biologist, displayed a surprisingly different attitude when I entered his laboratory. Hello, Mr. Boynton. Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. I was just going to come down to your room. Oh, then I'll get back there right away. I wouldn't want to miss you. <laughs> Well, I guess what I have to say can be said here, all right. Although I can't help wishing the surroundings were different. Different? Yes, Miss Brooks, more romantic. Romantic? Mm-hmm. I know I haven't been the most aggressive chap in the world, but I do think of other things besides my biological experiments. Things that are, well, more personal. Personal? Yes. <laughs> well, things that a, a man thinks about a woman sometimes, whether she's a fellow teacher or not. Or not? <laughs> Just move my needle a notch to the right <laughs> Mr. Boynton, what is it you're trying to tell me, I like to think? <laughs> well, it, it's just that, like I said before, I wish the surroundings were different I wish we were in a blue lagoon somewhere with a soft breeze blowing through your hair and... Oh, but we're not I can take care of that, Mr. Boynton <laughs> <laughs> Of course, I, I don't know why we have to be in a blue lagoon. I guess I just feel more confident when I'm over water. Well, hop up on this stool and I'll fill a pan. <laughs> I mean, please continue, Mr. Boynton. 
Well, as you know, Miss Brooks, I've been coaching the basketball team while Mr. Haney's been ill, and, well, we've been lucky enough to win the championship in our particular conference. Yes, I know. We've been invited to play in the state championships at Martinsville. The entire squad leaves this evening. We won't be back until next week. I, I just want you to know that, well... Yes, Mr. Boynton? It's terribly important that we win the championship. Oh, you'll win it, Mr. Barton. But what else were you going to say? Well, I'm not so sure we'll win it. After all, we're playing a round robin. Well, I bet you could spot him four worms and beat him easily. <laughs> I know you're kidding me, Miss Brooks, but I don't mind. You know, now that I'm leaving town, I've come to realize certain things about our relationship. At last. Formal recognition that we have a relationship. <laughs> well, without getting too basic too quickly, I'd like to state that in the past, whenever the situation seems auspicious for declaring certain emotional reactions I've felt, upon finding myself in close proximity to you, that is, some outward manifestation seems to... Pardon me, Mr. Boynton. Couldn't you get a little more basic more quickly? <laughs> What I'm trying to say, Miss Brooks, is that there always seems to be some sort of interruption when I want to talk to you about certain things. What kind of interruption? I see what you mean. Come in. <laughs> well, Boynton, as principal of Madison High, I... Oh, I thought you were alone. We were for a minute. <laughs> that is, uh, I was just saying goodbye to Mr. Boynton, Mr. Conklin. I see, Miss Brooks. And have you finished saying goodbye? No, Mr. Conklin, we haven't. This boy's been taking brave shots. <laughs> uh, what I mean to say, sir, is that we can finish talking after you've spoken to me. Very well. I simply dropped in to wish you good luck with the team, Mr. Boynton. Remember, by winning the championship cup, you not only honor yourself and the athletes involved, but you bring further glory to the already hallowed name of Madison High. Glory and prestige. Fame and all... How much have you bet on the game, Mr. Conklin? Just, uh, just a fin. I was... No! <laughs> you know I never bet. I... It's just that we must get that cut. Well, don't worry, Mr. Conklin. We've got the high-scoring forward of the conference on our team, you know. I see. And how's this boy's condition? Tip-top, I trust? Well, he's six foot five inches tall, so his top would be hard to tip. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's a joke, sir. Thank you. <laughs> By the way, Miss Brooks, is this the boy we transferred from Miss Enright's English class to yours? Yes, sir. Well, tell me, how's his state of mind? What there is of it is quite happy. <laughs> well, I know he's not a brilliant student, but now that he's in your class, Miss Brooks, I'm sure he'll improve. Uh, from what I hear, the boy's an all-round athlete. I want him eligible for other sports during the coming term. Well, I'll do whatever I can, Mr. Conklin. Of course, it's difficult to give a test without any questions in it, but... Uh... <laughs> we'll get him through all right, Mr. Conklin. Good, good. Well, I'll be running along now. Best of luck, Boynton. Bring back that cup. Let's see now. Where were we? Oh, I know. You were telling me something personal. Well, I wouldn't like to repeat myself, Miss Brooks. Do you remember what it was I said last? Oh, how could I possibly remember what you said minutes ago? It was just something about... You'd like to state that in the past, whenever the situation seemed auspicious for declaring certain emotional reactions you felt, upon finding yourself in close proximity to me, that is, some outward manifestation seems uh, That's to... right. And then you said, couldn't we get a little more basic more quickly? Right. Then you said there always seems to be some sort of interruption when you want to talk to me about certain things. And then you said, what kind of interruption? <laughs> and then I wrote, whoever it is, get lost. <laughs> Come in. Hiya, Coach. I just... Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. Hello, Walter. How are you? Fine and dandy. Good. Bye-bye, Walter. <laughs> I just wanted to remind Mr. Boynton about the big doings tonight. There's going to be a torchlight parade and a snake dance. Uh, you'll be there, won't you, Miss Brooks? Yes, Walter, if I can find a snake in time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh... Uh, before I go, Miss Brooks, have you seen Stretch around anywhere? Uh, no, not for the past few hours. Well, if he shows up, please send him into the gym, will you? I want to give him exact directions so he won't get lost on his way to the bus station. Knowing Stretch, he can get lost after he's got the directions. <laughs> we'll send him in to you if he shows up here. Thank you, and good day, Walter Denton. Uh, thank you, Miss Brooks. And 
May I suggest that you speed Mr. Boynton on his way with a salutation befitting the mentor of a sterling aggregation such as the Madison basketball team? Walter. So long, Coach. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're not embarrassed by Walter's inference, Miss Brooks. If you think that would embarrass me, you need a coach, coach. <laughs> now, let's take off for that blue lagoon, huh? I'm afraid I don't comprehend, Miss Brooks. My hair is blowing in the breeze again. <laughs> <laughs> what is it you were trying to tell me before Walter came in? Well, it's just that with my leaving tonight, we won't be seeing each other at all over the weekend. I know, Mr. Boynton. Come in. Oh, it's Stretch. How are you, son? Hi, Mr. Boynton. Hello, Miss Brooks. Hi. <laughs> well, how do you feel about our impending junket? Huh? <laughs> Mr. Boynton wants to know how you feel about the trip you're taking this evening. Oh, well, I ain't going. Stretch, don't say ain't. Don't say you ain't going. <laughs> What's the trouble, Stretch? You're not ill, are you? There's nothing wrong with me physically. My trouble is mostly mental. Well, don't be self-conscious. <laughs> no, wait. What is it, Stretch? Maybe I can help you. I'm afraid you can't, Mr. Boynton. You see, it's... Well, it's about a girl. A girl? You've seen them. They play on girls' softball teams. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything I can do to help, Stretch? Yes, Miss Brooks. But I'd rather talk to you alone. If it's all right with Mr. Boynton. Why, certainly, Stretch. I've got to get down to the gym for a few minutes anyway. Miss Brooks, you will try to straighten him out, won't you? You know how important he is to the team. I'll do what I can, Mr. Boynton. Good. We'll see you at the snake dance tonight. Now then, Stretch, tell teacher all about it. Well, I know I ain't good in English, Miss Brooks. You're not good in English. I know. But ever since the first test you give me, I knew that I was going to improve and get the kind of marks in English that I've always stroven for. <laughs> stroven for? Oh, I know I've got a lot to learn yet, but since I met you, I feel that you're more than just a teacher, that you understand kids, and that's why I come to you now. I ain't much at speeches, so I'll just say it right out, Miss Brooks. I'm in love. In love? With what? A who? <laughs> My best friend's girl, Walter Denton. People don't talk like this in any language. <laughs> Stretch, are you trying to tell me that you've got a crush on Harriet Conklin? Exactly. When she's in the stands rooting for the team, I play great. When she isn't, like she's not going to be where we're going to play over the weekend, I don't. So I ain't going, Miss Brooks. Oh, now, wait a minute, Stretch. Have you told Harriet how you feel about her? Oh, no. Nor Walter, either. I wouldn't want to hurt neither of their feelings. It's just that I can't play without Harriet in the stands. Look, Stretch, I heard that they're going to show the games on television right here in Madison. That means that Harriet will be in the stand. She'll be right on the sidelines watching your every move. Honest, Miss Brooks? May I swallow a board eraser? <laughs> now, will you attend the ceremonies tonight and then leave with the rest of the team for Martinsville? Well, if you say Harriet will be there on the sidelines, I guess I'll go along. Good. I knew you wouldn't disappoint Mr. Boynton and me. He was kind of counting on me, I guess. Funny thing about him, though. For a smart scientist, he's not very smart about getting someplace sometime. My stretch, what do you mean? Like with you, I mean. Here you are, a smart, pretty, brainy English teacher with no other attachments, and he don't do nothing about it. Stretch. Yes, Miss Brooks? You ain't just flapping your lips, Doc. <laughs> Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, will continue in just a moment. But first, here is Vern Smith. Ladies, what's your complexion problem? My skin's so dingy. Mine's oily. My skin's dull, coarse-looking. Doctors have proved that many complexion problems respond wonderfully to proper cleansing with palm olive soap, regardless of age, skin type, or previous beauty care. Oily skin looks less oily. Dull, drab skin, fresher and brighter. Coarse-looking skin appears finer. To win such complexion improvements, simply use palm olive soap. Nothing but palm olive is needed the way doctors advise. Wash your face with palm olive soap three times a day. Massage with palm olive's wonderful beauty lather for 60 seconds each time to get palm olive's full beautifying effect. 
then rinse. Look for improvements within 14 days. Remember, 36 doctors, leading skin specialists, advise this way for 1,285 women with all types of skin and proved it could bring lovelier complexions to two out of three. So forget all other beauty care. Use palm olive soap the way these doctors advise for a fresher, brighter complexion. And ladies, enter the $100,000 49 Gold Rush Contest. The makers of palm olive soap offer $49,000 first prize and over 4,900 other prizes. Get entry blanks and complete rules from your dealer now. You may win a fortune in cash. Well, the pre-victory celebration was a huge success. A one-hour snake dance and a six-mile torch parade came off promptly at 8 o'clock. And my feet came off promptly at 9. <laughs> After seeing the basketball squad off for the bus depot, I immediately limped home for a nice, warm bath. Mrs. Davis, my landlady, was sitting in the living room when I opened the door. Good evening, Connie. How was the snake dance? Very snaky, thanks. <laughs> did you bid Mr. Boynton a fun goodbye, Connie? Yes, Mrs. Davis. What did he say? Goodbye. <laughs> oh, that man. When is he going to open his eyes and see that? I think they're opening a little bit, Mrs. Davis. This afternoon in the laboratory, he really started to make a noise like an interested party. Oh, what happened? Nothing. I got all involved with the trials and tribulations of a star basketball player and his unrequited romance. But the weekend is upon us, and I won't have to play Dorothy Dix for a few days anyway. <laughs> what are you going to do tonight, Connie? I have some very elaborate plans, Mrs. Davis. Tonight I'm going to have myself a schoolteacher's B&B. Benedictine and brandy? No, bath and bed. <laughs> If you'll excuse me now, I'll drag my carcass into the bathroom and run a tub. Oh, you don't have to do that, Connie. I've already let the water in. I was going to bathe Minerva tonight. The cat? But cats aren't supposed to get baths, are they? <laughs> oh, Minerva loves it. Besides, I've just got to bathe her. Why, are the mice complaining? <laughs> no. She was walking near the sink this morning and slipped on the tile, poor dear. Fell right into some dough I was mixing for bread. Oh. <laughs> then maybe Minerva better use the water that's in the tub. She can wait. You run along, Connie, and take a nice restful. Now, who in the world can that be? Coming! Stretch, what are you doing here? Why aren't you at the bus depot? I ain't going. Again? <laughs> well, come in for a minute. Thanks, Miss Brooks. This is Mrs. Davis. You remember Stretch. Of course. He's the famous quarterback on our hockey team, isn't he? <laughs> no. Lately, he's been playing goalie for our tennis team. <laughs> Could I talk to you alone, Miss Brooks? Naturally. Mrs. Davis, would you mind making a little tea? Not at all, Connie. I'd like some myself. How about you, Stretch? Nice glass of milk? No, thanks, Mrs. Davis. Well, I'll bring some anyway. Nothing like milk for a growing boy. I guess you're pretty disappointed in me, Miss Brooks, but I... Say, what's that? What's what? Right behind Mrs. Davis. There's a cake walking into the kitchen. <laughs> oh, relax, Stretch. I see it, too. That's just our cat, Minerva. She fell into some dough. <laughs> Tell me why you're not with the team. It's Harriet, Miss Brooks. Even though she'll be seeing me play on television, I won't be able to see her. I was afraid you'd figure that out. <laughs> um, look, Stretch, I'll get you a nice picture of Harriet and send it airmail. You'll have it by game time tomorrow night. How's that? Gee, I don't know, Miss Brooks. I would like to have a picture of Harriet, but I wouldn't want anybody to know that I... Walter's my best friend. I know, Stretch. You wouldn't want to hurt Walter or Harriet or either of their feelings. Believe me, I'll get the picture without anyone knowing for whom it's intended. Gosh, I hate to be such a problem to you, but... Well, I never mixed much with other kids outside of an athletics, I mean. And I think my name has something to do with it. Your name? You see, my real name is Fabian Snodgrass. Uh, <laughs> I guess when I was little and kids kidded me about it, I got sensitive. I see. Stretch, do you have any brothers or sisters? Sure. Two sisters and one brother. And do they have uh, peculiar names, too? Oh, no. They all got perfectly normal names. It's like the other day when I was talking to my sister. Rapunzel, I said. <laughs> I 
Rapunzel. <laughs> well, that does it. I'll go into your case more thoroughly when you get back from this trip, Stretch, but right now you've got to rejoin the team. Come along. You won't forget to send a picture, Miss Brooks. I won't forget, Stretch. Lots of luck and goodbye again. Rapunzel Snodgrass. <laughs> now, there's a family for you. Oh, well, now for that bath. I better see if the water's still warm. Oh, it's pretty cold. I better let it out and run a fresh one. Come and get your tea, Connie. I'll be right there, Mrs. Davis. I'm afraid Minerva's water got a little cool. I'm running another tub for myself. Very well, dear. Where did Stretch go? Back to the bus depot. Wait till I close this door. The poor kid, he's hopelessly in love. Yes, I overheard. But he shouldn't worry so much about the other boy in the case. Why, when my sister Angela was a girl, she never went out with one boy at a time. She didn't? No, she played the field, Angela did. Why, I remember one time she went out with twins for over a year before she found out they were triplets. <laughs> Poor Angela. The eternal quadrangle. I'd better take a look at that bath. There. Nice and hot. Now to get these clothes off and... Oh, no, not another interruption. Hi, Miss Brooks. It's me. Can I come in for a minute? Yes, Walter, but that's about all. I'm trying to take a bath. Well, that'll have to wait, Miss Brooks. Well, it's getting plenty of practice. What's the matter, Walter? It's Stretch. He disappeared from the station, and when last seen, he was heading in this direction. He did come here, Walter, but I sent him back down to the depot. Well, that seems like a pretty silly maneuver. Well, what did he come here about? He wanted some advice. He's in love, Walter. In love? <laughs> in love with who? Whom? Who's she? <laughs> He's in love with somebody that doesn't love him, a girl who goes with another fellow. Now, what kind of a girl would go with a fellow when she could go with a star basketball player like Stretch? I can't divulge the details, Walter, but Stretch was miserable about the situation. But he's not supposed to be miserable. This is a crucial time. If he likes a girl, she should go with him and brush off this other jerk. <laughs> Careful, Walter. You may hate yourself for this. <laughs> Look, I've smoothed his feathers and sent him back to play the game of his life. Now, you get back to the depot and don't say a word about what I've told you. Well, all right, Miss Brooks. But I wish I could get a peek at the guy that's got Stretch's girl buffaloed. You may never see him till you start shaving. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye to you again, Walter Denton. Well, let's see how this water feels now. It could be warmer. I'll let a little out and refill it. Singing in the bathtub. La da 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 da. Singing in the bathtub. Now we'll just put the plug back in, run some more water. I always thought that teaching was my only profession, but bathing can be quite a career, too. <laughs> there, that ought to be just right. Singing in the bathtub, nothing can go wrong. Singing in the bathtub, oh, I should live so long. <laughs> come in, come in, whoever you are. Oh, it's Mr. Boynton. Oh, I'm sorry to bother you, Miss Brooks, but Walter Denton's disappeared from the bus depot. Have you seen him? Of course I've seen him. Won't you come inside, Mr. Boynton? Uh, I haven't time, Miss Brooks. You say you saw Walter. Where is he now? On the way back to the bus depot. Oh, good. Stretch got down there before I left, and when he found Walter gone, he was quite upset. Now everything will be all right. Sorry to have troubled you, Miss Brooks. See you next week. Goodbye. Goodbye, you greyhound lock of our... <laughs> At least there's nothing to stop me from taking that bath now. I couldn't have gotten cool in that short space of time. Let's see. Now it's exactly the right temperature. I don't have to let out a drop. Wrong again. Oh, no, it's not you again, Stretch. I'm a monster. <laughs> what do you want from me, an affidavit? What's wrong this time? When Walter came back to the depot, I took one look at him, and then I knew. Knew what? I couldn't go to Martinville without his girl, Harriet. I just can't play unless she's really in the stands. All right, Stretch, I'll do my best. Go back down to the depot and wait for me. What are you going to do, Miss Brooks? I'm going to slip on a straitjacket and run over to the Conklins. <laughs> 
I wouldn't have disturbed you this late, Mr. Conklin, but it's absolutely essential if you want Madison to win that championship. What's essential, Miss Brooks? That you let Harriet here go to Martinsville with the team. Me? Go with the team tonight? But of course it's Walter. He needs me. Stop squealing, girl. (laughs) But don't you see, Daddy? Walter's the manager of the team and he needs me by his side. I hardly dared to hope for it, but now I know. Walter's my life. My future. My all. Walter isn't the one who requested that you come along, Harriet. It was Stretch. Stretch? But he's the best athlete at Madison. I'll rush to his side at once. (laughs) What about Walter? Who needs Walter? When does the bus leave, Miss Brooks? Not not so fast, young lady. What's this all about, Miss Brooks? Well, it's Stretch, Mr. Conklin. He's got a crush on Harriet. And if she'll just be in the stands and root for him, he says Madison is bound to win. There's really no harm in it. No harm in it? But Martinville is 400 miles away. The basketball team is composed entirely of boys. Boys and Mr. Boynton. Who'd chaperone my daughter? (laughs) Who else but Miss Brooks? Come on, Miss Brooks, pack a bag and we'll have to... Oh, just a minute, Harriet. I can't go to Martin. Oh, of course you can. It's your idea, isn't it? Now go on home and get... Wait a minute. With Mr. Boynton coaching the team, you'll need a chaperone yourself. (laughs) Then why don't you come along, Daddy? What? Me? The principal of the school leave Madison for a weekend? To watch our basketball team play a round robin with the best teams in the state? Tell your mother we're leaving at once. Oh, just one thing, Mr. Conklin. Yes? Do you think they have a bathtub in Martinsville? (laughs) Well, I never thought when I woke up this morning that I'd be riding on the bus with you and the team tonight, Mr. Boynton. I'm glad it worked out this way, Miss Brooks. I am, too. Me, too. Oh, uh, uh, driver, I'm Mr. Conklin, the principal of Madison High. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Conklin? Uh, my name's Fredericks. What can I do for you? Well, I'd like to open a few of these windows if nobody minds. It's kind of stuffy in here. Yeah, it is kind of crowded in the bus. Hey, you see, we didn't expect all you extra passengers. In fact, there was one kid back at the depot I couldn't even allow on. Which kid was that, Mr. Fredericks? Oh, some tall fellow. Said his name was Snodgrass. Stretch Snodgrass. Well, well just, just as, as long, long as he, he wasn't, wasn't an important, important member of the, of the team... team it... Stretch not, Brad! <laughs> Eve Arden, as our Miss Brooks, returns in just a moment, but first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight, show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a Luster Cream shampoo. Only Luster Cream brings you K. Dumas' magic formula blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Gives loveliness lather even in hardest water. Glamorizes your hair as you wash it. Luster Cream. Not a soap, not a liquid, but a dainty cream shampoo. Leaves hair fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen, soft manageable. Gives new beauty to all hairdos or permanents. Four ounce jar, one dollar. Smaller sizes, either tubes or jars. Tonight, try Luster Cream Shampoo and be a dream girl, dream girl, beautiful Luster Cream girl. You owe your crowning glory to a Luster Cream Shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, Mr. Conklin was furious, and the only way I could square myself with him was to give up my seat to stretch when the bus returned to pick him up. Then I went home, got undressed, and steered my stubborn little course for the bathroom. Now I can really... Oh, hello, Mrs. Davis. Hello, Connie. I was going to postpone Minerva's bath till tomorrow, but she just couldn't wait any longer. Oh, When did you put her into the tub, Mrs. Davis? Just this minute, Connie. Well, I can't wait any longer either. Move over, Minerva. (laughs) Next 
next week, tune into another Our Miss Brooks show, brought to you by Palm Olive Soap, Your Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, written and directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Boynton is played by Jeff Chandler, Mr. Conklin by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Gloria McMillan, Frank Nelson, and Leonard Smith. Men, do you shave with a lather or brushless shave cream? Palm Olive Shaving Cream comes both ways, and whichever way you prefer to shave, you'll find that using either Palm Olive Brushless or Palm Olive Lather Shaving Cream can bring you more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Here's the proof. 2,548 men tried the new Palm Olive way to shave described on the tube, and no matter how they had shaved before, three out of every four got more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Get Palm Olive Brushless or Palm Olive Lather Shaving Cream today. For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North, the exciting, fun-packed adventures of an amateur detective and his beautiful wife. Tune in Tuesday evenings over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at this same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. Have you ever stopped to realize how much freedom the American way of life offers you? Remember, in many countries, people have lost the freedom to work where they choose, start their own business, own their own home, invest their money as they see fit. Let's keep that free American way. Let's make it better by working a little harder on our jobs and by being better citizens of our country. Let's remember that the better we produce, the better we live. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. You're listening to Hojo Radio. Stay tuned. The Jack Benny Program, presented by Lucky Strike. Feeling low. Feeling tense. These taste words are common sense. Smoke a lucky. To be your level best. Smoke a lucky. To be your level best. Yes, to feel your level best. Smoke a Lucky, because Lucky's fine tobacco picks you up when you're low, calms you down when you're tense, puts you on the right level to feel and do your level best. That's what fine tobacco can do for you. And remember, L-S-M-F-T, L-S-M-F-T, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So the next time you buy cigarettes, be sure to ask for the cigarette of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. For remember, Lucky's fine tobacco picks you up when you're low, calms you down when you're tense. Put you on the right level to feel and do your level best. Yes, smoke a lucky to feel your level best. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, the Sportsman Quartet, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Easter Sunday, and in cities all over the country, people are Easter parading. Right now in Beverly Hills, Jack is getting ready for his stroll down Wilshire Boulevard. At the moment, he's uh, taking a shower, and Rochester is laying out his clothes. Mm, Mr. Benny's been in that shower for a long time. It's funny the way the boss always puts on a bathing cap to keep his hair dry. (laughs) Once it didn't work, he put on the bathing cap and then put his hair on top of it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, he looked like a cantaloupe with sideburns. <laughs> well, I, I better get his clothes out. Say, here's a suit he wore home from New York. I haven't sent it to the cleaners yet. I'll take it and... Uh-oh. What's this book that fell out of his pocket? Well, it's Mr. Benny's diary. I wonder if I should read it. No, I better not. He sure got mad the last time I read it. Anyway, if Mr. Benny wanted me to know what he did in New York, he'd tell me. But he's been home over a week and he ain't told me, so here goes. 
Now, oh, here's the first entry. April 4th. Dear Diary, the flight to New York was exciting. Traveling by airplane is very pleasant, except they give the passengers free food, magazines, and chewing gum. I couldn't sell a darn thing. <laughs> I wonder what he did with that gallon of coffee and four dozen sandwiches uh, he took with him. I arrived in New York this morning, cheerful but bloated. <laughs> I guess he didn't eat all the sandwiches. The next entry is written in peanut butter. <laughs> April 5th, Dear Diary. This morning I was walking down Broadway and ran into Fred Allen. And I must say that Fred looks wonderful. He had all the wrinkles taken out of his face, and luckily they didn't have to use surgery. Fred's face has so so much loose skin, they just pulled his ears back and tied them in a bow. <laughs> With his hat off, he looked like an Easter bunny. Mm, Mr. Benny's diary sure is dumb. Two days in New York, and he ain't been to Harlem yet. April 6th. Dear Diary, last night I attended a dinner party at the home of Mr. William Paley. He's the head of CBS. I sat on the right of his lovely wife, Barbara. Mrs. Paley is certainly a charming woman. I wonder what network he got her from. <laughs> April 7th, talk to my sponsor today. Well, now it's getting interesting. April 8th, talk to my sponsor today. April 9th, talk to my sponsor today. April 10th, talk to my sponsor today. April 11th, talk to my lawyer today. <laughs> April 12th, my lawyer, talk to my sponsor today. <laughs> April 13th. My lawyer will be my summer replacement. <laughs> April 14th. Starter for home on the Santa Fe Super Chief. The Super Chief is a wonderful train, but I think I enjoyed the plane trip more. The hostess had prettier legs than the conductor. <laughs> Well, I'll be darned. No mention of Harlem at all. If he didn't go to Harlem, why did he bother? Oh, to... Rochester. Rochester. Uh oh, here he comes. I better hide the diary. Rochester, what are you doing? I was looking through the suit to see if it needed to be sent to the cleaners. Oh, well, while I finish dressing, look through the closet and see if there's anything else that needs cleaning. Yes, sir. Uh, what about this gray suit, boss? I don't know. How does it look to you? Well, it's got a gravy stain on the sleeve, salad dressing on the pants, butter on the cup, coffee on the lapel, and meat sauce all over the vest. It has? Yeah, shall I send it to the cleaner or put it in the refrigerator? <laughs> uh, send it to the cleaner. But first, uh, Rochester, go through the pockets and make sure I didn't leave any money in it. Oh, boss, come now! <laughs> Never mind, just do it. Well, I'm all dressed, Rochester. How do I look? Fine, but you better put your glasses on. Oh, I'm not going to wear my glasses. They, they make me look old. But you don't see too well without them. Rochester, I only need my glasses for reading. Now, let's see. I think I'll take a cop, uh, top coat with me in case I... I'll get it. Oh, hello, Phil. I'm Mary. <laughs> Oh, 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 happy Easter, Mary. Well, I'm ready to go walking if you are. I'm ready, Jack. But aren't you going to say anything about my new dress? Let's see. Say, it's very pretty. But, Mary, isn't it kind of daring? Well, no, this is the latest style. It's called a plunging neckline. Well, you better grab it fast, sister. It's getting away from you. <laughs> oh, don't be silly, Jack. Plunging necklines are the latest style. All the girls will be wearing them today. They will? Yes. Oh, Rochester, bring me my glasses. <laughs> Thanks. Well, come on, Mary, let's go to the boulevard and stroll in the Easter parade.
Gee, there are a lot of people on Wilshire Boulevard, aren't there, Mary? Yeah, and everybody's dressed so nice. Well, so are you. See, that new hat you're wearing is really cute. Where'd you get it? The May Company. They give me all my clothes. The May Company gives you all your clothes? See, that's funny. You've been working for me for the past 15 years. I know. They send me food, too. <laughs> oh, well, that's nice of them. <laughs> Jack. What? How far do you think we ought to walk? Oh, I don't know. Probably as far as La Brea. And then we'll... Jack, look who's coming this way. Isn't that one of the boys in your beavers club? Oh, Yes. Hello, Joey. Hello, Mr. Benny. Hello, Miss Livingston. Hello, Joey. Hey, that's a mighty cute rabbit you have there. Yeah, it's my Easter bunny. I'm taking him over to Mr. Benny's house to feed him. To my house to feed him? Why? My father says you got more lettuce than anyone in Beverly Hills. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Did you just get this rabbit, Joey? Oh, no. I got him last Easter. In fact, I had two of them. Come on, Mary, let's go. <laughs> In a minute, Jack. Uh, what happened to your other rabbit, Joey? I don't know. He just disappeared around Christmas time. Mary, let's go. <laughs> uh, Joey, exactly when did your other rabbit disappear? It was December 23rd. Well, thanks for telling me. Goodbye, Joey. Goodbye, Miss Livingston. Goodbye, Mr. Benny. Goodbye, goodbye. <laughs> you know, Mary... Oh, quiet. You and your mink Christmas presents. <laughs> that was just a coincidence. I happened to get a mink with pink eyes. That's all. <laughs> you know, Mary... But strolling along the boulevard today reminds me of that picture we saw with Fred Astaire and Judy Garland. You mean Easter Parade? Yeah, that's the one. Remember at the start of the picture when Fred Astaire was walking along Fifth Avenue singing that song and the people all answered him? How did that song go again? Oh, yes, I remember it now. Never saw such a lovely day. Happy Easter. Happy Easter! It's such fun just to nod and say Happy Easter. Happy Easter! My, oh, me, there's so much to see as you stroll the avenue. And you greet all the friends you meet. Happy Easter to you. Isn't that nice, Mary? They all answered us just like in the picture. Gee, I'll never forget how... Hey, Mary. Hey, Mary, look. Look. Huh? Look, stepping up on the curb. Get a load of those legs. Oh, who is it? The conductor on the super cheap. <laughs> now, come on, Mary. we got to keep up with the crowd, you know. I want to walk all the way down to La Brea. Say, Jack, look. There's Phil Harris standing on the corner. Oh, yes. Hello, Phil. Hi, you Livy, you little Easter bunny. Who's that egg you got with you? <laughs> Don, I forgot to take off my bathing cap. <laughs> Say, Phil, Mary and I are strolling down Wilshire. Want to join us? No, no, Jack. The Chamber of Commerce wants me to stand here till another bus comes by. Another bus? Yeah, I'm the grand finale of the 95-cent tour. <laughs> what? Them out-of-towners go nuts. <laughs> oh, right. you a little conceited? Nah, conceit is when you think you got it and you ain't. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, Phil, you've got it. Sixteen silver dollars in a box of Snickers to that gray-haired gentleman with a button shoe. <laughs> Mary, Mary, you talk to him. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Phil... Jack and I are going for a walk. Do you want to join us or not? Oh, I'd love to, Liv, but when I finish here, I've got to go home and take my uncle to the train. I didn't know you had an uncle here. Yeah, he arrived Tuesday on business. Came out here for the eclipse. Oh, is he, uh... Is he an astronomer? No, a pickpocket. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, Jackson, when will you learn to still those quivering lips? <laughs> Come on, Mary, let's go. All right. So long, Phil. So long, Livy, you dove. See you later. Come on, Mary. Hey, uh, Jackson. What? Don't feel bad. You've got the bluest eyes on Wilshire Boulevard. <laughs> I know. 
So long, Phil. Come on, Mary. You know, Mary, Phil kids a lot, but underneath it all, he's really a nice guy. Oh, stop fluttering your eyelashes. Jealous. Now, come on, dollface. We got a long way to walk yet. Walking with you side by side. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Fills my chest with so much pride. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. My, oh, me, there's so much to see as you stroll the avenue. And you, you greet, greet all the friends you meet. Happy Easter to you. And up, bum, 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 bum. Get up. You're not as young as Fred Astaire. I know. He's 38. <laughs> now, come on, Mary. Gosh, what perfect weather. Spring, the skies are clear, the flowers are blooming, the sun is shining. Well, look who's here. Bonjour, Monsieur Benny. <laughs> well, Professor LeBlanc, what a surprise running into you. Hello, Professor. Bonjour, Mademoiselle. Professor, you certainly look nice today. Is that a new Easter suit you're wearing? Mademoiselle, I am a poor violin teacher. I cannot afford to buy new suits. Well, what do you do with the money I pay you for my violin lesson? I buy sleeping pills. <laughs> oh, are they, are they any good? No. After a few days, I wake up. Well, it was nice seeing you, Professor, and don't forget, you're giving me a violin lesson next week. I will not forget. I will tie a string around my finger. Good, good. Better I should tie a rope around my neck. <laughs> what? Goodbye, Monsieur Benny. Goodbye. <laughs> Say, Mary, I can't understand why he hates to give me violin lessons. Well, I can't understand it either. You played beautifully. Well, I... Huh? See, Mary, that was sweet. What made you say that? Oh, I don't know. Just an impulse. Yesterday, I kicked a cop in the pants. <laughs> oh, well, sometimes you have to let yourself go, you know. Anyway, Mary, we're certainly running into a lot of people we know, aren't we? Yeah. Dum da dum bum ba bum ba bum. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Yum, ba bum bum you doll face. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. My, oh, me, there's so much to see as you stroll the avenue. And to greet all the friends you meet. Happy Easter to you. Say, Geiches, what is it, Mabel? <laughs> Gertrude, I feel so elegant walking in the Easter parade. How do you feel? My feet are killing me. But it's my own fault for buying such small shoes. Well, what size did you get? Nine. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sakes. What's the matter? Getting your footing to a size nine shoe is like docking the Queen Mary in a Dixie cup. <laughs> well, look who's talking. Get a load of your shoes. Oh, they're not so big. They're not. Last year, when we went on our vacation, every hotel we stopped at pasted labels on them. <laughs> well, it's a natural mistake because my shoes are genuine cowhide. Cowhide? Yeah. From the way your toes stick out, it looks like milk and time. <laughs> Gertrude, the next time you talk to me like that, I'll... Hey, Mabel, look, look. Here comes Jack Benny. Oh, yeah. And look who's with her, Mary Livingston. She didn't have to put on airs with me. I remember when she and I worked at the maid company. Oh, <laughs> uh, did you used to run into her? Very seldom I was a night watchman. <laughs> look, Mabel, they're coming toward us. Ba-bum-bum-ba-bum-ba-bum, happy Easter. Happy Easter. Yeah, ba-bum-bum-ba-bum-ba-bum, happy Easter. Happy Easter. My, oh, me, there's so much to see as you stroll the avenue. Meet all the friends you meet. Happy Easter to you. <laughs> well, Don, Don Wilson. <laughs> Well, hello, Barry. Oh, hello, Jack. I haven't seen you since uh, you got back from New York. How was your trip? Oh, wonderful, Don, and you'll be happy to know how popular you are. 
Everybody I ran into was asking about you. Oh, really, Jack? Well, what'd they want to know? Well, they want to know different things like uh, what you eat for breakfast, what you eat for lunch, what you eat for dinner, what you have for dessert, what you have after dessert, what you eat between meals, <laughs> what you eat before going to bed at night. All those different things. <laughs> well, that's nice, Jack, but uh, didn't they want to know anything about me on your program? Let's see. Yes, yes, they did, Don. They thought that my last couple of programs weren't quite as funny as usual. They want to know if you ate one of my writers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jack, I know you're kidding, but I wish you'd stop with that talk. It, it gives everybody the impression I'm fat. All right, Don, I'll stop joking about your size. Uh... Say, Don, would you like to walk down Wilshire Boulevard with us? Oh, I'd love to, Mary, but I'm on the other side of the street. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes. Lift your stomach, Don. Here comes a bus. <laughs> well, anyway, I'll see you later. Come on, Mary. Say, Mary, have you got a cigarette? Oh, sure, Jack. I have some right here in my... Oh, gee, I forgot to put them in this purse. Well, there's a drugstore right here on the corner. I'll step in and get some. A feeling low, a feeling tense. Uh, these eight uh, words that make a common sense. Uh, smell lucky. <laughs> smell. Oh, oh, mister. Mister. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Mister, I'd like to buy some... Magazine? No. Sunglasses? No, no. I'd like to buy some... Lifesavers? No, no, but as long as you're guessing and want to play games, I'll give you a hint. Now, what do you do to feel your level best? I loosen my girdle. What do you do? <laughs> well, if you must know, I smoke a Lucky. Well, why didn't you say so? You want a package of Lucky Strike. That's exactly what I want. Here you are. Thank you. Here's your money. Goodbye. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. <laughs> Bum, 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 ba -bee, ba -bum, ba -bum. Jack, did you get your cigarette? Yes, yes. Come on, Mary, let's keep on walking. Never saw such a lovely day. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. It's such fun just to nod and say happy Easter. Happy Easter. My, oh me, there's so much to see as you stroll the avenue. And you greet all the friends you meet. Happy Easter to you. <laughs> well, Mr. Pitcock. Kissel, it's nice running into you today. Oh, thank you, Mr. Benny. And and how are you, Miss Livingstone? Oh, I'm fine, thank you. Mr. Kissel, you certainly look nice in those striped pants, cutaway coat, and top hat. Mm -hmm. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, it's just right for Easter. Oh, thank you. But I'm also wearing it for sentimental reasons. This is the suit in what I got married. Really? Yeah, I'll never forget the ceremony. It was beautiful. When the preacher asked for the ring, my wife handed it to him, and then... Wait a minute. How come your wife had the ring? We weren't even married, and she went through my pockets already. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. Well, Mr. Kissel, it was a pleasure running into you on Easter, but we've got to be moving along. Well, I got to run along, too. This afternoon, I'm having an egg roll. An egg roll on your front lawn? No, in a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Kissel. See, you know, Mary, it's always nice running into Mr. Kissel. I don't know, he always seems so cheerful. Hey, Bud. <laughs> Bud. Huh? Come here a minute. Me? Yeah. Excuse me, Mary. Yeah? What are you doing? Well, we're just strolling along in the Easter parade. How far are you going? Uh, to La Brea. That's fine. What? You said you were going to La Brea, and I said that's fine. Well, wait a minute. Aren't you going to try to talk me out of it? Not me. This is my day off. <laughs> oh, 
Oh. Oh. Well, happy Easter. Same to you. Same to you. <laughs> well, come on, Mary. What happened? Nothing. It's all right. We can go to La Brea. <laughs> come on. Never saw such a lovely day. Happy Easter. It's such fun just to nod and say Happy Easter. <laughs> And you greet all the friends you meet. Happy Easter to you. Dana! Hello, Dana. Hello, Mary. Well, Dana, dear, it's good to see you. Did you have a nice Easter? Oh, sure. I colored Easter eggs all morning, and then I hid them. Uh Uh-huh. And then I told my mother to go look for them. That must have been fun. No, it was a mess. The eggs splattered all over the walls, the ceiling, and my mother's new dress. Well, Dennis, where'd you hide the eggs? In the Mixmaster. <laughs> In the Mixmaster? Yeah, it was awful. But, Dennis, colored eggs shouldn't splatter. How long did you boil them? Oh, boil them! <laughs> Mary, you take them, will you? Dennis, Jack and I are walking down as far as La Brea. Would you like to join us? Oh, sure. I'm not stuck up. Oh, well, that's nice of you. That's sweet of you, kid. Come on, kid. Could you walk a little faster, Mr. Benny? i got to get home and take my uncle to the train. Sure, we can... <laughs> Your uncle? Yeah, he's here on business. He came Tuesday for the eclipse. Uh, well, uh, Dennis, is he... Mary, here? Mary, let me take this one. Uh, what did you say your uncle came here for, Dennis? He came here for the eclipse. Yeah, um, bum, 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 bum. <laughs> he came for the eclipse, eh? I know, Dennis, he's a pickpocket. No, he's a photographer, and he hasn't got a dark room. <laughs> hmm. Uh, Jack. What? Happy Easter. All right, all right. <laughs> Let's walk on. Say, hey, Dennis, while we're walking along, why don't you sing something? Well, gee, do you think it'd be all right uh, right here on the street? Well, sure. Everybody feels good today. They're all singing. Yeah, they all want you to okay. sing, too. Okay. <laughs> Picks you up when you're low, calms you down when you're tense. Puts you on the right level to feel and do your level best. That's why it's so important for you to select and smoke the cigarette of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. 
For as every smoker knows... L-S-M-F-T. L-S-M-F-T. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. It's not surprising that Luckies are the overwhelming choice of the tobacco experts. Men who can see the makers of Lucky Strike consistently select and buy that fine, that light, that naturally mild tobacco. Yes, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. And this fine Lucky Strike tobacco picks you up when you're low, calms you down when you're tense. Put you on the right level, the lucky level, where you feel your best and do your best. So the next time you buy cigarettes, ask for a carton of Lucky Strike. Smoke a lucky to be your level best. Smoke a lucky to be your level best. Happy Easter, everybody. Don't forget to hear Dennis Day and a day in the life of Dennis Day. Stay tuned for the Amos and Andy show, which follows immediately. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Jack Benny Program, presented by Lucky Strike. Be happy, go lucky, be happy, go lucky, strike, be happy, go lucky, go lucky, strike today. When I have a gift to give, I know just what to send. The cigarette that's mild and rich, that happy, lucky blend. Sailors are a fickle lot with gals around the sea. But they are true to Lucky Strike cause LSMFT. Be happy, go lucky, be happy, go lucky strike. Be happy, go lucky, go lucky strike today. Yes, light up a lucky and enjoy the happy blending of perfect mildness and rich taste in one great cigarette, Lucky Strike. You see, only fine tobacco gives you both perfect mildness and rich taste. And LSMFT... Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So next time, try a carton of Lucky Strike and be happy, go lucky. Be happy, go lucky, be happy, go lucky strike. Be happy, go lucky, go lucky strike today. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, the Sportsman Quartet, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, yesterday USC and UCLA met in their annual football classic. So let's go out to Jack Benny's house a few hours before the game. Uh, we better hurry, Jack, or we'll miss the kickoff. Yeah, let's go already. Uh, <laughs> just a minute. I want to copy the lineups out of the paper. Here's a pencil, boss. Thanks. But, Jack, you can buy a program when you get to the Coliseum. Why do that when the lineups are right here in the paper? Now, let's see. Well, it's silly to copy it. Why don't you just cut them out? Because we have to put the paper back on the Coleman's porch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, let's see. Here's UCLA's lineup. Mumo, Narleski, Flynn, Strohshine, Livingston. Livingston? Mary. That's Cliff Livingston. Oh. I, th <laughs> I thought it was your sister, babe. <laughs> uh, no, no, Jack. Babe is with the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> oh, yes, I forgot. <laughs> Livingston, Mitchell, Cogswell. I used to play football when I was in high school. Really, Dennis? What position did you play? Bent over like the rest of them. <laughs> Livingston, Mitchell, Cogswell. Gee, I'll never forget our big game. I was the quarterback, and there was just a few seconds to play. The score was tied, and we had the ball on their one-yard line. It was the first down, so I called for the water boy. <laughs> What? While everybody else was drinking, I ran for a touchdown. <laughs> but, Dennis, that doesn't count. I know, I forgot the ball. <laughs> uh, but, Dennis, how could you... Wait a minute, Mary. Wait a minute. I'll take it. <laughs> Dennis, did you also play football in college? No. You're sure you didn't play college football? No, why? Well, some years ago, in a Rose Bowl game... A player ran 80 yards in the wrong direction, and I thought it might have been you. <laughs> now, let's see. Well, that was my father. <laughs> well, 
Well, at least I had it in the right family. <laughs> now, let's see. I've got the lineup copy. Rochester, don't forget to put the paper back on the Coleman's porch. Yes, sir. And did you make the sandwiches? Uh-huh, and I put your Ovaltine in a whiskey bottle like you told me to. <laughs> uh, Ovaltine in a whiskey bottle? When Mr. Bentley takes his three o'clock nap, he wants people to think he passed out. <laughs> Never mind. Did you pack my binoculars, Rochester? No, I thought you'd rather carry them. Here. Thanks. Jack, when'd you buy those binoculars? When I got my television set, I used them for watching Faye Emerson. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped when she brought Skitch Henderson on. <laughs> Now, hand me the basket, Rochester. Come in. Well, Mr. Kitzel. Hello, Mr. Bennett. Yeah. Oh, my, I just dropped by to return this roasting pan you loaned me for Thanksgiving. Oh, good, good. Did you have a nice Thanksgiving dinner, Mr. Kitzel? Oh, it was wonderful. Thanksgiving is the one day in the year that all my wife's relatives gather together, unfortunately, at my house. <laughs> Why, Mr. Kitzel, you sound a little sarcastic. Oh, not intentional. I oh. love having all our relatives for dinner, excepting my wife's brother. Is he a glutton? A big appetite, huh? Oh, 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 oh appetite. He eats like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> Oh, oh, Mr. Kitzel, you're joking. Joking, he said. Mr. Benny, he sat down and had six portions of turkey, three helpings of cranberry sauce, eight portions of dressing. To the yams, he went back full time. Gravy, you could swim in it. And the rolls, Einstein couldn't count it. Gosh, I bet he didn't have room for dessert. That he had first. He wasn't taking any chances. <laughs> Oh. But mad I can't get at him because he and my wife happens to be twins. Twins? Well, uh, do they look alike? Fortunately for both of them, no. <laughs> oh, well, Mr. Kitzel, we're going to the football game. Would you like to join us? No, I'd love to, Mr. Benny, but I want to get home before my brother-in-law leaves. Why? He may get sick, and this I got to see. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Kitzel. Oh, uh, what Mr. Kitzel goes through on Thanksgiving. Say, Mr. Benny, why didn't you invite us over for Thanksgiving dinner this year like you always do? Well, I intend to do, Dennis, but I had a little trouble with the butcher. Well, every time you go to buy something, you have trouble. Well, this time it wasn't my fault. Turkeys were so expensive that when I started to dicker with the butcher, he got mad, handed me an egg, and said... Here, take this home, sit on it, and hatch your own turkey. <laughs> Smart Alec Butcher. Turned out to be a duck. <laughs> 31 days yet. <laughs> well, come on, kids. I had lived that. Well, come on, kids. Let's, <laughs> let's leave for the game. Huh? Oh, I'm ready. Oh, by the way, Mr. Benny, which team are you going to cheer for? Uh, UCLA. Why? Well, I live in Beverly Hills near the college, so it's the neighborly thing for me to cheer for the UCLA team. And besides, he washes their jerseys. <laughs> yeah, those grass stains are murder. See, I hope UCLA wins. Well, I'm going to be cheering for USC. Who are you going to root for, Dennis? Notre Dame. <laughs> Dennis, Notre Dame isn't even playing. I know, but this year they need all the cheers they can get. <laughs> For a minute, I thought you were going to have a silly reason. Now, come on, let's go out and get in the car, Kester. Say, Jack, those trees on your lawn sure look beautiful. Don't they, though? I say, Benita, where's the morning paper? Oh, my goodness. If I that said... Benny fellow bothered... Dennis, the... cut that out! <laughs> What a kid. You know, Dennis, sometimes you're going to... Hey, Jackson, Jackson. Huh? Jack, it's Phil. Hi, Phil. Hiya, Livy. What are you doing over here at King Solomon's Mine? 
<laughs> Bill, not so loud. Remember, you're in Beverly Hill. Stop bragging about it. Some place is Beverly Hill. Why? What's the matter? I was driving down the street, stuck out my hand to make a left turn, and someone stole the olive out of my martini. <laughs> Oh, that's a shame, Phil. And after you took it sightseeing all the way from Encino. <laughs> hey, Phil, that's a beautiful car you're driving. Is it new? Yeah, brand new Cadillac. I bought it for Alice. Thought I'd surprise her. You? You bought a car for Alice? Yeah, them joint bank accounts are wonderful. <laughs> Phil, when Alice finds out I learn how to write my name, she'll kill me. <laughs> You know now. Yeah. You know how to write. Huh? Well, I can't believe it. Go ahead, Phil. Let me hear you spell your name. Okay. P H I L H A R I S. Phil, you left out an R. Oh, oh, yes. H A R I S R. <laughs> Phil, Phil, my only regret is that I have but one band leader to give to NBC. <laughs> Hey, Phil, we're going to the football game. Why don't you join us? I'd like to live, but I can't. Well, so long, kids. See you later. Goodbye, Bye, Phil. Phil. Oh, wait, kids. Don't forget to listen to me Monday night. I'm going to be on the Lux Radio Theater. Lux? L O X. <laughs> that's Lux. Well, that's closer than I got with Harris. <laughs> yeah, closer, closer. So long, Phil. Well, let's go, kids. Is everything all ready, Rochester? Yes, sir. Come on, come on. Let's get in the car, everybody. Say, Jack, your car looks much nicer. Thanks, Mary. You've even got new seat covers. That's the top. It sags a little. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, come on, Dennis, Mary. Hop in. Go ahead, Rochester. Start the car. Yes, sir. <laughs> Rochester, why is the motor spitting like that? We can't stand each other. <laughs> oh, stop. Try it again. Yes, sir. There we are. The motor was just cold. Uh-oh. What's the matter, Rochester? I forgot to bring the sandwiches. Well, it's too late now. Maybe after the game we can stop and get something to eat. Okay, Jack, but this time let's go to a restaurant instead of a drive-in. Well, don't you like drive-ins, Mary? Sure, but the last time Jack drove into one, the girl put the tray on the door and the car turned over. <laughs> it did not. Now, come on, kids, let's enjoy the ride. By the way, Dennis, what are you going to sing on the program this week? Oh, it's called All My Love. Would you like to hear me sing it? Sure, Dennis. That would be nice while we're driving along. Now, go ahead. Go ahead and sing. And wait a minute. Mary, Mary, did you drop something? Oh. Then what are you bending over for? I'm hiding till we pass the May Company. <laughs> well, well, go ahead and sing, Dennis. Go ahead. I recall my life I've 
waited all my life to give you all my love. Oh, I love you so. Don't you ever let me go. Good, Dennis, especially the finish. I never knew you could hit such a high note. Neither did I. When I came to it, the spring in the seat broke through. <laughs> as long as you hit it, that's all. It... Mary, you can get up now. We passed the May Company. I'm ducking for the one on Crenshaw. We passed that one, too. Oh, Rochester, we're getting closer to the Coliseum. You better start looking for a place to park. Uh, there's a parking lot, 25 cents. Yeah. There's one, 50 cents. Keep driving, Rochester. Uh, but, Jack, the lots close to the Coliseum charge $2 for parking. Well, it's worth it. Look at all the walking it saves. If you want convenience, you've got to pay for it. Rochester, drive into this lot. The $2 one? Yes. Come on, kid. Oh, here comes the attendant. Oh, hello, Mr. Benny. Hello, Joe. How's business? Very good. I'll bring the money over to your house tonight. <laughs> good. Come on, kid. Uh, Jack, do you own the... Come on, come on. We'll be late for the game. Dennis, don't lag behind. Oh, I'm coming. Gee, with a lot of people going to the game. Jack, maybe you ought to give Dennis his ticket. He may get lost in the crowd. No, he won't get lost. I've been holding his hand ever since we left the parking lot. How can you be holding Dennis's hand? He's on the other side of me. Well, I've been holding... Oh, oh, pardon me, madam. Oh, that's all right. I rather enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Are you going to see the football game? Oh, yes. My boy is playing today. Oh, really? What does he play? The tuba. <laughs> The tuba? Oh, oh, he's in the band. Yes. Maybe you've heard of him. Big Mouth McDonald. <laughs> oh, well, I'll, I'll watch for him at the half. You can't miss him. On low notes, he drools a little. <laughs> I'll find him. Goodbye. Come on, kids, let's hurry. We don't want to miss... We don't want to miss the kickoff. Say, Mary, these seats aren't bad, are they? No, they're fine. Can you see all right, Dennis? Dennis. Now, where is Dennis? Attention, please. Will Mr. Jack Benny please report to the lost and found department? <laughs> I will not. Let him stay there. It's the last time I take that kid any place. Every time we go, we... I always have that trouble. Jack, look! They're getting ready to start the game. Yeah. The teams are lining up. Attention, please. Mr. Benny... Will you please come to the lost and found department? He's driving us nuts. Jack, go get Dennis. I'm not going to leave now. Here comes the kickoff. <whistles> Mary! Mary, look at that ball go. What a kick. It's going uh, way Sorry away. to bother you, fella, but you're sitting in my seat. Huh? That seat belongs to me. Would you mind moving? Well, you must be mistaken. My ticket says row 72, seat 4. And this is it. Yeah, well, that's what my ticket says. So if you don't get out of the seat, I'll sit on your lap. Look, mister. Uh, come on, come on. Get out of the seat or I'll punch you right in the nose. Oh, yeah? Mary, please. <laughs> 
I'll handle this. Oh, you will, huh? Mister, let go of my lapel. You don't have to get that excited. Now, wait a minute. I'm sure the usher can straighten it out. Oh, there's one. Oh, usher. Usher. <laughs> That's all I need. Look, usher, I have a ticket for row 72, seat 4, and this man has a ticket for the same seat. How did that happen? I don't know, but won't it be cozy? <laughs> Never mind that. What are you going to do about it? Well, if you like, you can sit in seat six, row 12, on the 50-yard line. Oh, is that seat vacant? It ought to be. It's in the Rose Bowl. <laughs> Stop being so smart. You are, without a doubt, the most stupid, inefficient, blundering... When you say that, smile. Why? We're on television. <laughs> Well, that's the last straw. I've got a good mind to you take... You lay a hand on me and I'll pull the cork out of your oval tee. <laughs> oh, get out of here. Mary, where's that other man? He's gone. Good. Come on! We want a touchdown! We want a touchdown! Jack, stop yelling. It's time out. Oh. <laughs> Jack, look. The cheering section is getting up. Oh, yes. <laughs> They're rooting for both teams. This game just pass those luckies more. The odds are always two to one that lucky strike will score. Be happy, go lucky. Be happy, go lucky strike. Be happy, go lucky, go lucky strike today. There's Big Mouth McDonald. When everyone is voting for the player that they like, for all American full pack, we'll vote for Lucky Strike. Be happy, go lucky. Be happy, go lucky strike. Be happy, go lucky. Lucky strike today. Hey, Mary. Mary, Don Wilson must have had something to do with that. Yeah. Jack! Jack, they're starting to play again. Yeah. All right, get your hot dogs. Get your red hots here. Hot dogs. Mary, you want a hot dog? No, thanks. Oh, I'll have one of them, mister. Yes, sir. One hot dog coming up. Would you like relish? Relish, yes. Chopped onion? Uh-huh. Mayonnaise? Yes, yes. Chili sauce? Yes. You'll have to get them someplace else. All I got is mustard. <laughs> Just give me the hot dog. Hey! Hey, UCLA's got the ball. Yeah, look at that Marletsky move. Wow! What a tackle they threw on Look, he's still lying there. Must have knocked the wind out of him. Get up! Get up! The grass is staining your jersey. <laughs> Attaboy. Attention, Mr. Benny. Please, please come and get him. <laughs> you can't do this, Doug. How many Irish songs can we listen to? <laughs> Jack. Jack, you better go and get Dennis. Oh, all right. Pardon me. Pardon me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Peanuts, popcorn, get your hot buttered popcorn here. Hello, Sonny. Hello, Mr. Benny. We're doing great. <laughs> Good. If, uh, if you get stuck with any, cry a little. <laughs> I'll see you later. Now, let's see. Let's see, where's the lost and found apartment? I'll ask this fella here. Oh, pardon me, mister. Can you tell me where the lost and found apartment is? Huh? No, I'm a stranger here. Well, I... I know... Wait a minute. I've seen you before. What's your name? Stavoni. John L. C. Stavoni. Well, Mr. Savoni, don't you remember me? No. Nope. But you must. 
Remember one day you stopped me on the street about a year ago, asked me for a dime for a cup of coffee, and I gave you 50 cents. Holy smoke, is Jack Benny? <laughs> well, I thought maybe you'd forgotten me. Oh, no. I tell all my fraternity brothers that you're my friend. Fraternity? Mr. Savoni, for a college man, what's happened to you? I'm a poor little man a Now, look. Look. <laughs> look, mi- Mr. Savoli. Huh? You're my pal. You can call me John. Well, thank you. <laughs> now, John, you're always short of money. How did you manage to get into the Coliseum? Well, I tell you how it happened in a way. I was walking down the street. I wasn't doing anything. Just walking down the street. I didn't feel like doing anything. Uh-huh. Just walking down the street. <laughs> and a fellow comes up to me and says, Hey, you. I said, who? He said, you. I said, me? He said, yeah! <laughs> I said, what do you want? He said, you want to buy a ticket to the football game? I said, how much you want for the... Football ticket. He said three bucks. So I gave him the three bucks and I came to the football game. But look at you're always broke. Where'd you get the three dollars to buy this ticket? <laughs> While we were standing there talking, it got kind of chilly. So I put my hand in his pocket. <laughs> At least you gave the man his money back. Did you take anything else? No, but he gave me his card. Card? Let me see it. Hmm. J. Edgar Hoover. (laughs) J. Edgar Hoover? Yeah. He made me so (laughs) nervous. Mr. Savoni, why don't you get some ambition? Go out and find yourself a job. Settle down. Get married. Oh, I was married once, but my wife threw me out. Well, why would she do a thing like that? I don't know. I was just hanging around the house. I wasn't doing anything. I see what you mean, yes. So long, Mr. Savoni. So long. I wonder oh, where... Oh, Jack, the... Jack. Huh? Did you find Dennis? No, and I'm not going to bother. Come on, let's go back to our seat. What seat? The game is over. It is? What was the score? 39 to nothing. 39? Oh, isn't that cute? I'll bet they did that just for me. <laughs> Come on, Mary, let's go home. We'll be back in just a moment. But first, let's take a tour through an art gallery. Be happy, go lucky. Be happy, go lucky. Be happy, go lucky. Go lucky, strike today. Now here's a picture of a pack of rich or lucky strikes. It makes you think of smoking joy and mildness people like. I'm sure I know the reason why the Mona Lisa smiles. She just discovered Lucky Strike, the smoke that's rich and mild. Be happy, go lucky, be happy, go lucky strike, be happy, go lucky, go lucky strike today. Yes, be happy, go lucky. Enjoy perfect mildness and rich taste. A happy blending you always get in one great cigarette, Lucky Strike. Puff by puff, you'll always find Lucky's are milder. In fact, scientific tests confirmed by three independent consulting laboratories prove Lucky Strike 
is milder than any other principal brand. And puff by puff, you'll always enjoy the full, rich taste of truly fine tobacco because LSMFT, Lucky Strike, means fine tobacco. So next time, try a carton of Lucky Strike and be happy. Go lucky! Be happy, go lucky, be happy, go lucky, strike, be happy, go lucky, go lucky, strike today. We're a little late. Good night, folks. Be sure to hear Dennis Day and the Day in the Life of Dennis Day. Next week, Amos and Andy will be our special guests. John L. C. Savoni was played by Frankie Fontaine. Stay tuned for the Amos and Andy show, which follows immediately. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thanks for listening to Hojo Radio. We have more classic radio coming your way next. The Johnson Wax Program with Trevor McGee and Molly. <laughs> of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn, with songs by the King's Men and music by Billy Mills. The show opens with Liza. already heard about or seen or even signed the Consumer's Pledge being sponsored by the government's Consumer Division. For the benefit of those who haven't seen one, here is the three-point pledge women are asked to sign voluntarily. I will buy carefully, I will waste nothing, I will take good care of the things I have. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? And it's good business as well as good patriotism. By all means, take good care of the things you have. Make them last longer. Save for the country. Save for yourself. Now, one easy way to make things last longer is by protecting them regularly with Johnson's Wax. Floors, furniture, and woodwork that are wax-protected are safeguarded against dirt and wear. They're easier to clean, and they become more beautiful with each application. Genuine Johnson's Wax is available in three forms, paste, liquid, and cream wax. Fibber McGee has bought a horse. Why did he buy a horse? Because his tires were getting thin. Where is the horse? The horse is in the garage. What does Molly think of Fibber's buying a horse? She doesn't know he's bought a horse. Why doesn't he tell her? Because he hasn't thought of a good way to break the news. Well, what happens now? Don't ask us. Ask Fibber McGee and Molly. Hey, Molly. Yes? Did you ever think what'll happen when our tires are all shot? Why, certainly. We'll walk. Incidentally, how are the tires? Awful. They look like burlap bags with sidewalls. <laughs> well, I guess they are pretty bad. Yeah. That left front one would have blown out long ago if it weren't too proud. What do you mean, proud? Well, now, if you were an inner tube, would you like to be seen wearing all those patches? <laughs> Yeah, and that spare tire hates me. Every time I open the trunk, it hisses me. <laughs> hey, you know, I, uh, I've been wondering, maybe if we had a horse... Oh, McGee, for goodness sake. <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. What's so ridiculous about getting a horse? I think it would be a pretty smart move myself. Well, in the first place, you don't know anything about horses. Oh, I don't, eh? <laughs> I guess you don't remember the time the Rodale come to Peoria and I stayed on that buck and bronco for five and a half minutes. Yeah, I remember it very well. I also remember what you told me afterwards. What was that? That your belt got caught over the saddle horn and you couldn't get off. <laughs> well, the horse didn't know that. <laughs> anyway, think what we'd save if we had a horse. No gasoline, no tires, no oil, no spark plugs. When I was out in the garage this morning... Yeah, you didn't seem to think it was serious then. I heard you laughing fit to bust. You did? Yes. 
And I wish you'd tone down that laugh a little too, McGee. You know, you sounded like a horse yourself. <laughs> you practically whinnied. Oh, oh, I did, eh? <laughs> oh, well, I... Come in. Hi, Johnny. Hello, Joyner. Where'd you want the hay? The hay? <laughs> what hay? Oh, you mean the hay. Well, I'll tell you, old-timer. What you waking like that for, Johnny? Got something in your eye? Huh? <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's okay now. Just, uh, just dump the hay on the back porch, old-timer, and mail me a bill. Okay, Johnny. On the back porch she is. Believe me. Wait a minute, boys. Now, wait a minute. What is this? Did you order some hay, dearie? Uh, yes, I did, Molly. <laughs> I got kind of worried about those tires of ours, so... No, oh, I bought a... a bale of hay. <laughs> Thought if the worst come to the worst, I could stuff the tires with hay, see? What a wonderful idea. <laughs> I hate to think what a blowout would do to my asthma. <laughs> Well, I thought if we had any hay left over, I could make a scarecrow for Uncle Dennis, too. For Uncle Dennis? Yeah. Keep the old crows away. <laughs> That's pretty good, kids. But that ain't the way I heard it. The way I heard it, one feller... Hey, what time is it, kid? Well, it's about a quarter after four, Mr. Old Timer. Oh, good gravy. Just got time for one more delivery, then I got to clean up and call for my gal. Oh. Ah, uh, Sugar's a great kid. Oh, Sugar, eh? <laughs> you mean she's so sweet? <laughs> no, she's hard to get. Well, <laughs> come on, guys. coming back and saying that. So long, Jockey. Oh, I don't know. I guess it's because I'm always riding him. <laughs> <laughs> See, that was really important. Well, I guess I'll take that hay out in the garage. I'll help you, dear. No, 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 no. I'll do it. I'll do it. Hey, you know what, Molly? What? Now that we got some hay, what do you say we get a horse? Yeah. We got a lot of ice cubes, too, so let's get a polar bear. <laughs> Oh, now, Molly, let's look at this thing logically. Suppose we do get a horse Oh, and... for goodness sakes, McGee. Will you stop talking about getting a horse? In the first place, you don't know anything about taking care of one. Remember now, you were only a groom for one day. Ah, uh, there's nothing to taking care of a horse. Just give him the same care and kindness you'd give a good dog, that's all. Well, now, if you think I'm going to have a horse sleeping at the foot of my bed every night. <laughs> and furthermore, Mrs. McGee, I guess you forget that I was brought up on a farm. I don't know why I should forget. You won't even cut the grass on the front lawn unless the almanac tells you to. <laughs> and it never has. <laughs> well, I'm a farmer boy at heart, even yet. I'll go on. Maybe you don't remember that little team of sorrels I used to own. Prettiest horses in Illinois. Oh, my. And affectionate, too. Every time I'd walk over to the fence, they'd kind of kiss me and nuzzle me with their soft lips. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. I've often heard people say, look at those horses, Neck McGee. <laughs> horses, Neck McGee, I would know that. Ah, wonderful world. <laughs> Horses Neck McGee, the most masterful magnetic mug that ever maneuvered a mare over mud and macadam to make monkeys out of military majors with their mobs of motorized machinery. A muscular madcap manipulating a martingale with the marvelous meticulousness that made me the most manly mounty, me thinks. From the majestic mountains of Middle Europe to the ticket, Billy, I'm stuck in my stirrup. <laughs>
What's the matter with you? What are you doing? What do you mean, what am I doing? Can't a guy take a few pails of water off to his own garage without starting a lot of ugly gossip? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm washing a car. Oh. And I wish I was washing a horse. <laughs> no kidding, Molly. What would you say if I went out today and bought a good horse? Well, I'd just make a few offhand comments and then run upstairs and wash my mouth out with soap. <laughs> But you're not going to buy a horse, are you? No, I'm not. Promise? Cross my heart. I'm not going to buy a horse. <laughs> Good. Anyway, even if we did have one, we'd have no place to keep it. No, oh, I don't know. There's plenty of room in the garage. What? There's plenty of room in the garage. Well, there won't be when Mrs. Uppington's brother puts his car in there. What? He can't do that. It's too crowded. I thought you said there was plenty of room. <laughs> well, there is uh, for one car and a horse, but if he thinks I'm going to turn that horse out into the cold... The what? <laughs> <laughs> Did I say horse? <laughs> I meant our car. Anyway, she's got a lot of nerve using our garage for her brother. Who gave her permission to put her brother in our garage? <laughs> I did. <laughs> visit, and her garage is crowded, and I thought it was only neighborly. Uh, neighborly my kneecap. That old moose is too tight-fisted to send her brother's car to a public garage. That's what's the matter. The way she nurses the coppers, they ought to make her police commissioner. I don't know why you're so bitter just because she wants to use our garage for a short time. Oh, gee whiz, Molly. I got up. A... Oh, there's Mrs. Uppington now, McGee. Oh, ain't that great. <laughs> She brightens my day like a total eclipse. Oh. <laughs> Just the same, be polite to her. Okay. Come in, Abigail. Uh, how do you do, my dear? Oh, hello, Abigail. It's so nice to see Hi, you. Hi, Abby. Won't you hop out of your overshoes and flop the body on a stool? <laughs> Oh, thank you, no. I just dropped in to thank you for letting my brother put his car in your garage. He arrives in the morning, but I insist on paying. Well, what is the matter, Mr. McGee? Well, he just swallowed some words, Abigail. Hmm? And I wouldn't think of letting you pay. Now, it's worth it to me because otherwise... You know what? McGee was talking about keeping a horse in the garage. Of course. How splendid. Oh, you think so, Uppy? You think it might be a good idea? Oh, huh? indeed I do, Mr. McGee. <laughs> of course, I have always been an ardent horsewoman. <laughs> what did I tell you, Molly? What did you tell me? Remember when we met Uppy on the street the other day and I says, doesn't she look like a horse, woman? <laughs> Mr. McGee, I flatter myself that the well-rounded sportswoman... The what sportswoman, Abigail? Well-rounded. Oh. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, that the well-rounded sportswoman must do a certain amount of... Uh, Horsing around? Uh, <laughs> in a way, yes. <laughs> when I was a mere girl on our plantation in Virginia... Tobacco? Uh, no, no, thank you. <laughs> Saying, my father insisted that every gentlewoman must know how to ride. Consequently, I said day after day on the bridal farms. <laughs> and night after night at the osteopath. Mr. McGee, you're such a tease, really. <laughs> oh, he's more monkey than a barrel of fun. <laughs> well, Uppy, it's nice to meet a fellow horsewoman. I used to be a trick rider in a circus, you know. Oh, really, Mr. McGee? Absolutely. You should often have seen me galloping furiously around the ring and then leaning way over to pick up a handkerchief in my tea. Oh, how fascinating. Yeah. Then you rode around again, I suppose, and picked up your teeth in a handkerchief. <laughs> Tell her how you used to stand on your head in the saddle and ride around, McGee. Oh, that was the best trick I'd done, Uppy. Uh, not hanging on to the reins or anything. Feet in the air, head on the saddle, going around the ring at a full canter. On your head? How utterly helpful. Helpful? What do you mean, helpful? Well, they say that horseback riding is the best way to reduce the fat parts of the body. <laughs> Well, you could tell she's a horsewoman, fat or a McGee. <laughs> Just look at the way she carries herself. Yeah, what a carriage. Just the right kind of a figure to pull it, too. <laughs> well, anyway, 
think she likes the idea of me getting a horse. You see, Molly, then, if our tires do go flat... If our tires do go flat, we'll walk. And that's flat, too. Oh. Now, let's stop all this silly talk about getting a horse. Well, if you only knew... If I only knew what? If, if you only knew how cheap I could get a good horse. And, and how easy he is to, or would be to take care of. Hello you... there, folks. Hello, Mr. Wilcox. Hi, Harlow. Hey, what's this about you buying a horse, Fibber? Well, I won't let him do it, Mr. Wilcox. I think it's foolish. But I thought he already... Never mind what you thought I already, Harlow. I promised Molly I wouldn't buy a horse. But I saw a harness man downtown. Well, I don't care what harness man said. Every time he opens his mouth, he puts his knee's foot in it. <laughs> There's something very strange going on around here, McGee. Huh? Look me in the eyes. Are you or are you not going to buy a horse? I am not. What was it you heard, Mr. Wilcox? Well, I heard that... Oh, gossip, 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 gossip. gossip. (laughs) You spend so much time in kitchens demonstrating glow coat, Harlow, that you're getting to be a regular old (laughs) biddy. Now, wait a minute, pal. I'm on your side. Huh? I think if you buy a horse to save your tires, it's very smart. Oh. I'm strictly a guy that believes in making what you've got last longer and go farther. Yeah. This is a time for conserving. Now, you take Johnson's self-polishing glow coat, for instance. All right. You'll have to speak good and loud, Harlow. I smoked corn silk when I was a kid, and it stunted my ears. <laughs> All right, but there's... <laughs> Okay, but there's no kidding about this. Yes. The time has come when we've all got to take better care of our things, protect them in every way possible. And there's no better way to protect all wood and enamel surfaces than with Johnson's Wax and linoleum with Johnson's self-polishing glow coat. I could go into a long talk about morale in the home, too, but everybody knows the value of a bright and spotless home. Mr. Wilcox, do you think our home would be any more bright and cheerful with a horse in it? I ain't keeping it in the house. I'm keeping it in the... What were you going to say, Harlow? Oh, nothing. But my brother asked me to give you one of his cards. Here. Well, I'll see you later, folks. Well, let me see that card, McGee. Yeah. Hmm. Paul Wilcox, horseshoeing and blacksmithing. We mend harness, file teeth, braid tails, and carry a complete line of straw hats. (laughs) Here, here. Hey, don't tear that up. I want that. What for? You told me you weren't going to buy a horse. I know. Now, look, Molly, let's talk this thing over. If we had a horse... We haven't got a horse, and we're not going to get a horse, and I don't want to talk any more about a horse. Is that clear, dearie? I I guess so. But gee whiz, if you'd only... Hey, where are you going? I'm going out in the backyard and hang up some clothes. Oh, don't go near the garage. Why not? Oh, well, I I got all that hay in there to stuff the tires with, and, well, it might catch on fire or something. Oh, I'll be careful. I rarely hang up the washing with a blowtorch in my hand. <laughs> I declare, if you don't think up the silly things to worry about. Oh, why did I ever purchase that percher on? I should have stole it. <laughs> I couldn't feel any more like a horse thief than I do now. When Molly finds out I got that nag out Hi, mister. Oh, hello, sis. Go away, will you? I got worries enough without you drawing away with your juvenile jabber. Go on, go away. Go home. Go anywhere. Hey, what you worried about, mister? I should think you'd be happy. You would? Well, gee, I'd be happy if I had a pony, I bet you. Maybe you would. <laughs> what was that? You think I got a pony? Sure, and a dandy big one, too. I saw that in your garage. Oh, my gosh. Now, look, mm-hmm. it's not so loud. I'm, I'm trying to keep it a secret from Mrs. McGee for a while. It's, 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 it's a surprise. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a dandy surprise, too, I bet you. <laughs> it sure is. It's going to be the darnest. Hey, how did you know I had a horse in the garage? What are you snooping around there for? Well, Willie Toops and me were playing catch and... Willie Toops and I, sis. It was not. It was just Willie Toops and me. You weren't even there, I bet you. <laughs> okay, okay, let it go. I did. And it rolled into your garage, and I went in to get it, and jeepers, was I ever surprised, I bet you. A green and white horse. <laughs> green and white? No, no, he's pure white. He's green and white now, Miss. Huh? Well, he tried to climb up on his back and knocked over a can of paint. <laughs> he did he ever look funny. Well, you wait till I get my hands on Willie. And you and Willie stay out of my garage, will you? That horse might kick you. Then what would you do? I'd kick him back. Oh, no. That ain't the proper attitude. Hey, to... mister, do all horses eat straw, hmm, do they, hmm, do they? Horses don't eat straw, sis. They eat hay. They sleep on straw. 
Your horse eats straw, I bet you. Oh, no, he doesn't. Oh, yes, he does. No, <laughs> oh, no, he doesn't. Oh, yes, he does. Oh, no, he... Well, how do you know? There's no straw in the garage. Oh, no? Huh? <laughs> what do you think the seat covers in your car were made of? French pastry? <laughs> I think I can explain everything. You can't explain a brute with long ears and a green face and terrific big eyes. Oh, it's just a horse. And I don't care if it's a whole thundering herd of... Oh, oh, what was that? A horse? Sure. H-O-A-R-S-E. Horse. It's mine. I bought it. You bought it? Yes. But, McGee, you promised. I know. You told me you wouldn't and well. then you... Oh, you've deceived me. No, I didn't deceive you. I bought that nag long before you made me promise. I, I was going to tell you, but you were dosed so dead set against it, I, well, gee whiz, I didn't... Come in. Oh. Hello. Hello, folks. Oh. <laughs> Hi, oh, Wimple. Mr. Wimple, what could we do for you? Oh, nothing, Mrs. McGee. I just stopped by to say hello. Hello. <laughs> Besides, Sweetie Face is busy at the house keeping you did see the soldiers. Oh, that can be pretty dangerous, can it, Mr. Wimple? Oh, indeed it can, Mrs. McGee. Sweetie Face told me once that with simple leverage, you can snap a man's arm like a dry twig. Hmm. I bet you were pretty careful after that. Well, wouldn't you be with your arm in a plastic case? Well, anyway, I think it's nice that she's teaching our soldiers how to take care of themselves. Oh, yes, it's just wonderful, Mrs. McGee. And nearly half of them take the full course. Hmm. How about the other half? <laughs> oh, they'll be all right, Mr. McGee, in time. <laughs> I sometimes think that your wife doesn't realize her own strength, Mr. Wimble. Did you ever think of that? Oh, often, Mrs. McGee. In fact, just this evening when she was instructing those soldiers, I said to her, Sweetie Face, I said, I don't believe you know your own strength. And she turned her little dimpled face to me and said, Oh, Wallace, I do too. And then? Oh, 
nothing much. But did you ever get hit in the face with a mess sergeant? <laughs> What a dog's life he leads. Never mind the dogs. I want to know about this horse. Well, I think we ought to keep it, Molly. In the first place, I only paid 75 bucks for him. 70 and... days, 75 dollars. That's ridiculous. Huh? And worse than that, it's unpatriotic to keep a horse now. What you mean? Think of all the glue that's needed for the back of defense stand. Oh. <laughs> this horse ain't anywhere near ready for the glue works. He's a fine animal in perfect condition and all for the love of Mike. Come in. Oh, hello, Mayor Latrivia. Good day, Mrs. McGee. Hello, McGee. Have you a horse? Well, Trivia, the way you get right to the point, somebody in your family must have been frightened by a pencil sharpener. <laughs> yes, I got a horse, so what? I wish to purchase it. So? No, 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 wait a minute. I don't want to sell. Anyway, what do you want it for, Latrivia? In view of the rubber shortage, McGee, the city council has decided to supplement our motorized fire equipment with horse-drawn vehicles. I'm empowered to offer you any fair price for your horse. Name it and you can have it, Mr. Mayor. McGee only paid... Never mind what I paid. Molly hasn't even seen the horse. Oh, haven't I? That green... Face brute with Well, the trivia hasn't seen it. Oh, very well. Let's take a look, McGee. Uh, where is it? It's in the garage, where it's probably kicked the radiator off the car by this time. Come, Mr. Mayor. I think you're going to get the bargain of your life. Ah, a green and white horse. Very decorative. Yeah. Some kids spilled some paint on him, the trivia. Shows how gentle he is that he didn't raise heck about uh, it. Will you take a hundred dollars for him? Oh, sure I will, but... Gee, there's no fun selling a horse just right off the bat like that. Let's stick her a while. <clears throat> well, all right, if you promise to come back to $100. <laughs> oh, we'll wind up at 100 <laughs> But first, we ought to argue a while. <laughs> I don't get to sell a horse every day, you know. <laughs> come on, sit down on the bench here and we'll kick it around. Hey, Molly, be careful. He might kick you. I'm not afraid of him. You go talk to the mayor. Hello there, you big bag of alfalfa. Are you ever winning my husband into buying you as the greatest mystery I... Oh, you poor thing. Who poured that paint all over you? Yes, it's a dirty shame, that's what it is. You wait till Mother gets some turpentine. I'll clean it all off now. <laughs> ah, stop nuzzling me, you big baby. <laughs> Don't look at me like that with those big brown eyes. Yes, wudgy, wudgy, wudgy. <laughs> now, don't you go away now. Mother's going in and get you a nice big carrot tonight. Oh, if you still insist on a hundred, Latrivia, take him away. Very well, McGee. We'll pick him up tonight. You do no such a thing. Huh? I beg your pardon, Mrs. McGee. We're going to keep this horse. Look how lonesome he looks. What he needs is a good home. Oh, but Molly, with the car in here, it's so crowded. And that's another thing. Get that car out of here and give this poor horse some room. <laughs> Since this new wartime went into effect, I've heard several women say they didn't know whether they were getting their husband's breakfast or supper. Not that they were complaining. Like all of us, they're glad of a chance to help save electric power. Glad to help in any way, big or little. In connection with daylight saving, may I make a helpful suggestion? Your kitchen will be more cheerful on dark mornings if you keep it protected with Johnson's Glow Coat. It will sparkle like new. Colors will be bright and fresh, and it will be protected, too, against wear and scuffing feet. In fact, the regular use of Glow Coat will make your linoleum last five times longer than if it were unprotected. Glow Coat is called self-polishing, which means that it needs no rubbing or buffing. It's a tremendous labor saver. You simply apply and let dry. But to get Glow Coat results, be sure to buy the real Johnson self-polishing Glow Coat. <laughs> to sell that lovely creature for a mere hundred dollars. For shame, dearie. <laughs> well, gee whiz, Molly. You were the one who... Never was... mind that. <laughs> it would be simply brutal to turn... Uh, yeah. uh, uh, by the way, what's the horse's name, McGee? McGee, what's his name? Lillian. Oh. <laughs> This is Harlow Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson's Wax Finishes for Home and Industry, inviting you to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. No program of better car maintenance is complete if it overlooks the paint job. You've got to take care of the outside as well as what's under the hood. 
And you can do it easily with Johnson's Car New, the labor-saving polish that both cleans and polishes in one application. Two jobs at once with a minimum of work. Car New, made by the makers of Johnson's Wax, gains in popularity every month. Your car looks like new when you use Car New, spelled C-A-R-N-U. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Johnson Wax Program with Bibber McGee and Molly. The makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat present Bibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn, with songs by the King's Men and music by Billy Mills. The show opens with New Sun in the Sky. about this war, it's bringing people in all communities closer together. It offers more and more of us, men, women, and children, opportunities to be of service. Many of you ladies face the problem of keeping your homes up, taking care of your families in less time so you can give part of your time to defense work when needed. Anything that can save you unnecessary work is welcome, which means that in millions of homes, Johnson's self-polishing glow coat is most certainly welcome. With Glow Coat, you can keep your linoleum and other floors clean and beautiful and save hours of work. You do away with floor scrubbing. And you save again because there's no rubbing or buffing required with Glow Coat. The regular use of Glow Coat makes linoleum last six times longer than an unprotected floor. If you have signed our government's consumer pledge to take better care of the things you have, you'll find Glow Coat a great help. Be sure you get the real thing. Johnson's self-polishing glow coat. indignantly deny that Wistful Vista is a one-horse town, but we cheerfully admit that the McGees are a one-horse family. <laughs> and here with Lillian, that's the horse, in the garage, and her co-owners in the living room, one lying on the sofa and the other knitting, we find Fibber McGee and Molly. McGee, why don't you go out and shovel off the front walk? Huh? You get that lying down like that right after a hearty lunch. Hey, maybe I better at that. I won't be available very much till after March 15th, you know. Where'll you be until March 15th? Oh, you know, deep in the heart of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> the way our out go eats up our income. Hey, that reminds me. Did you feed the horse? Yes, I fed her while you were snoring here on the sofa. I was not snoring. I'm merely a baritone breather. <laughs> What'd you give Lillian? Did you give her her oats? Yes, but she didn't seem to like them very much. I never heard of an egg that didn't like oats. Must be off her feed. Yes, she probably looked in the wind and saw you eating like a horse and got jealous. <laughs> no kidding, Molly. Wouldn't she eat her oats? Well, not all of them. Maybe I put too much cream and sugar on them. Cream and sugar on Lillian's oats? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and then I tried her with some cornflakes. She liked those fine. She ate four boxes of them. Four bucks? Oh, well, that ain't so much for a growing horse. <laughs> Say, you know, McGee, she's got bad table manners, too. Huh? She kept blowing the cornflakes off the spoon like this, you know. <laughs> I guess I better feed her myself after this, Molly. I know more about... Come in. Well, I'll be... Horatio K. Boomer! Hello, Mr. Boomer. Good day, my dear. And a tittering Tuesday to you, titmouse. <laughs> Haven't seen you for a long time, Boomer. What you been doing? Frankly, my pestiferous young pickle puss, <laughs> I've been working for the government for the past 90 days as an Arkansas geologist. Well, what on earth is an Arkansas geologist, Mr. Boomer? Very interesting profession. We take big rocks, make little rocks. <laughs> I catch on. 
One of those jobs where your board and room are thrown in after you are. <laughs> exactly, exactly. By the way, Boomer, I've never been dunked in a dungeon myself. What kind of food do you get? Not bad. Not bad at all, bug face. <laughs> I remember one night I had a tasty appetizer of stuffed eggs Romanoff, a delightful puri de mango, julienne, romaine salad with Russian dressing, breast of guinea hen under glass, an choke with hollandaise, and a bit of camembert with my demitasse. <laughs> Heavenly days, that sounds like a New York restaurant. It was, Golden Girl, it was. Unfortunately, I was reapprehended that same evening and returned to the Bastille, <laughs> where slum conditions prevail. <laughs> Which isn't bad if you care for slum. <laughs> well, what'd you stop by here for, Boomer? Want us to join the Crook of the Month Club? <laughs> <laughs> That's very good, Limberlip, very good. <laughs> and clean, too. <laughs> I can tell that one to my mother when she gets out. <laughs> but I just stopped in to request a small favor. What's the favor, Mr. Boomer? Just wondered if I could leave this suitcase in your care for a day or so. Why? What's in it? A few valuables belonging to an old aunt of mine. She's moving and doesn't want this stuff lying around. Oh, well, all right, Mr. Boomer. We'll take care of it. Is your aunt moving today? Yes, yeah, she is, my dear. Seems that her husband, my Uncle Winthrop, by marriage, on my father's side, yeah. he was the only one who was on father's side. <laughs> anyway, it seems he had a little printing press in the basement that made too much noise. Well, the neighbors complain? No, but we began to suspect it was being heard in Washington, D.C. <laughs> you know what I mean. If you do, keep your trap shut. <laughs> Thank you very much, Glamour Gam, and a stiff little nod to you, little stiff. <laughs> Gentlemen, we ask you again not to let up in your purchase of United States defense bonds. And we are proud to announce a new bond between this country and its gallant defenders. Fibber McGee and Molly programs for the rest of this season will be sent by delayed shortwave broadcast to our troops in Iceland, Newfoundland, Ireland, Cuba, Bermuda, Trinidad, Panama Canal Zone, the Philippines, the Far East, and all parts of the world. We hope the boys enjoy the broadcast as much as we do the thought of sending them a few smiles from home. right by keeping this suitcase for Boomer? Well, I don't know why not, McGee. So that was a ridiculous excuse, his dear old aunt moving. Yeah. I suppose it's full of counterfeit dough or stolen goods or hot inner tubes or something. <laughs> I got a good notion to open it. McGee, you'll do no such a thing. Huh? It wouldn't be right or decent. What's in that suitcase is absolutely none of our oh, business. Well. The idea of betraying a trust like that. For shame. Oh, well, gee. Anyway, I... you can't open it. It's locked. How do you know? Well, my hand accidentally bumped against the latches two or three times and it didn't open. Uh, I'll bet I could get it open. 
Give me a hairpin. I will not. It's one thing to have it open accidentally and quite another thing to deliberately break into it. Well, I guess you're right, Molly. After all, Boomer did trust us with it. Why, of course he did. Yeah? And if we're not the kind of people who can be trusted with a little suitcase, I'll bet it would spring open if you knocked it off the table. <laughs> I'll bet it would, too, but, gee, I'd feel awful cheap doing it. Oh, I would, too. Mm -hmm. Is the table high enough? (laughs) No, the bookcase would be better. It's higher. Okay. Now, if I leave it up here on the bookcase... That's it. Now, if somebody should slam the door hard and it jarred off onto the floor and sprung open, nobody could blame us. That'd be an act of providence. (laughs) See who that is, providence. (laughs) Come in. Abigail. Oh, how do you do, my dear? And Mr. McGee. Ah, sis, what's amiss? <laughs> Why, nothing at all, Mr. McGee, really. I merely wish to make some inquiries regarding the horse you purchased last week. Oh, why, certainly, Abigail. <laughs> well, you tell her, Molly. You braided Lillian's hair this morning, so you'll know the main fact. <laughs> <laughs> I just adore listening to you when you're in one of your humorous moods. <laughs> that was it, too. <laughs> do, do tell some jokes. <laughs> okay. Well, it seems there was a traveling salesman. McGee! <laughs> just okay. what was it uh, you wanted to know about Abigail Lillian? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean Lillian Abigail. <laughs> Natural mistake. <laughs> well, first, my dear... <laughs> Uh, first of all, is she well broken to the saddle? Oh, she's a riding horse, all right, Uppy. What kind of saddle do you like? Kentucky, McClellan, English, or Western? Well, I personally prefer a modified English type, Mr. McGee. I, um, I have job furs, you see. Oh, you poor thing. <laughs> Jodfers. I had Jodfers once. <laughs> Couldn't ride a horse for six months. The doctor says it was the worst case of Jodfers he ever saw. Started with a little small Jodfer on my neck and spread now, out. Now, Mr. McGee, Jodfers is not a disease. Jodfers are a type of riding breeches. For women? Yes. And it's still a disease. <laughs> Prejudice, McGee. Oh, uh, by the way, when I saw Mr. McGee leading Lillian around the block this morning, she seemed, uh, well, uh, just a touch uh, uh, sway-backed. <laughs> oh, really? I hadn't noticed. What do you mean, sway-backed? She ain't sway-backed. She's just big-hearted. <laughs> <laughs> and what is that to do with a sagging spine, Mr. McGee? Her spine don't sag, I tell you. Her heart is so big it pulls her down in the middle. <laughs> Mr. McGee, I seem to sense an attitude of ridicule on your part. Oh, now, Abigail. And for your information, Mr. McGee, I hold seven blue ribbons for equitation. And furthermore... Furthermore what? Uh, pardon me, but this suitcase on the bookcase is about to fall off. I'll, I'll push it back a little. Oh. Mm. Now, that's much better. Uh, what was I saying? Oh, oh, yes. Goodbye. <laughs> Equitation, my eye. Suppose she is a good swimmer. <laughs> What's that got to do with riding a horse? Well, search me, but shove that suitcase a little forward again, McGee. It'll never fall off that way. Well, thanks to Uppy, the meddlesome old moose. <clears throat> there. There we are. It'll fall now if a mosquito winks at it. Where can we get a mosquito at this time of year? I was just speaking metaphorically. What I meant to say... Oh, <laughs> well, folks, say, I hear you have a house guest. House guest? Yeah, somebody named Lillian. Oh, oh, yeah, Lillian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's a great kid, too. Although, now, she's out right now. Well, I'd like to meet her sometime. Blonde or brunette? Well, I don't know. I'd say she's almost a platinum blonde, wouldn't you, McGee? Yeah, with big brown eyes, Harlow, nice white teeth, and the softest lips. Oh, is she married? I don't think so. Is she, McGee? I think she was once. <laughs> Some old horse named Prince, I think. <laughs> He's in the army now. Last I heard of him, he was, uh... He was, uh... Well, I think he's just under a major. (laughs) Say, 
Why'd you ask, Mr. Wilcox? You're married, Jim. Oh, I haven't got any romantic interest in this Lillian. She merely interests me as a prospect for Johnson products. I'd like to have a heart-to-heart talk with her one of these days. How old is she? Oh, I'd say about 18 or 19. Oh, great. Just the right age. She'll be getting hitched one of these days. <laughs> And have a little home of her own. And I hate to think of a girl settling down without knowing about Johnson's wax and Johnson's self-polishing glow coat. Say, incidentally, is Lillian a local girl? No, she's from Kentucky, Mr. Wilcox. The bluegrass country. Oh. <laughs> Accent? Uh, just a trace of southern drool at times. <laughs> Why? Well, these southern girls sure know how to make a home. Famous old southern hospitality, you know. The old mansions down there have always been great users of Johnson's Wax. That's why some of them have been so well-preserved. And it's even more important now, isn't it? It surely is. And there's nothing like Johnson's Wax to give longer life and better wear to wood and enameled products and a thousand other things. Just like Johnson's self-polishing glow coat beautifies and preserves linoleum with a minimum of expense and work. Gee, I wish Lillian were here so I could tell her. Well, now you come back any time, Mr. Wilcox. We'll be glad to introduce you. If you really want to make a hit with her, Harlow, why, bring her an apple or a carrot. Oh! <laughs> Vegetarian, eh? Strictly. <laughs> Say, I've got a great idea. Huh? My wife is going to a fashion show at the Bonton tomorrow. Uh-huh. I'll have her call Lillian and invite her to go along. How's that? <laughs> oh, well, now, I don't know. Oh, now, listen. A girl's got to get out and meet people. <laughs> She's got to get out. She can't just hang around home and eat carrots and apples? <laughs> what do you think she is, a horse? <laughs> oh, dear. I can just see Lillian at the Bonton, McGee, giving the new spring hats the horse laugh. <laughs> Wait till Harlow tries to call her. She'll give him the old stall. <laughs> bet, hey. What? That suitcase didn't fall down when he slammed the door. Well, maybe he didn't close it tight, McGee. Close it again. Okay. There. there. Oh. McGee, look. Oh. Look what came out of that suitcase. Oh, get a load of that silverware. It's stolen, that's what it is. Look at the box. And the knickknacks. And the jewelry. And the money. Look at that water dough. Hey, this is a case for the cops. Why, Molly. certainly it is. Call them up quick, okay. dearie. I don't want this stuff in the house any longer than necessary. <clears throat> Give me the phone. Thanks. <clears throat> Hello, operator. Give me the police... To... Oh, is that you, Mert? Oh, dear. <laughs> How's every little thing, Mert? Says, eh? What's say, Mert? Your sister, Gypsy Ruth. The fan dancer... Huh? Wants me to see if she's taken off too much. Oh, heavenly days, McGee. That's indecent. No, no, it ain't. She's, she's making out her income tax. <laughs> What's say, Mert? Okay, thanks anyway, Mert. She can't take any calls from us, Molly. I forgot to pay the bill. Oh, dear, oh, dear. I went over to Mrs. Toops and used their phone, McGee. You keep an eye on this jewelry and stuff. I'll right? say I will. Boy, what a load of loot. What's over? I never realized Boomer was such a sterling character. <laughs> Why, there's enough of this stuff in... Uh-oh, better get this down to the side. Come in. Hi, mister. Oh, hello, little girl. Now, go away, will you? I'm busy. I, I got some important business to attend to. Go on, beat it. Go. Oh, you're always too busy to talk to me, I bet you. Mm. I just want to go out in the garage and see your horse. Mm. Okay, okay, okay. Go ahead. Gee, thanks, mister. Can I feed her a lump of sugar? Hmm? Can I please? Hmm? Well, <laughs> you better just talk to her, sis. <laughs> Give me the lump of sugar. Here you are. Thanks. Horses don't appreciate the value of this stuff nowadays. Now, don't let Lillian kick you, sis. Oh, <laughs> I'm not afraid of horses, I bet you. No? <laughs> I go down to a farm every summer. Oh, you do? Hmm? I says, oh, you do? Do what? <laughs> Go down to a farm every summer. Gee, so do I. <laughs> That's what I... Oh, all right. Go on, sis. Go see Lillian. All right. I want to see her little baby, too. Baby? Mm-hmm. Our horse hasn't got any baby. Oh, <laughs> yes, she has, I bet you. <laughs> oh, no, she has. Oh, yes, she has. Oh, no, she... What makes you think our horse has a baby? My daddy said so. Oh, he did, eh? Your daddy done told you, huh? Mm-hmm. <laughs> what does he know about our horse? Well, I don't know, mister, but this morning when you were leading Lillian around the block, daddy saw you out the window and he said to my mama, Hey, Susie! Get a load of the hoofs on that hay burner. If she isn't a mother, I never saw one. <laughs> Thank you. The King's Men and the 
deep in the heart of Texas. Hi, yippee, 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 The stars at night are big and bright. Deep in the heart of Texas. The prairie sky is wide and high. Deep in the heart of Texas. The sage in bloom is like perfume. Deep in the heart of Texas. Suitcase full of stuff. I won't have it in the house. Me either. I no offense. Even if I am always around the house. <laughs> you get them always stolen goods, fence around the house. <laughs> hey, funny, McGee. <laughs> I got a big laugh with that in a high school play once. I wrote it myself too. You did? Yeah. I called it Abe's Irish Rose, and it was all about a young couple. Of you women didn't that... write that. Ann Nichols wrote that, and it ran for years in New York. It did. Sure. And she never paid me a dime royalty. <laughs> How do you like that? I guess I'd better copyright my other one. What other one? Tobacco Road? <laughs> oh, but there's a good title. I can use that sometime. My other play is about a rich millionaire playboy that gets married seven times. <laughs> His name is Moore, and I call the play the Moore the Marrier. <laughs> it's a play on words, but people yeah. go for that kind of stuff. Oh, here, please, McGee, get the suitcase. I hope they caught Boomer. That guy is as slippery as a plate of watermelon when you're wearing your best white pants. Who? Me. Oh. Come in. Oh. Oh, hi, Latrivia. We thought it was the cops. And Mr. Boomer, what on earth are you two doing together? Seems to have been a slight error in judgment, my dear. Yes, indeed. I'll say there was. By leaving that suitcase here, you... Excuse me, please. I'll handle this. Mrs. McGee, you called the police, I believe, and had them arrest Mr. Boomer. I did. Any man who would deliberately leave a suitcase full of stolen goods without... Ah, yes. Better and better. I am now accused of being a thief, and in front of witnesses, too. Well, you are. I think you'd better not say any more, McGee, until you've heard the whole story. What story? We have checked thoroughly on Mr. Boomer, and we find that his aunt is moving today. This suitcase and contents is her property, and Mr. Boomer did leave it with you for safekeeping. There is no case against him whatsoever. Oh. Oh, dear. Well... Uh, I'm sorry, Boomer, but you know how it is. Give a dog a bad name, and people are bound to bark up the wrong tree. <laughs> I made it. <laughs> Keep your condolences, prune pit. I have been sorely wounded, cut to the quick. My self-esteem has been rudely shattered, and I shall seek equity in the court of law. What? My attorneys, Wagstaff, Wormser, Clamwell, Offendurfer, Bergheim, O'Toole, and a sightly wench in their outer office... <laughs> We'll serve papers on you shortly. 
You have been guilty of libel, slander, and defamation of character. Can he do that to us, Mr. Mayor? As a public official, Mrs. McGee, I cannot advise you. But uh, privately, in my capacity of lawyer, I should say he has a clear-cut case. He can recover large amounts of damages. I'll make it easy, Riff Raff. Fifty thousand. Fifty thousand? Why, you big crook? A hundred thousand. Oh, yeah? I bet you planted that suitcase here on purpose. Knowing that we couldn't resist the tent... <laughs> knowing that it might come open, and then you could sue us. You... you chiseler. Two hundred thousand. Do I hear any further bidding? Going, going, gone to the overnourished little termite in the repulsive necktie. <laughs> if I might make a suggestion, my friends, let's talk this thing over. I'm sure there's been some misunderstanding. Two hundred thousand, not a cent less. The honor of the boomers is at stake, and if there's anything I like, it's a good stake. <laughs> yes, indeed. I'm quite sure that if a proper apology was made to Mr. Boomer... I won't apologize. That guy's as crooked as a hotel coat hanger. And I won't get a... He won't get a nickel out of me. Pardon me a minute. Now, isn't there something in the law, Mr. Mayor, about a complainant coming into court with clean hands? Yes, there is, Mrs. McGee, now that you speak of it. If a complainant wishes to sue and his past record has been... Such I'll come down become... to 50,000. <laughs> he can't sue anybody. He's been in more courts than Helen Wills. And if he thinks for one minute... Uh, that... 10,000. Why, he's got a prison record as long as my arm, and if the government were asked about him... Uh, 500. <laughs> Just a moment, Mr. Boomer. I think it might be wise to drop the case right here. If it's true that you have a criminal record... Nothing of I... the sort, nothing of the sort. Merely because I have frequently been the unfortunate victim of legal persecution, never let it be said that Horatio K. Boomer would not seek to vindicate his integrity. How about a hundred bucks, Pipsqueak? Uh, <laughs> say, how about it, Mr. Mayor? Under the circumstances, Mrs. McGee, I don't like to see you do it, but if he really starts suit, it would cost you more than that to defend yourself. All right. Pay him, dearie. Well, uh, Okay. I just got a hundred on me. Here, Boomer. Ah, thank you, my boy. Thank you. We shall consider the whole unfortunate matter closed as of now. Come, Mr. Mayor. Let us not intrude further upon the time of these good peasants. Ah, my suitcase, please, Harlot. Thank you. Well, of all the dirty loads... McGee, look huh? out the window. Huh? Where? On the porch. Boomer is giving the mayor some money. Huh? He's dividing up the hundred dollars with him. Why, those dirty crooks. It was a frame-up. Let me at it. Corey's forty-five fifty. There you are, Mr. Mayor, and I hope that in the future... All right, just a minute there. I caught you in the act, didn't I? What do you mean, McGee? Oh, we saw you divvying up the swag, didn't we, dearie? I'll say we did. Working together, huh? Just a couple of shakedown artists. Bunko boys. A fine mayor. Yes, you... helping a crook like Boomer to shake down innocent citizens. Why, of all Excuse the... Excuse me, Mrs. McGee. Mr. Boomer's aunt is moving into a house owned by me. The first month's rent in advance is $50. This is the $50. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Excuse me, Latrivia. I guess I... My lawyers will call on you tomorrow, McGee, to start suit for defamation of character. And I have no prison record. Good day. Oh, dear. Oh, sure. Oh, taxi. <laughs> has had the experience of rubbing a nice red apple to make it shine. But few people realize that the apple shines because it is protected with a coating of wax. The petals of the rose are also wax protected. So marvelously does nature safeguard the life and beauty of her kingdom. Centuries ago, man began to copy nature by using wax for protection. Over 50 years ago, S.C. Johnson perfected a blending of waxes for use on floors. Today, Johnson's wax is used in millions of homes, not only for protection of floors, furniture, and woodwork, but also to bring greater beauty to our homes. A Johnson wax floor grows more beautiful every day. Floors that are waxed never need scrubbing. They're easily cleaned, and work is saved throughout the year. Be sure always to have genuine Johnson's wax, either paste, liquid, or cream, in your home. It has over 100 labor-saving uses. The trivia just called up. Well, what does he want now? He isn't going to sue. Oh. <laughs> he was just scaring us. <laughs> well, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> Say, how did you happen to have $100 in your pocket? Who, me? Yes, you. Where'd you get it? 
out of that suitcase. <laughs> I thought it might be counterfeit, and I was going to check with the bank. <laughs> Good night. Good night, all. <laughs> This is Harlow Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson's Wax Finishes for Home and Industry, inviting you all to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. Have you looked carefully at the paint job of your car recently? Chances are it needs cleaning and polishing, an essential part of any program of better car maintenance. You can give your car back its original showroom shine with Johnson's Car New, the labor-saving polish that both cleans and polishes in one application, two jobs at once in quick time. It's no fun driving a car that's dull and dingy. Why not make a note now to buy a can of Johnson's Car New tomorrow? It's spelled C-A-R-N-U. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. You're listening to Hojo Radio. More classic old-time radio coming your way next. Palm Olive Soap, your beauty hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, is as sociable as the next teacher especially if the next teacher happens to be Mr. Philip Boynton. But unfortunately, Mr. Boynton, who teaches biology at Madison, is a a rather shy individual. Yes, indeed. For a fellow who spends so much time studying life, he certainly manages to get very little on him. (laughs) Of course, there are rumors around the school that I'm that way about Mr. Boynton. Now, I don't know exactly what that way means, but if feeling that way means feeling this way, then I guess I'm that way about Mr. Boynton. <laughs> anyway, last week he accepted my invitation to invite me to the faculty dance Saturday night. And so bright and early Saturday morning, I asked one of my pupils, Walter Denton, to drive me down to the beauty parlor in his jalopy. Unlike the new Hudson, Walter's car isn't one you step down into. His car, most people back away from. <laughs> It's a very streamlined little job. No windows, no top, and no windshield. All in all, it's the coldest hot rod in town. If it's too cool for you, Miss Brooks, I can put up the top. The top? Where is that? In the back on the floor. (laughs) No, thanks, Walter. It doesn't matter how my hair looks now. Antoine will change me into something believable. I appreciate your giving me this lift today, Walter. Oh, it's a pleasure, Miss Brooks. A pleasure and a privilege, because I'm so fond of you both as a person and a teacher. You know, that's one thing about Madison High. We sure got some wonderful teachers. Now, take Mr. Boynton. Granted. He sure is tops. I ran into him the other night at the movies. Incidentally, he was with another member of the faculty, Miss Enright. Please, Walter, not so soon after breakfast. Oh, I forgot you and Miss Enright aren't exactly stuck on each other That, Walter, is an understatement Now, let's just forget about her, shall we? Sure, I'll be happy to forget about her I never think about her much anyway Fine Walter Yeah? Was she sitting close to Mr. Boynton? (laughs) Who? The lady we decided to forget about Well, I can practically give you a blow-by-blow Because I sat right behind him in the movie And what's your report, G2? Nothing. Nothing? They were so dull, I spent half my time watching the picture. (laughs) You should have asked for your money back. Of course, she did whisper a couple of things into his ear, but I couldn't hear what they were very well. She has a funny way of purring when she talks. There's nothing funny about it. To her, purring comes naturally. (laughs) Of course, she tried to hold Mr. Boynton's hand once or twice, but she didn't quite make it. Why not? Most of the time, he had it in a bag of popcorn. (laughs) Well, it would serve her right if she got salt all over her manicure. Here's the beauty parlor, Walter. Uh, Would it be convenient for you to pick me up in a couple of hours? Oh, sure, sure. I gotta get a haircut anyhow, and I usually go to Barney's Barbershop right down the street. I was thinking of getting a butch haircut this time. Well, from what I've seen of the kids who get their haircut at Barney's, he can butch up any kind of a haircut. Antoine? Well, if it isn't Miss Brooks, a long time no see, like the man says. 
What man? Oh, there you go. You're not in my shop two minutes and you're pulling my leg. But I don't care. I'm delighted to see you at any time. You're such a challenge to a beautician. <laughs> challenge? Yes, you see, you come into my shop so infrequently, I have to start from scratch each time. <laughs> of course, you do have a load of natural beauty. Thanks, loads. <laughs> but then so does a rosebush. And even it, with all its natural loveliness, must be properly and frequently cared for in order to retain that beauty. Its soil must be irrigated, its roots watered, its leafy branches gently sprinkled. Well, don't stand there. Turn the hose on me. <laughs> uh, before I assign you to a booth, uh, tell me, Miss Brooks, what prompted you to come in this morning? Oh, it's very simple, Antoine. There's a faculty dance at Madison High tonight, and I thought it would be nice to look like a human being. All the big jobs they bring to Antoine. <laughs> It's a feeble artist, indeed, who cannot rise above his subject. I shall make you my masterpiece. All I ask in return is that you promise to visit Antoine's once a week. Aren't you forgetting something? I'm a schoolteacher. You know, it isn't an accident that we of the faculty have a faculty for always looking like the faculty. <laughs> Beauty parlors are a luxury we can rarely afford. Well, apparently that doesn't apply to all teachers. Uh, one of my best customers is a teacher. In fact, she has an appointment here in a few minutes. Uh, uh, Miss Enright, uh, do you know her? Yes, we both teach English at Madison. Oh, then you and Miss Enright have something in common. I suppose you could call him that, yes. <laughs> Oh, she's a wonderful person. Very active in the Parent Teachers Association and in all sorts of civic functions. Uh, what do you think of her? She's fine. Good teacher. Uh, confidentially, I don't like her either. <laughs> and even though I should be grateful for the new customers I get through her connections, I can't help feeling that she's very overbearing. That's my honest opinion, and when it comes to people, I believe that honesty is the best policy. Well, here I am, Antoine. Miss Enright, how wonderful to see you. <laughs> Your policy just lapsed. <laughs> Why, Miss Brooks, what are you doing in a beauty parlor? Oh, I just thought I'd let Antoine do a little lily gilding. I haven't started yet. I'm going to make Miss Brooks look like a thing of beauty. Is there time? <laughs> You know, we have to be back at school by Monday. Oh, I'll make it. Antoine's going to put more men on the job. <laughs> well, uh, if you'll excuse me for a moment, I'll arrange booth three for you, Miss Antoine. Oh, do that, Antoine. Uh, Miss Brooks, now that we're alone, there's something I think you should know. That you were at the movies with Mr. Boynton last night? Well, how did you... Were you there, too? No, just my emissary. <laughs> I must admit, Miss Brooks, I thought you'd be a little more upset about it. Upset? Me? Because Mr. Boynton chooses to go out with another English teacher? Of course I'm not upset. In fact, I had quite a laugh over it. A laugh? I thought I'd split my infinitive. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I happen to know that Mr. Boynton once heard the expression, let's live a little. Yes. So that's what he does. He lives as little as possible. <laughs> no, I'm not worried about what Mr. Boynton does when he's not with me. Look, Miss Brooks, I like to do things in an open and above-board manner. I'm going to lay my cards on the table. Good. Take them out of your sleeve and deal. <laughs> What's the first card? Just this. I know you've booked Mr. Boynton for the faculty dance tonight, but remember, there's always tomorrow, and I don't give up easily. Well, good for you, Salty Nails. <laughs> Don't underestimate me, my dear. The next time Mr. Boynton and I walk down a middle aisle, it may not be in a theater. Be sure to invite me to the wedding. And, Miss Enright, if you ever become a mother, remember, I'd love one of the kittens. <laughs> ready for you now, Miss Enright. Yes, coming, Antoine. I'll see you and Mr. Boynton at the dance, Miss Brooks. I'll be looking forward to it with considerable revulsion. <laughs> oh, oh, booth three. Here it is. Uh, sit right down here, Miss Enright. Antoine, before you do anything for me, I want you to take care of Miss Brooks. Uh, but your appointment... I'll with... wait. There's a certain way I want you to take care of Miss Brooks. First of all, I want you to comb her hair up in back and give her bangs in front. But that wouldn't suit her face at all. Exactly. 
Then I want you to be sure and see that she's got pounds of makeup on. Plenty of rouge, eyeshadow, everything. But she won't like that. Neither will Mr. Boynton. I know the type. And whatever you do, don't let Miss Brooks look into a mirror. Tell her, uh, tell her to wait for her first reaction from a member of the opposite sex. But, Miss Enright, suppose she doesn't want me to... She'll agree to anything you suggest. She knows you're an expert beautician. Well, then how can I betray her faith in me? I'd feel like a traitor. A despicable traitor. Antoine, dozens of women patronize this shop at my suggestion. And at my suggestion, they go elsewhere. Now, are you going to give Miss Brooks the works or not? Well, Benedict Arnold made a nice living for years. <laughs> We are all finished. Remember now, no mirrors, Miss Brooks. All right, Antoine, if you say so. I'll leave it up to the public. Oh, there's Walter, parked as usual, right in front of a fire plug. <laughs> well, here I am. Let's go. Uh, sorry, lady, I'm waiting for Miss Brooks. Take another look, Walter. It's me. Holy cow, get in quick. I'll take you to the receiving hospital. <laughs> Or better yet, I'll give you first aid. I'm the Red Cross chairman of our class, you know. Well, why do I need first aid? Your mouth, it's all cut. Oh, you're just not used to seeing me with lipstick on. Start the car, Walter. I didn't intend to take so long. Mrs. Davis will be wondering what happened to me. When she sees you, she'll still be wondering. <laughs> Gosh, that hair comb. Those bangs. What's wrong with these bangs? Are they too long? Oh, well... In all the time you've known me, Miss Brooks, have I ever consciously been fresh or tried to hurt your feelings? No, Walter, never. And I can answer your question honestly. They're not long enough. They're frustrating, Miss Brooks. <laughs> what are you talking about, Walter? Well, they start out all right, but just when they really get going, boom, they stop. <laughs> right at the tip of your nose. <laughs> oh, that's just a few hairs that were blown out of place in this hopped-up pie plate of yours. How do I look otherwise? Well, frankly, Miss Brooks, I thought you were more beautiful without all that stuff. I mean, well, gosh, with your natural beauty, you could have been a famous stage actress or even a model or a big movie star. I've often wondered, what made you become a school teacher anyway? I couldn't resist the money. <laughs> Starring Eve Arden will continue in just a moment, but first, here is Vern Smith. Regardless of age, skin type, or previous beauty care, doctors prove you too may win a lovelier complexion with palm olive soap. But to win this lovelier complexion, you must stop improper cleansing. Instead, use palm olive the way doctors advise. 36 doctors, leading skin specialists, advised using palm olive soap this way for 1,285 women with all types of skin. Young, old, dry, oily, normal. And using palm olive soap alone, two out of three won lovelier complexions. Oily skin looked less oily. Dull, drab skin wonderfully brighter. Coarse-looking skin appeared finer. Here's what the doctors advise. Wash your face with palm olive soap three times a day. Massage with palm olive's wonderful beauty lather for 60 seconds each time to get palm olive's full beautifying effect. Then rinse. Look for improvement within 14 days. For doctors prove this way, using palm olive alone really works. So get palm olive soap and start today to win a lovelier complexion. And ladies, enter the $100,000 49 Gold Rush Contest. The makers of palm olive soap offer $49,000 first prize and over 4,900 other prizes. Get entry blanks and complete rules from your dealer now. You may win a fortune in cash. <laughs> Walter took me home from Antoine's, and as my new bangs and I entered the front door, my landlady, Mrs. Davis, came out of the living room. Hello, Mrs. Davis. Oh, how do you do, madam? If you're looking for Miss Brooks, she isn't in. I'm her landlady. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I can refresh your memory. Good morning, Mrs. Davis. I can't pay the rent till next week. Connie Brooks, where in the world did you get that makeup? Antoine's beauty parlor. You didn't leave much there, did you? <laughs> Although I suppose it is attractive to a male. 
By the way, has he called? Mr. Boynton, you mean? Not this morning, Connie. And I know why you didn't get any calls last night, either. Why? I discovered our phone wasn't working. But I fixed it about an hour ago. You fixed it? Yes, I went downtown and paid the bill. <laughs> you know, Connie, as one gets used to your new look, it's not half bad. Well, I should hope not. After spending three hours in a hot booth, the least I can expect... I'll get it. Hello? Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. This is Mr. Poynton. I thought I'd better call to ask what time I can pick you up tonight. I wouldn't want to barge in without giving you ample time to get ready. Oh, you can come over any time, Mr. Boynton. It never takes me more than a few minutes to fix up. Well, then I'll be over about seven. Uh, you know, I tried to reach you several times last night, but your phone was out of order. Yes, I just heard about it. I was quite disappointed when you didn't answer, but while I was combing some new white mice I've acquired, Miss Enright dropped by and asked me if I wanted to go to the movies. What did you do with the other mice? I mean... <laughs> Where did you go after the movie? Ice cream parlor? Oh, no, I was full. The popcorn's very good at the Paramount. Yes, I know. Don't they have a slogan that goes, if it's Paramount picture, it's the best popcorn in town? Well, I, I don't know about that, Miss Brooks, but this wasn't a Paramount picture. It was an independent. It was about some girl with a lot of money who wants her sweetheart to quit being a poor songwriter and work in her father's doorknob factory. <laughs> Does he? No, but he writes a big hit song after they separate. And when he's got as much money as her father, he asks her to marry him again. And this time she says yes. I can't understand it. Me either. You ought to see the girl this fellow proposes to. She's got two inches of makeup on and she wears bangs. Bangs? <laughs> the most ridiculous looking getup you ever saw. How any man in his right mind could fall for anybody like that would... Well, I won't keep you any longer, Miss Brooks. I'll pick you up at seven. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, I wish I hadn't let Walter go home. He could have taken me back to Antoine's. I'll get it, Tony. Well, Osgood Conklin, how is Madison's handsome principal today? Uh, fine, Margaret, fine. As you know, my wife's preparing all the refreshments for the dance tonight, and she wondered if you'd be kind enough to help her out with a few sandwiches. Why, of course, Osgood. Shall I make the same kind of sandwiches I did last time? White fish and peanut butter? <laughs> No, no, thank you. I've brought some Hello, things. Mr. Conklin. Miss Brooks has been to the hairdressers, Osgood. Doesn't she look interesting? Well, uh, I really don't know. It's hard to tell. I, I can see you all right, Miss Brooks, but how in the world can you see me? <laughs> oh, it's easy, Mr. Conklin. I just blow a little, and there you are. As a matter of fact, I've got to get back to the beauty parlor right away. Do you think you could give me a lift? I suppose so, Miss Brooks. And, Mrs. Davis, you'll find the ingredients for the sandwiches in this package right here. All right, Osgood. I'll get started right away. See you later, Connie. Goodbye, Mrs. Davis. Well, come along, Miss Brooks. I'll drop you off. White fish and peanut butter? <laughs> As I recall, Mr. Conklin, the beauty parlor is only a couple of blocks past your house, so I won't be taking you too far out of your way. Oh, that's perfectly all right, Miss Brooks. I hope you'll forgive me for seeming so taken aback when you first came in, but, well, you did look quite unlike a school teacher. Is that bad? On Saturdays, no. In fact, I, uh, I rather admire a woman who takes the time to enhance her charms. Confidentially, I've been trying to stampede Mrs. Conklin into a beauty salon for years, but she just can't see it. Doesn't believe in powder, rouge, lipstick. None of the refinements. What does she want with refinements? She's got you. That is, she's uh, got you. <laughs> Excuse me, we're just passing my house. I always honk the horn when I'm in the neighborhood. Gives my wife and daughter a feeling of security. <laughs> But as you just said, Miss Brooks, she's got me. That's the trouble. She doesn't have to patronize beauty shops to hold on to me, and she knows it. Of course, if she had some reason to be jealous of me, she... Jealous. Miss Brooks, do you think that if Martha were jealous... Oh, pardon me, Mr. I... Conklin, but if you'll just pull up here, this is Antoine. Where? It's that little building with the dimple in the door. <laughs> Thanks for the lift, Mr. Conklin. You're welcome, Miss Brooks. And we can pursue the topic of my wife's peccadilloes at the dance tonight. Oh, definitely. I'm one of the best peccadillo dancers in town. <laughs> well, that does it, Miss Brooks. Am I completely plain again, Antoine? If you were any plainer, you'd fade right into the woodwork. <laughs> You, 
I'm home, Mrs. Davis. She should be back any... Oh, wait a minute. She just came in. Come to the phone, Connie. It's Mr. Boynton. Again? I wonder what he wants now. Thanks, Mrs. Davis. Hello? Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. Mrs. Davis told me you were at the beauty shop. I was delighted to hear that. Delighted, Mr. Boynton? Yes. You see, I was afraid you might misconstrue my remarks about the girl in the movie and think that I dislike all spectacular hairdressings. Actually, the new styles fascinate me. They do? Yes. <laughs> uh, what sort of hairdo did you get, Miss Brooks? Well, what I got was more of a hair don't. But uh, I'm sure you'll like what I'm going to get again, Mr. Boynton. Oh, fine. When we walk into that dance tonight, I want those other teachers to really notice you. I've even bought a brand new blue serge suit. Do you think it'll fit me? Uh, <laughs> that's a hot one. <laughs> I'll see you at seven. Goodbye, Miss Brooks. Goodbye, Mr. Boynton. Well, back to the beauty parlor. You know something, Mrs. Davis? What, Connie? In moments like these, I almost wish I was Mrs. Conklin. What am I saying? <laughs> I'll have to be going down to the gym now, Martha. I want to see if it's fixed up properly for the dance tonight. Very well, dear. Oh, don't forget the keys to your car. They're on the table in the hall. And, Osgood, I must say the car took a lovely polish. I got a glance at it when you were driving past the house with some woman. Yes. Well, I was just... You saw me driving with some woman, Martha? Yes, dear, I did. Well, there's no need to be jealous, of course, but she was quite pretty, don't you think? I'm sorry, Osgood. I didn't get a very good look at her. I was carrying some cold cuts at the time. Mm. If you must know, she was gorgeous The cold cuts were quite popular last year Don't evade the issue, Martha Who was that woman you saw me with this morning? Oh, I know that That's a hot one I repeat, who was that woman, Martha? What woman? Oh, in the car with you Well, really, Osgood, you drive so many women from the Board of Education around This one I... wasn't from the Board of Education Far from it. Oh, please, dear. You're leaning against the potato salad. <laughs> Why don't you admit it, Martha? You're jealous. Five loaves of white. That should be enough. Martha, I said you were jealous. Yes, dear. Now, where did I put the rye bread? Martha, you're not even listening to me. Hello, Dad. Hello! Oh, sorry. Right. I mean, hello, Harry. Harriet, you've been crying. Is something wrong, dear? Oh, everything's wrong. Walter Dent told me he had to pick up Miss Brooks, but when I saw him, he was riding around with some, some creature and bang. <laughs> I'm going up to my room now, Mother. And if Walter calls, just tell him I've taken a slow boat to China. Oh, right. <laughs> but after you've brooded a while, please come down and help me find the rye bread. Oh, Mother! <laughs> now there's a girl who will make some man a fine wife, insanely jealous. Oh, here's the rye bread. I do hope I win the door prize this year. Don't think I'm past noticing pulchritude, Martha. I'm still just a boy at heart. You know why I gave that other woman a lift in my car? Because she'd just come from the beauty shop. You hear me, Martha? I was bedazzled. If it hadn't been for all the powder in that store-bought hair... That man of mine wouldn't have gone nowhere, nowhere. Oh, what's the use? <laughs> Hello again, Miss Brooks. Uh, Tilly, prepare booth number four. <laughs> and now then, Miss Brooks, you said on the phone you wanted something fascinating, so I've decided to give you the famous Antoine Marcel. Is it really exciting, Antoine? Exciting? This is the very same coiffure I copied hair by hair from Gorgeous George. <laughs> Fine. Just give it to me, and then I'll wrestle you for the bill. <laughs> This ought to be a very successful dance, Miss Brooks. Quite a few people in the gym. Yes, indeed, Mr. Boynton. And at the sound of the next voice, there will be one people too many. Oh, there you are. Good evening, Mr. Boynton. Oh, good evening, Miss Enright. The next number is a waltz, Mr. Boynton. Oh, is it? Yes, and I'm just dying to waltz. Well, you do that. Mr. Boynton and I will be right behind you. <laughs> Look who just came in. It's Mrs. Conklin, isn't it? Oh, yes, but in a backless evening gown and an upswept hairdo. And I thought I was overdone. Alongside of Mrs. Conklin, I look like Carrie Nation after a bad night. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Conklin. Hello, Mrs. Conklin. Don't let me scare you. I, I got myself up like this to teach Osgood a lesson. 
I wonder what he'll say when he sees me. Well, you won't have to wait long to find out. He's coming over now. Ah, uh, hello, folks. I... Oh, I see we have a newcomer in our midst. And a... <laughs> a very charming one at that. Osgood Conklin at your service, Miss... Uh, Miss... It's Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Conklin. Well, I'm delighted to make your... <laughs> Mrs. Conklin. Hello, Osgood. Ma, what in the world? Your hair, your, well, if that is, your face is, of all the... You look lovely, my dear. <laughs> I'm going to have every dance with you tonight. Oh, Boynton. Oh, yes, Mr. Conklin? I'd like you to take over my duties as host at the front door, if you please. Oh, but, sir, Miss Brooks and I were... To the door, to... Boynton. The... Yes, sir. Come along, Martha. If it hadn't been for powder and that store-bought hair, I wouldn't have... Oh, Miss Enright. Yes, Miss Brooks? Shall we dance? <laughs> Miss Brooks returns in just a moment, but first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight, show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a luster cream shampoo. Only luster cream brings you K. Dumas' magic formula blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Gives loveliness lather even in hardest water. Glamorizes your hair as you wash it. Luster cream... Not a soap, not a liquid, but a dainty cream shampoo. Leaves hair fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen. Soft, manageable, gives new beauty to all hairdos or permanence. Four-ounce jar, one dollar. Smaller sizes, either tubes or jars. Tonight, try Luster Cream Shampoo and be a... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful Luster Cream girl. You owe your crowning glory to a luster cream shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, Mr. Boynton got away from the door just in time to ask me for the last half of the last dance. You look lovely tonight, Miss Brooks. I, I feel I put you to a lot of trouble today. Oh, it was nothing. Of course, I did lose about five pounds, but it was mostly around the scalp. Attention, attention, please. Ladies and gentlemen of the faculty, it is my pleasure at this time to announce the winner of the door prize. She is none other than our Miss Brooks. Congratulations, Miss Brooks. Thank you, Mr. Conklin. Uh, I know you're all anxious to find out what the door prize is. Well, I have here a ticket, Miss Brooks, entitling you to one free treatment at Antoine's beauty parlor. <laughs> Mr. Conklin, would you tell me one thing? What's that, Miss Brooks? Is this for putting on or taking off? <laughs> Next week, tune into another Our Miss Brooks show, brought to you by Connolly Soap, your beauty hope, and luster cream shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, written and directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Boynton is played by Jeff Chandler, Mr. Conklin by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Gloria McMillan, Mary Jane Croft, Frank Nelson, and Margaret McDonald. <laughs> Here is actual factual proof of more comfortable, actually smoother shaves by using Palm Olive Lather Shaving Cream. 1,251 men tried the Palm Olive Lather way to shave described on the tube. And no matter how they shaved before, three out of four got more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Try Palm Olive Lather Shaving Cream. See if you don't get more comfortable, actually smoother shaves the Palm Olive Lather Shaving Cream way. <laughs> For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North, the exciting, fun-packed adventures of an amateur detective and his beautiful wife. Tune in Tuesday evenings over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at this same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. This week marks the 37th anniversary of the Girl Scouts, and the Colgate Palm Olive Peat Company takes this opportunity to wish a very happy birthday to all Girl Scouts of America, whose fine program trains the girls of today to be better citizens in the world of tomorrow. 
This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Olive Soap, your beauty hope, and luster cream shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, is as conscientious about her work as any other teacher. But she's come to realize lately that there are things outside of the classroom which also demand her attention. There are two things which I feel I must do to keep abreast of the times. First, I read all the latest figures on the cost of living. And secondly, I never miss Little Abner. <laughs> it's not that I approve of Little Abner's grammar, but with my salary as a school teacher, I have to know what's going on in Dogpatch so I won't seem like a yokel when I move there. <laughs> Against this day, Mrs. Davis, my landlady, started last week to pack me a lunch so that I could save the money I'd spend in the school cafeteria. Although she's come up with some pretty weird recipes, the first sandwiches she constructed for me were made out of loganberry jelly and cucumbers. <laughs> I was still grateful that I didn't have to eat the miserable food they've been serving in the cafeteria lately. Anyway, last Friday when the bell for lunch period rang, I realized I'd forgotten to bring my lunch from home. So I picked up my purse and a fifth of bicarbonate and... <laughs> but before I reached the door of my room, it opened and our pr principal, Mr. Osgood Conklin, came in. Good morning, Miss Brooks. On our way to lunch, were we? We? Oh, you mean my purse and me. Yes, sir, we were going to live dangerously again. <laughs> well, that's what I dropped in to talk to you about, Miss Brooks. Those kind of remarks about the cafeteria have got to stop. Oh, I realize that the food they serve isn't as good as the Waldorf Astoria or the Ritz Hotel. Or, or... Pete's Pigsty. <laughs> <laughs> but you must remember, Miss Brooks, that our cafeteria is operated at a very low margin of profit. Now, I've just had some very disturbing news from Mrs. Dipson, the school dietitian. What happened? Did she eat there? <laughs> This is no laughing matter. Sales are falling way off. And although the Board of Education doesn't hold me directly responsible for the operation, the cafeteria is part of Madison, and I am Madison's ruler, a principal. <laughs> well, what do you want me to do, Your Highness? Uh, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> I want you to find out the temper of the student body. You have the confidence of most of the pupils here, Miss Brooks, and I must admit their attitude has me a little worried. I dropped into the cafeteria yesterday, and I could swear I heard rumbling. Is that before or after lunch? <laughs> Very amusing, albeit extremely ill-timed. <laughs> now then, Miss Brooks, I'm counting on your cooperation. Will you carry the ball for me? Yes, Mr. Conklin, I'll carry the ball, provided I can have someone to run interference. You know, help me out. Someone like who, for instance? Someone like whom? Don't show off. <laughs> Who do you want to help you? Well, I thought maybe Mr. Boynton would be good. The students in his biology class are very fond of him. They're not the only ones. Why, Mr. Conklin, you've been muscling into my subconscious. <laughs> that is, I usually have lunch with Mr. Boynton, and, well, together we... Very well. Draft him. <laughs> aye, aye, sir. But impress upon him the necessity for discretion. It may all be just a tempest in a teapot. And remember, I want as little publicity in this affair as possible. Yes, Mr. Conklin, I understand. Good. As you were. <laughs> Let's see now, how was I? <laughs> oh, yes, on my way to the... Ca Come in. It's me, Connie. You forgot your lunchbox this morning, so I brought it down for you. Oh, that was very sweet of you, Mrs. Davis. What's in it? What would you like to be in it? Well, frankly, I've gained so much weight since I stopped eating in the cafeteria. I'd like to find a thin sandwich in it. A thin sandwich? What's that? That's a Chiron reducing tablet between two slices of rye crisp. <laughs> That's one I heard on Chef Milani's program. Oh, you don't have to worry about your figure, Connie. 
Although I do think it was a good idea of mine to start giving you lunch so you can save enough to pay me the rent money. Oh, I'll get that straightened out as soon as possible, Mrs. Davis. Now, I have to go down... Oh, I don't want you to worry about it, Connie. As the old saying goes, there's no sense in both of us worrying. (laughs) (laughs) That's when I heard on Portia Face's life. Do you know something, Connie? What, Mrs. Davis? My brother Victor once saved so much money by eliminating lunches that he could afford to spend two weeks at the Mayo Brothers Clinic. (laughs) Mayo Brothers Clinic? What was he suffering from? Malnutrition. (laughs) And an English teacher shouldn't say suffering from. I'm sorry. I'd better be getting over to... My sister Angela once eliminated both breakfast and lunch for three months. She had to cut it out, though. Why? Her dinners were costing her a fortune. (laughs) Well, I'll be running along, Connie. You can tell me how you enjoyed the little surprise I made for you when you come home this afternoon. If I come home this afternoon. (laughs) I'll walk out with you, Mrs. Davis. I've got to go back to the cafeteria and see how things are going. Well, goodbye, dear. and Thanks for bringing the lunchbox. You're welcome, Connie. Oh, dear, what's the use? I can't keep the secret another minute. Guess what kind of a sandwich I made for you? Uh, parsley and banana. (laughs) On what kind of bread? (laughs) Gluten. I hope you enjoy it. Oh, Miss Brooks. Oh, Don't be scared. It's only me, Stretch Snodgrass. Well, why is Madison's star athlete lurking outside of the cafeteria? I ain't lurking. I'm not lurking. I didn't say you was. (laughs) Were. Were what? What were what? (laughs) You confuse me sometimes, Miss Brooks. Me too. What did you want to tell me? Just that when you go into the cafeteria, you shouldn't buy anything. The student body's going to boycott the place. There's a meeting right now with the board of Stretch... Stretch... Strategy. Oh, well, who, who, who's on it? <laughs> the board, I mean. Walter Denton and Harriet Conklin, mostly. Mostly, huh? Well, Harriet's father will mostly take care of her if he finds out about this. Where are they meeting? In the room where they print the school paper. You know, the Madison Monitor. I know the name of the paper, Stretch. I made it up. Oh, yeah? It's a very good name, Miss Brooks. Madison Monitor. What I like about it, it rhymes. It rhymes? <laughs> With what? Well, I don't know with what. It just rhymes. <laughs> Madison, monitor. See what I mean? If I did, we'd both be in trouble. <laughs> Pardon me, but is this the Office of Strategic Services? Oh, come in, Miss Brooks. Uh, close the door, Harriet. You see, Miss Brooks, this is a secret meeting about the food in the cafeteria, but we don't want the faculty to get wind of it. Well, how can they help it? On a clear day, you can smell it in Catalina. Miss <laughs> Brooks, this is Mr. Dunbar. He used to teach here at Madison. How do you do, Miss Brooks? Hello, Mr. Dunbar. I just stopped by to see Mr. Conklin, but he wasn't in his office, so I dropped over to one of my favorite old haunts when I taught here, the newspaper room. Oh, did you used to haunt the newspaper room? I mean, were you uh, connected with the school paper? Oh, yes, indeed. I was faculty advisor. That's what Miss Brooks is now. Oh? Well, I don't want to disturb you. Go right ahead with your meeting. I'll just look through some of these old copies of the monitor. Okay, Mr. Dunbar. Now then, Miss Brooks, did anyone see you come in here? Why, no, Walter. Are you positive? No, I'm not positive. If I'd known this was a secret meeting, I'd have tunneled my way in. (laughs) Well, I guess we've got to take a chance. You see, Miss Brooks, we're going to circulate a petition among the students asking them to boycott the cafeteria. Boycott it? But, Harriet, what will your father say? I've talked to Daddy, Miss Brooks, and he says there's nothing he can do. I deplore the embarrassment this may cause him, but as student body president, my first duty is to my constituents. Here, here. I did, I did. (laughs) We just finished the preamble to the resolutions in the petition. If you want to hear it, I'll read it to you. Whereas and to wit. That's pretty strong language, isn't it? (laughs) A little on the pink side. (laughs) When in the course of students' events... It becomes necessary to turn one's back on one's stomach, we the undersigned, exercising our constitutional right peaceably to assemble and to form a committee to seek redress of grievances, do hereby announce our firm intention of patronizing the Madison High School cafeteria 
only to use the tables, chairs, water, napkins, and toothpicks provided therein <laughs> until such time as the duly appointed party or parties, namely Mr. Osgood Conklin, principal, or the Board of Education, responsible for the operational bob down which has befallen this installation, do take such action which will improve the food, lower the prices, and better the service in said cafeteria. It is also recommended that the person or persons in whom this authority is vested do immediately proceed to the president chef in charge of preparing the food, and without further frippery or fanfare, chuck him the heck off the premises. <laughs> well, Miss Brooks, what do you think of it, huh? How much are you asking for the picture rights? <laughs> Isn't it great, Miss Brooks? And look over here. We just painted these placards. That's in case the students vote to pick it. Pick it? Oh, now, wait a minute. This is Look getting... at this sign here, Miss Brooks. Let's see. Remember Tomain. Oh. <laughs> Here's another one. Don't worry about your old age. Eat here and you'll never make it. <laughs> Here's one that's made up. It goes, remember the saying, whatever goes up must come down? Or in our cafeteria, whatever... Water! <laughs> Other way we can get hmm? What you kids are suggesting is practically mutiny. Now, I know the food isn't very good in the cafeteria, but... Just not very good, Miss Brooks? Well, pretty bad, then. Just pretty bad, Miss Brooks? Well, brutal. Hey, he's on our side. Here, Miss Brooks, take this sign. We're making you an honorary picket. But I don't want to be a picket. Don't you see, we've got to avoid all publicity, or Mr. Oh, Conklin... Oh, it's too late now. You're in this thing as deep as we are. I'm in this thing as deeply as you are. Well, this has certainly been an interesting little caucus, but I'm afraid I'll have to be running along now. Glad to have met you, Miss Brooks. Oh, thank you, Mr. Dunbar. Goodbye, Mr. Dunbar. So long. Goodbye, kid. Very nice fellow. Yeah, he used to teach English, too. Of course, now he's the editor of the Evening Gazette, one of the biggest papers in the county. He's been investigating conditions in the schools in this area. Oh, well, that's certainly a commendable sort of... <laughs> investigating condition. But he just heard me say the food here was brutal. So? So I want you to be sure and watch for my picture in the Gazette. <laughs> you think it'll be on the front page? No, in Little Abner. There's going to be a new school, Marm, in Dog Patch. <laughs> Brooks, starring Eve Arden, will continue in just a moment. But first, here is Vern Smith. Ladies, what's your complexion problem? My skin's so dingy. Mine's oily. My skin's dull, coarse-looking. Doctors have proved that many complexion problems respond wonderfully to proper cleansing with palm olive soap, regardless of age, skin type, or previous beauty care. Oily skin looks less oily. Dull, drab skin, fresher and brighter. Coarse-looking skin appears finer. To win such complexion improvements, simply use palm olive soap. Nothing but palm olive is needed the way doctors advise. Wash your face with palm olive soap three times a day. Massage with palm olive's wonderful beauty lather for 60 seconds each time to get palm olive's full beautifying effect. Then rinse. Look for improvement within 14 days. Remember, 36 doctors, leading skin specialists, advise this way for 1,285 women with all types of skin and proved it could bring lovelier complexions to two out of three. So forget all other beauty care. Use palm olive soap the way these doctors advise for a fresher, brighter complexion. And ladies, enter the $100,000 49 Gold Rush Contest. The makers of palm olive soap offer $49,000 first prize and over 4,900 other prizes. Get entry blanks and complete rules from your dealer now. You may win a fortune in cash. Well, I finally prevailed upon Walter and Harriet to postpone the cafeteria boycott until I could talk it over with Mr. Boynton and report back to Mr. Conklin. Then I hurried down to the biology laboratory. Come in. Excuse me, Mr. Boynton, but I've got to talk to you about something. Could you come to the cafeteria with me right away? Well, but I haven't been eating lunch in the cafeteria, Miss Brooks. I bring my lunch. Oh, I do, too. See, I've got my lunchbox with me. 
But I thought we'd go to the cafeteria for some coffee, and I could tell you Oh, I've got I... a thermos full of coffee, and it's so much cozier than the cafeteria. Won't you have lunch here, Miss Brooks, with me? Well, Mr. Conklin, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose I could tell you what's on my mind after lunch. Oh, good. Uh, sit right down at that table over there. Just push those jars to one side. All right, Mr. Boynton. I'll... Ah! What's the matter? One of these jars just smiled at me. <laughs> oh, I don't feel alarm, Miss Brooks. A friend of mine sent those to me from Africa. They're shrunken heads. <laughs> well, if they're here for lunch, they can have mine. <laughs> I'll just be a minute, Miss Brooks. I'm feeding my pet frog, McDougal. You remember, Miss Brooks, Mac? Hi, Mac. <laughs> I always feed Mac before I eat myself. Just like the cowboy stars do in those Western movies. They always feed their horses first. Well, good for you, partner. <laughs> first, I, I've never owned a horse, but old Mac here is as close to me as any pet I've ever had. Yes, I know. Why don't we throw a saddle on him and go for a ride after school? <laughs> Look, Mr. Boynton, maybe I shouldn't wait any longer to tell you what I discussed with Mr. Conklin. Please, Miss Brooks, not while Mac's eating. This is a festive occasion. Let's not talk about anything serious. I heard a brand new joke the other day. Would you like to hear it? I might as well. It, it's sort of a riddle. It goes, why can't a woman swallow her apron? I don't know, Mr. Boynton. Why can't a woman swallow her apron? Because it goes against her stomach. <laughs> Fred Myers, the math teacher, told me that one. He's a hot sketch anyway, don't you think? Yeah, he's funnier than trigonometry. <laughs> that new French teacher, Mr. LeBlanc, has a good sense of humor, too. As a matter of fact, he's supposed to have lunch with me today. He said he'd prepare something typically French at home and bring it into the lab. What do you think he'll prepare, Mr. Boynton? Frog's legs? <laughs> <You're>... <laughs> no, no, yeah, she didn't mean it. Uh, nobody's going to touch you while I'm around. Well, he's pretty sensitive, Miss Brooks. I'm sorry, Mac. I lost my head. Let me in, please. Oh, there's LeBlanc now. I'm sorry I have to kick on your door, Mr. Boynton, but as you can see, my arms are full. Hello, Monsieur LeBlanc. Oh, Mademoiselle Brooks. I'm doubly sorry my arms are full. Well, thank you, Monsieur LeBlanc. And I'll meet you in the casbah later. <laughs> Just put that casserole on this table here by those jars. Oh, very well. <laughs> Who are these? The Board of Education? Yes, African branch. <laughs> What's in the casserole, monsieur? Oh, it's a, it's a famous French recipe, Miss Brooks. It's called De Viande Delicieuse. Haché et modelé avec délicatesse en sphère de forme gracieuse. Which means? Meatballs. <laughs> I assure you they are better than the food served in our cafeteria. Oh, that reminds me. The kids have gotten up a petition to boycott the place. Good for them. Well, it may be good for them, but it won't be so good for me unless I can do something to stop it. You see, I promised Mr. Conklin... Please, Miss Brooks, let us not talk shop, eh? Well, Mr. Boynton, everything is ready but the sauce. This I must simmer for a few more minutes. May I use your Bunsen burner? Oh, of course. I'll turn it up for you. I'm not very hungry. Could I just bo boil a small egg in a test tube? <laughs> Mademoiselle Brooks, just hold this dish right here. So, uh, now soon we will have the finest eating in the whole world. And while we're waiting, I tell you a story, yes? Oh, fine. <clears throat> well, this is a very old story that was handed down from the time of Napoleon Bonaparte and the Empress Eugenie. Please stop me if you've heard it, Miss Brooks. I doubt it. Eugenie and I weren't very chummy. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, uh, once upon a time, there was an emissary from the court of England. But he was not an emissary. He was a spy. And he had a message to another spy tucked beneath his belt. A, a message in code, of course. Go on. Well, when this spy got to Paris, he was apprehended by the Sûreté. You know, the police. And so he took the message from beneath his belt and thought to swallow it. But he could not. Pourquoi? Why? Because it went against his stomach. I don't get it. <laughs> Say he had the message tucked underneath... Never mind, Mr. Boynton. He can explain it later. Could I stop holding this dish over the Bunsen burner now? My nails are melting. <laughs> oh, but of course. Here, let me smell it. Oh, delicious. Yes, it just needs one thing. Let me see. Uh, Mr. Boynton. Yes? 
Do you think we could persuade Monsieur McDougal to stroll through this sauce? <laughs> He's only kidding, Mac. Now, now, take it easy. Oh, yeah, that's a boy. There are some plates on that shelf over your head, Miss Brooks. Would you hand me a few of them, please? All right, Mr. Boynton, but I'm afraid I won't be able to join you right now. I'm too nervous about Mr. Conklin. If he caught us eating here instead of the cafeteria... Oh, will you please stop worrying about Mr. Conklin, Miss Brooks? I assure you the only reason he goes to the cafeteria is for appearance's sake. He's probably got a nice homemade lunch hidden in the safe in his office. In the safe? Oh, don't exaggerate, Mr. Boynton. Oh, uh, let's forget about Mr. Conklin and enjoy our lunch together, huh? Just the three of us, like... The three musketeers. No, I make a toast. All for one and one for all. All for one and one for all. All for one and one for... Wait a minute. We're drinking formaldehyde. <laughs> three to the right. Four to the left. Now two more to the right. Ah, there we are. Now for a nice chicken sandwich. <laughs> Just the way I like it. Plenty of lettuce. Boop. Come in. Greetings, Mr. Conklin. I'm Martin Dunbar. I used to teach for you a few years back. Remember me? Dunbar, Dunbar. Uh, oh, yes, yes, of course. You taught Latin, didn't you? Well, you're close. English. Oh. Of course, yes. Well, always glad to see any of my old teachers drop in any time. I did. I dropped in today. Oh. Well, I'm rather busy right now, so if you could... Ah, uh, the same old evasive Osgood. What? Now, see here, young man, by what license do you call me by my first name? The same old pompous Osgood. Pompous? Why, you? Who do you? What do you? How dare you take... And the what? same blood pressure, too, huh? Look, Osgood, as editor of the Evening Gazette, it's my duty to expose certain things to public view. Not all things, mind you, but just those things that have a rather unpleasant odor. Well, now, you leave our cafeteria out of this. <laughs> I mean, uh, I didn't you... mention your cafeteria, Osgood, but now that you did, I think you ought to know at least as much as I do. Namely, the students here are talking about a boycott. What students? Probably just a handful of irresponsible, scatterbrained, troublemaking old. Uh-huh. One of the pupils who told me about it was named Harriet Conklin. Just the type I had in mind. Nothing but a scatter... <laughs> Harriet Conklin? <laughs> yes, that's right, Osgood. Your own daughter. And it isn't just the students that are rebelling, either. I heard one of your teachers refer to the food here as brutal. A teacher said that? Uh-huh. Ah, that'll make a nice, juicy headline, too. Faculty member slings mud at cafeteria hash. <laughs> now, just a minute, Dunbar. Or Madison English teacher vilifies vittles. Did you say English teacher? I did. Miss Brooks is the name. She's in this thing as deep as any of them. As deeply, editor. <laughs> I told her to... Look, now there must be some way we can straighten this thing out. I'll tell you what, Dunbar, old boy... Yes, kiddo? <laughs> Meet me in the cafeteria in five minutes. We'll, uh, we'll have lunch together. <laughs> I was on my way down there when you came in. Oh, all right. But uh, where are you going now? I'm going to find Miss Brooks and make her eat her words. Or worse, I'll make her eat in the cafeteria. <laughs> I'll see you in a little while, Dunbar. Oh, Mr. Conklin, before you go... Yes? You'd better slam that safe again. Your lettuce is showing. <laughs> Voila, that is the end of the story. But if he has the message under his belt... Mr. Boynton, why don't you get another meatball under your belt and forget the story? Aha! Uh -huh. Just as I thought. Oh, uh, hello, Mr. Conklin. Hello, Mr. Conklin. Hello, Monsieur Conklin. Don't hello me, you... you <laughs> culprit. Qu'est-ce que c'est, culprit? Mr. Conklin will qu'est-ce que tell you in a minute. <laughs> Miss Brooks, I entrusted you with a mission. A simple mission that a child could perform, and you failed me. Instead of bringing me news of this insurrection, you joined it. Oh, but Mr. Conklin, There's I... There's no time for apologies now. I want you to run down to the nearest good restaurant and buy the best lunch that you can and smuggle it into the cafeteria. I... What's that I smell? Oh, it's from this dish here. Say, that's a wonderful aroma. Oh, but of course, of course. It's my own recipe. 
de viande délicieuse hachée à des modelés avec délicatesse. Onze verres de forme gracieuse. Meatballs, hein? <laughs> Are they really good? Oh, yes, sir. They're wonderful. Well, that saves somebody a trip. Bring the whole plate up to the cafeteria immediately, Miss Brooks. Uh, you are acquainted with Mr. Dunbar, I presume? Dunbar? Yes, we've met. Don't sound so innocent. According to him, you shot your mouth off like it was the 4th of July. <laughs> I'll get that food into the cafeteria immediately. But, Mr. Cox... Immediately! <laughs> Well, I must say that was the best food I've ever had in or out of a school cafeteria. Well, I wish you'd repeat that statement, Dunbar. I see my daughter Harriet and her idiot consort approaching. Oh, hello, kid. Hello, Mr. Dunbar. Hello, Mr. Conklin. Mm. Why, Mr. Dunbar, you've cleaned your plate. Of course he has. The food was wonderful, wasn't it, Mr. Dunbar? <laughs> it certainly was. Oh, that means we can call off the boycott. Well, what did you do, Daddy? Fire the chef? Better than that, my dear. Look. Behind the steam table. An order of meatballs, please. One meatball coming up. Uh -huh. Steve Arden returns in just a moment, but first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight, show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a Luster Cream shampoo. Only Luster Cream brings you K. Dumas' magic formula blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Gives loveliness lather even in hardest water. Glamorizes your hair as you wash it. Luster Cream, not a soap, not a liquid, but a dainty cream shampoo. Leaves hair fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen. Soft, manageable, gives new beauty to all hairdos or permanents. Four ounce jar, one dollar. Smaller sizes, either tubes or jars. Tonight, try Luster Cream Shampoo and be a dream girl, dream girl, beautiful Luster Cream girl. You owe your crowning glory to a Luster Cream Shampoo. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to bring to our microphone the Western editor of Radio Mirror Magazine, Miss Ann Daggett. Thank you, Mr. Lamont. And as you know, the current issue of Radio Mirror Magazine is now announcing the results of its annual awards based on a poll of radio listeners all over the country. It is my pleasant duty to present this scroll on behalf of those listeners who have elected as radio's top ranking comedian, Miss Eve Arden. Thank you, Miss Daggett, and my sincere thanks also to you listeners who made this award possible. I'd like to say at this time that I'm certainly going to try in the coming months to merit the honor you've bestowed upon me, because I understand that if I win this scroll two years in a row, I get to keep Mr. Boynton. Thank you, Daggett, and good night. By Panali Soap, your beauty hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, written and directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Boynton is played by Jeff Chandler, Mr. Conklin by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Gloria McMillan, Leonard Smith, Gerald Moore, and Bill Conrad. <laughs> Do you shave with a lather or brushless shave cream? Plum Olive Shaving Cream comes both ways. And whichever way you prefer to shave, you'll find that using either Plum Olive Brushless or Plum Olive Lather Shaving Cream can bring you more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Here's the proof. 2,548 men tried the new Plum Olive way to shave described on the tube. And no matter how they had shaved before, three out of every four got more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Get Palm Olive Brushless or Palm Olive Lather Shaving Cream today. For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North, the exciting, fun-packed adventures of an amateur detective and his beautiful wife. 
Tune in Tuesday evenings over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at this time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thank you for listening to Hojo Radio. We'll be back again very soon. Mm-hmm.